Welcome to the very first Stockholm Climate Week. We have all gathered here in Stockholm to discuss how to solve the climate crisis. Many people say that the climate crisis is a very complex problem to solve. I have to disagree. I think the problem comes down to one simple choice we must make. Either we make the easy choice. That was the wrong one. Either we make the easy choice where we choose to do the same as yesterday. We choose to do the same as everyone else. We choose to do nothing. We choose to continue with business as usual. We choose to buy the same products. We choose to live the same way we always have lived. We choose to, say, to do the same work and work for the same companies. We choose to maximize short-term profits. We choose to stay silent. We choose to believe that we, can make a, that we can't make a difference. We choose to not matter. We decide to wait for a better day to change. This is the easy choice, and we all know what it means. We all know what's going to happen when we choose to look away. We will soon have a future with no choices left. Many people choose this because doing nothing is the easy choice, especially when not enough leaders show the way. But we can make a different choice, a choice that is difficult to make on our own but will become the easy choice when we are many. We need some courage to choose to believe that we can make a difference. We choose to act today. We choose to matter. We choose to believe that we can make a difference. We choose to actively use our voice. We choose to maximize future generation profits. We choose to change our workplace or work for companies that do. We choose to try to live in harmony with nature. We choose to buy what's better and only what we really need. We choose new way of doing things. We choose to inspire everyone else to do the same. We choose to show the way by being in the leaders that other need. By deciding we can make this different choice, we choose the future we want to live in. When I see all of you here in the space arena and all of the millions tuning in worldwide, I know one thing. I know that the different choice is not only the right choice, it's also the easy choice because we have all made it. Let us together make Stockholm Climate Week be about inspiring everyone else. Let us show that we can do it the choice is ours to make. Thank you so much and a big climate love to us all. Hi, and welcome to Stockholm Climate Week, presented by the Climate Dialogue Platform, We Don't Have Time. My name is Katarina Rolfstotter Jansson. And my name is Nick Nuttall, and we're your hosts for these four days of broadcasting from the space studios here in the heart of Stockholm, Sweden. Now, the European Environment min Ministers are meeting not far from here this week, and we hope to be able to connect with some of them during the show. And on Saturday is one of the great environment days, uh, Earth Day, and we're going to acknowledge that uh, this weekend. Mm -hmm. 
and we put together a great program for you, presenting problem solvers and also front runners from all parts of the world, increasing the pace of climate action. So please share our content and be part of the solution to the climate crisis. Each day has a special theme. Today is food and agriculture. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our first guest of the day. And since we're in the center of Stockholm, what could be more appropriate than having the mayor of this fine city joining us here on stage? So welcome to Karin van Gord, uh, the mayor of Stockholm. Come and, come and join us. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Great to have you on board, Karin. And you have our full attention and you have the floor. Thank you so Great. much, and okay. thank you for the Over presentation. Uh, I think you all remember the fall of 2018. It was a month before the national election, and a 15-year-old girl sat in front of the government building with a simple sign in black and white. It said, School strike for the climate. Her name, Greta Thunberg. I remember it very well. Thunberg's manifestation made an entire generation to stand up and take the fight for their future. And it has also a great impact to me. They called on us politicians to listen to the research. They told us to go from word, word to action. I am the mayor of Stockholm, and when I presented the budget for this year, I had three priorities. The economy, the welfare, and to make Stockholm climate positive by 2030. Because the climate policies of our cities matters. Over 80% of the Swedish population live in urban areas. Stockholm has over 1 million inhabitants and how we live, consume, travel and eat can make a difference. So how can we reach our goal of becoming climate positive by 2030? And how will we take action? First of all, we are going to focus on our emissions. With a new innovative technique, the heat plant in Vertan will be able to capture as much as 800,000 tons of carbon emissions from the Stockholm population. That is as much as all the emissions coming from the traffic in the city. A good start, but not enough. As mayor, I will do what I can to, take, to make green and sustainable choices easy for our inhabitants. Living a sustainable life cannot be a choice only for the wealthy. Our green transition must be fair and just. This is why we must focus on our public systems, schools, preschools, elderly homes must adapt, bringing better food to the table, using old instead of building new, using green forms of transportation. For a Stockholmer, circular living should be easy. We want to have a recycling station around the corner, get our electricity from reusable sources, and take the, the city, uh, the bike to work. We are doing this for future generations of Stockholmers who also have the right to enjoy a city where you can take a swim in the middle of town or take a long hike for in the woods just outside the city center. For Greta Thunberg's generation and the one after that, and the one after that, 
we know that our goals are set high and that the journey towards climate positivity won't be easy. But I'm sure that we will get there. We will, because the people of Stockholm are all ready to, to commit to the task and take responsibility. That will make all the difference when we adapt Stockholm to become a climate positive city. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. C come and join us here in this, uh, this little, little thank table you. here. Um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, how do you scale this as, as fast as you possibly can? Is, is there a relationship between the national government and the, and the local government? In many countries in the world, the, the national government also funds local government and vice versa. So how do you fund this transition? How do you move faster on it? From Stockholm perspective, it's... Um I can't see right now that we have a national government that goes in the right direction because we know that our emissions need to low, lower down, even that we have our new uh, transmission in Vertan. Mm -hmm. So we need to change to be able to skip the fossil fuel driver cars to electrification. And that means that the national level also need to go that way. Mm -hmm. But I can't see that right now. Right, right, right. So you could go faster if all the, all the things were pointing in the same direction. But right now, it's, it, it adds an additional challenge to, to what you want to achieve. That is also important when it comes to, to climate and, uh, and reach the high ambitious goals. That is more citizens mm -hmm. need to be involved, the citizens need to be involved, but also the national government. Yeah. So Karin, uh, if we look at opportunities, what would you say are the major opportunities that great Stockholm, if and when, well, when I say when, when it becomes a climate positive city? <laughs> We have high ambitions, and we should have. Uh, and I'm uh, ready to face the fact that we, uh, hopefully, we hopefully will reach this goal uh, rather earlier than 2030. Great. But, uh, but the citizens need to be involved. Mm. And uh, we heard earlier uh, about it's, it's about making choices. And uh, the citizens of, uh, of Stockholm want to have choices that will be better for the climate. And that, and in combination with the um, industry and the businesses that find new solutions, uh, hopefully it will run faster. So if we, if we turn to barriers, because there are barriers, and the political national level is, is one you mentioned, but what, what barriers do we have that we need to sort of overcome? Oh, <laughs> major ones. <laughs> the major, major ones is the transportation mm. system. Mm. It's the major ones. But we also need to look into what we are eating, food, and uh, what kind of clothes we are wearing. So we, we need to uh, come further as well. Mm. Thank you. Um, let's just uh, look at uh, a couple of other things here. I mean, um, as you say, for people, it's very important that they understand that they are part of, a, in a sense, almost a collective on a journey together. Uh, sometimes it's hard to persuade some people because they say, ah, money's being spent on this and it could be better spent on that. How do you address those kinds of... of, of how do you bring the public on board? Mm. And how do you bring them along on this journey? Oh, uh, that's not the easiest way, of course, uh, but uh, most of the citizens want to be climate friendly, so that's kind of things. But when it comes to costs, uh, we can see if you, you, you think a little bit further what you're eating, you can lower your cost and it's better for the climate. Uh, also, the way of um, what you're wearing, if you use your clothes until the end date, <laughs> Uh, then it's cheaper uh, to your wallet. So, so you can find ways that it, it can't cost you uh, more money in the uh, family economy. But from the city economy, we need to invest in the climate. And that costs a lot, uh, for sure. But we need to do that, and we need to, do, uh, to always find new investments that will be better for the climate. Mm -hmm. um, 
Stockholm is one city. Uh, there are many cities around the world. Um, there are many organizations as well, like ICLE and, uh, and many other uh, city organizations working together. Um, we'll soon have a, a Marishtat uh, here on stage, a smaller city, a smaller town, doing big climate action. Uh, and how much does Stockholm interact with the other cities in Sweden and also internationally? Uh, you must play a, a, an important role. Yeah, we play a really important role because we are the most sustainable city in the world. Uh, so we are also involved in C40, mm -hmm. Eurocities and other uh, big uh, organizations that we uh, are a uh, good city that uh, many other mayors want to look into. Uh, and that's really nice <laughs> to be that mayor <laughs> that mon many want to uh, copy. Yep. Uh, and that's Emulate nice. and yeah, yeah. Yep. Be inspired by. Yeah, yep. yeah. We are also inspired. For example, I'm I'm really inspired from Anne Hidalgo, in Paris, mayor of Paris, uh, that really have struggled and taking really really hard deci decisions mm -hmm. to move the traffic from the city centers, and instead it's uh, walking and bicycle, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yes, uh, I also have mayors that inspires me. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Corey. And I have one final question. This is the first Stockholm Climate Week. What, what expectations do you have? And how, how important is, is it that we actually sort of put a stake in the ground and say, this is what we do, this is Stockholm? It's really important uh, just to have uh, this important week to put it on the map uh, that uh, everyone listening and seeing this maybe take one better choice tomorrow <laughs> to be more climate friendly. Uh, maybe you already are that today, but you can take a little step further. Mm -hmm. That's my expectations. Well, excellent. Well, thank you very much for your hard work and thanks for joining us today. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank very, you. Very Mark. good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ma. So, Nick, many people are accustomed to seeing you, uh, well, hosting the show next to me or, or on your mm -hmm. own, but you also have a strong track record as a journalist and also working in the United Nations as a director of communications. But what me people might not know is that you also have a very strong background in the music field. Do I music. now? Do yes, I now? Do. Yes, oh, gosh. Don't, don't, don't start Are joking. we going to unleash something really dangerous on the public here? That uh, I, I wouldn't say clear so. the room in two seconds. Don't do, do, don't <laughs> do that. So, so you're not just a listener, you're also a performer. And actually today, right now, um, we will be enjoying us uh, enjoying your music video. Please tell us how this relates to what we're doing here at Stockholm. Yeah, uh, so this looks like a, a selling job, doesn't it? I, I have my, have an album coming out on the fifth of May, and uh, my my girlfriend who has produced it, she's actually quite a, a famous musician in in Germany. Bernadette Langst. Yes, that's right. And uh, last summer we were on holiday in Crete, and she said, "So what's the last song going to be on the album?" And I said, uh, "I don't know. I'll, I'll I'll find a good song." She said, "No, you have to write about climate change." Mm -hmm. And my immediate response was, "Absolutely not." You know, nearly every climate change song I've ever heard in my life I thought was absolutely terrible mm. and all a bit happy clappy and, you know, kind of, oh, let's save the world. And she said, no, you have to write a, a song on climate change. And funnily enough, the theme of it is about choice, which is, was Ingar, uh, Ingmar's speech. Mm -hmm. Something the mayor said was about the choices we make. Mm -hmm. And just by sheer chance, uh, one of the themes of this song is, is because we chose to, in others, we chose to solve the climate. And we did it. Mm -hmm. And now we have the pleasure of airing this music video and yep. the song. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go. <laughs> Just name them, what do we do in this moment? Take to the streets, they're empty, storm the parliaments They're shut down, no one in charge but the rodents But we're not going to let this thing get out of hand You know, we've got a plan Talk to the trees, they'll listen, talk to the bees, they know, talk to the trees. 
talk to the rivers they've been around open your mouth and speak out open your eyes and see open your heart it's a key cause we're not going to let this thing good examples, right? And when the examples are in our community and brought forward by innovative government officials, it's truly inspiring. During this first session, we will showcase green local government's initiatives and also solutions. And we have a wonderful lady come out, coming up here on stage soon, Susanne Wallner. She has up till you, quite recently pushed for climate action in the fairly small municipality Maria Stad that Nick mentioned earlier. She's been head of industry and created waves globally for Maria Stad's front-running focus on hydrogen. So please now join me on the stage, Suzanne. Wonderful to have you here. Please give her a warm hand. We have a studio audience. It's fantastic. So, Susanna, please join me here on stage. And um, you have worked quite a long time with this, with sustainability. But we need to focus now on what you did in Mary Start, first of all, here today. And you've faced quite big challenges in 2015, right? And um, how did you address these challenges? And, and 
really started also the Norquan initiatives. Yeah, it started in the Mariestad uh, when they sat down with the companies in the city and tried to focus on industrial, uh, industrial change to uh, meet the uh, new uh, challenges to, uh, to be more sustainable. And then they did this initiative that's called Electric Village. And uh, it was a concept. In the beginning it was a project, but later on the, the political leaders in the city, uh, from really the left to the right, uh, did an agreement to work with this. And then they like put it in the ordinary field in the municipality. So uh, for a couple of years I worked there, for four years mm -hmm. I think it was. Uh, and we did concepts to try to show, like a theme cases, to show that you can really do it. Because you can't just sit in meetings and that's what it was all about in the municipality in Mariestad. Do things in, in, for real, so to say, and try it to move forward. Mm. And the most uh, famous thing we did was the, the first uh, world's first solar cell-driven refueling hydrogen station. So it uh, made us quite famous and uh, now that, that was it, so I'd to say. say yeah? I'd say you really made a base of ripple effects so globally on, what, on your work here. So yeah. if, we, if we go back and focus on the, the, the sort of the, the demands or what happens for the industries, what, yeah. what was part of that solution that, that they actually asked for and you facilitated together with them in the municipality. Yeah, it was it, much of it is to get people together. Mm. <laughs> and it's also much uh, to get away from the silos, like in a municipality, because you have all this different kind of work you do in a municipality, and you also have different kind of level that you prioritize in a municipality. Mm -hmm. But then if you have a strong and courage leadership, like we have in Mariestad, we had the major there, Johan Abramsson, and he was uh, had some courage, <laughs> of course, and he, he led this work and he, he gave us quite like uh, free hands to move on and Prioritize. So when I needed something in the municipality with, with the field I worked in, like Electric Village, uh, it was given to me. Mm. And that's very important to get it high up in the agenda and also to the political leaders, not only the leading major, the other parties also, mm. that they do it together on the long term. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what ventures would you say were the most successful in this collaboration? I think that they uh, that we always worked very close to the companies, very, very close. And of course, you as a municipality officer, you can't uh, go too deep in the companies because mm. of, of concurrence and so on. But you can do quite a lot just to, to listen to them and try to to turn things and try to get them involved in project. Like we had a project with uh, with the uh, taxi and the uh, coop in Maria Stad to try to uh, reach people with food under Corona. It was a special project and you, you involve like the local taxi company, the local coop store and so on. So, and then you develop things together. And then in that project, we had an invasion with Stora Enso. They made like a package that you could uh, get like um, cold uh, food in. Mm -hmm. So, like that. So, you always have developing things together with the companies, the municipality supporting in, in the way they can. Yeah. So, Susan, what would you say are the major learnings from, from all of this? And how, how are you bringing them forward in your work? The major learnings is what I call always the silos. Mm. And that you always have, uh, it's uh, like a cliche, but you always, always have to think, can I do this uh, in uh, another way? Could you get your employees paid for to think a couple of hours a week, think a bit more, and then go for solutions? You will have brighter solutions and also over the, the borders in a municipality, like you have the and economic department, you have the administration, 
people that you normally maybe did not involve in this kind of projects, you should take them on board. We always didn't do that in Mariestad, but that's the thing I learned and I want to do more about in, in my coming works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Susan. So if you were to describe a sustainable city of the future, because we do need visions, right? We mm -hmm. need to be able to sort of foresee what it could be like, not just doom and gloom, but what, 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 is, what is in your head, what is a sustainable city? Paint it out for us, please. Uh, the first thing that comes in mind is the agriculture. Because uh, the people in the city needs to understand the soil they have around them. Because without the farmers, we will have no food. Okay, you will have food. Maybe we can do gene manipulated food or we could do other things. But if we take care of what we have in our own backyard, we could use the soil and do good food that don't make us sick and get the cleaner air. So that's what I think uh, it's, uh, it's important for the city to take care of. Uh, not only think about transport and infrastructure, because the farmer is, is, is the solution for the future, I think. Mm. I'm sure there are many farmers listening here nodding, because sometimes they are not really taken into account when you, when you look at cities. No. So, so a final, final call to action here from your, your side, Susan, um, for citizens maybe. Um, because now we talked about the municipality, the, uh, the, uh, the companies, but uh, Ingmar spoke earlier on, on that we have a choice. So, so for citizens all over the world, because this is a glo global, uh, uh, global broadcast, um, what would you like to say to them? Yeah, uh, many people just yes, say go buy an electric car. I don't know if that's the only solution. Mm. <laughs> it's many solutions and you maybe I would like to start in school with the children because the children will learn our, the older people how to do it <laughs> and try to learn more in school. Mm -hmm. I think we should start with the children. Yeah. Excellent. That's a, yeah. good, that's a good call to action to parents and teachers and, of course, politicians yeah. setting the cur curriculum and the agenda in the, in the different parts of, of the system. So thank you very much, Susan. You will be back soon, yeah. but now you get a little bit of a break. Yeah. I know you have a problem with your throat, but it worked beautifully, so I'm very happy you could make it. Thanks so much. Thank you. We all love playing board games, right? They can be fun and they can also be educating. But it can also help speed up the green transition in cities. Well, can it? It's now my pleasure to introduce some wonderful people over here that will be able to uh, talk more about this and also show us. It's a team from Schwebde University that has, in collaboration with Maria Stahl again, created the climate game. So we have with us here, we have with us Edwin, Skulkom Sanne. Yep. We're going to take a seat here next to you. And we also have with us um, Iris Casado. And you're an illustrator and 2D artist uh, from Schwebde University. And in between you is Maria Gustafsson, uh, who works with urban development in Maria Stad. And you're setting up the game here. But uh, maybe I could steal a moment from you, Edwin, but first, so the other team here could set up the board. Um, we're all curious now. Tell us about the game. What is it? And how, how do we play it? Um, the game is uh, uh, it's a board game in a Euro game style, uh, which some people might listening might know. Uh, it's uh, you play by you play as different actors who try to compete to reduce pollution the most and gain the most victory points, which you get by reduce pollution and helping the city, which you can do in different ways by playing cards that do different things. Uh, these cards are like model after actual real-life projects that ah. could be undertaken in Mariestad. So you get victory points when you reduce pollution? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so Iris, you've designed the... Uh, well, you designed it. So what, if, what are the challenges in terms of designing this board game? Well, for me, the perhaps the biggest challenge was that uh, we chose a specific art style for this game, which mm -hmm. is called Solar Punk. I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. Solar... Solar punk. Solar it's, punk. Yes. Let's see. Um, 
it's both an art style but also like an activist movement mm -hmm. that uh, imagines a very sustainable future, very green, focused on renewable energy, especially solar power, and in general has a very positive vision of the future. It wants to show us that change is possible if we all work together. So the challenge was to take this art style and put it in the game in a way that fit the content, because uh, solar punk also has a lot of science fiction in it, but we didn't want to have too much of that because then it might feel unbelievable and people won't think that it's something that is possible to be done. Maybe if we show, I don't know, like flying cars, for example. So I, I think for me, the greatest challenge was to take this aesthetic and try to put it into a game that's perhaps a little more grounded in reality, but in a way that still shows positivity and a vision of the future that is possible. Mm. So, Edwin and Iris, what, what is the age? I mean, when, 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 could you when could you play the game? Is there a sort of a lower age bracket? Um, we... Well, it depends on the person, I think. Uh, of course, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's mostly for, like, teenagers and adults. This is the sort of family game you play with, like, uh, five year uh, ten year olds or something, generally, unless they really like board games, which, fair. Um, but I think that's also part of the, well, charm or interesting part of the game that when we have this bit older demographic, we can use uh, more complex mechanics, which are very useful for explaining ah. different things about climate change and how we can interact with it. Mm -hmm. So refer back to what, <clears throat> sorry, what Susanna just said, we could be playing this in schools, right? Yeah, yeah we mm -hmm. actually had a little test session when uh -huh. the game wasn't as finished. It's still in development, but it was an early stage. And we played with, uh, I think it was 11, 12 years old children. Yeah. And that uh, was kind of the limit, age-wise. Mm. Younger than that, it's probably too hard for them. But mm. 12 up, especially if they have previous experience with board games, then the more you play, the easier it is to get into the game and understand how everything works, and then the more fun it is as well. And board games in general have become increasingly popular the last years. Globally, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, normally when you play a board game, there is one winner, but here, Many of us could be winners, right? I mean, everyone is a winner when you reduce pollution, but yeah, there is one winner game. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, I mean, you all help the city, so that's good. And we also, we are thinking about maybe having like a cooperative mode too, but uh, right now the game is uh, primarily designed to be one winner. One winner, but basically, if you reduce your pollution, it's, it's sort of a great feeling anyway. It's not yeah. monopoly, like you, you lose that completely. Yeah, because you, you don't work against each other in the no. same sense. Uh, and also, if you lose, you might want to replay it again and try a different strategy. Which, a different so it's this really, really big aspect of learning here. So Maria, um, how can this help Maria start reduce emissions? Because that's, sort of that's how it all started, right? As a novel idea, again, from this municipality. Yes, exactly. One of all our um, work that we do in uh, viable cities, we are one of 23 cities who will become climate neutral in Sweden. Uh, but this game, this is about Maristad. You can see the municipality of Maristad in the board game. I think that's very good. And it also uh, explains how, com um, how complex it is to work with transition. And uh, it also shows that we all need to to, uh, to work together, all different actors mm. in the municipality and the well, citizens as well. Terrific. So I'll leave you to it because I have a guest waiting for me here in the, the side of the stage. Um, it is like this, that we, we always follow a leader, right? And uh, Mariestad has been a small municipality, but um, thanks to its very big climate leadership, it's recently managed to land a huge land investment. So on that cue, we're going to talk about the transport sector, because the transport sector is indeed uh, switching to a sustainable transport. And uh, Volvo is the leading player in this heavy road of transport, road transport. It is the first company to uh, mass produce heavy duty electric trucks for delivery to cu customers all over the world, so far with an emphasis on Europe. So one part of the Volvo Group's strategy towards sustainability is to build a battery cell plant in Maria Stodd, uh, the very, very first of its kind in the Volvo Group, and entering a new technology area uh, by taking that step. Uh, 
And today, waiting here for us to, for, to join us is Corinne Svensson. She's responsible for corporate responsibility at AB Volvo. Uh, and she'll be discussing the Volvo Group approach and strategy. So now, Corinne, please join us. Yes, applause are always welcome. Terrific to have you on board on this stage. It's a great stage, isn't it? It is. Thank it's you actually, so much. It's actually the largest LED screen in Europe. Perfect. So, so. And Volvo is a great big company, so this is a perfect match. Yes. So, Corinne, um, what is the time frame for the Volvo Group in doing this? I think let's start a little bit with our time frame when it comes to our sustainability agenda. Mm -hmm. We have a very ambitious sustainability agenda. We have said that we should be net zero by 2040. And on top of that, we have set ambitious targets also for other critical sustainability areas. So we have interim targets by 2030, uh, and they are validated by the Science Targets Initiative. Uh, for example, for our products in use, we have decided that we should decrease our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% per vehicle kilometer by 2030 uh, compared to 2019. So that's scope three. For our own production and the energy that we purchase, we will decrease our uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the same time frame. Uh, to do this, we will keep within the limit of 1.5 degrees. And we think that utilizing the science-based target initiative has been very valuable for us because that has helped us in understanding how we can go from where we're at today until 2030 and then 2040, how much we need to decrease and how quickly do we need to decrease. Mm -hmm. So this is a fantastic strategy and, and the timeline for and how Maria Stahl is fitting into the strategy. Could you elaborate on this, please? Yes. So our strategy is really to lead this transformation and we have set ourselves a goal of being 100% safe, 100% fossil free and 100% more productive. We see 100% safe because we think it's unacceptable that people are still being killed on roads and injured on work sites. 100% fossil free because we think that climate change is really the challenge of our generation. And then 100% more productive because we know that transport will be needed for a long time and actually the need is increasing. So to keep within the boundaries of the planet, we need to be much more productive than we're at today. We have started this journey uh, together with a number of key customers all around the world. And uh, I think the pace is increasing every day. So what is then our strategy to do this? And I think it's the best way to describe it is to look upon it from a value chain perspective. So if we start with when our products are in use, actually more than 95% of our greenhouse gas emissions comes from that step. So uh, to electrify our products is really key in order for us to decrease those emissions. And we have been delivering electric buses for more than 10 years, and now we are also electrifying trucks, machines, etc. And we are doing that segment by segment and for all business areas. And we have said that by 2030, 35% of all our vehicle and machine sales should be electric. But we think that to electrify, that's probably the strategy for us, but you need also some other strategies. So from a technology point of view, we also think that we will have fuel cell electric vehicles being run on green hydrogen, and there will still be room for a small share of internal combustion engines that will be run on fossil free fuels. Then if we move to the next part in the value chain, the second biggest source of emission, that's really the emissions that comes from material that we buy, that we put into our vehicles or components. And that's where the batteries comes in. Mm -hmm. So we have other types of materials like uh, steel, aluminium, we have polymers, we have electronics, and then we have batteries. And batteries is so crucial for the whole electrification strategy. Uh, and we really felt that we needed to increase our engagement in the value chain here. Um, so what we have done is that we are today assembling modules into packs. We will also start to um, develop our own modules. And now we have decided also then to produce our own cells in Mariestad. But I'll, I'll think we come back to that in, in just a minute. But before that, if I just finalize on the value chain approach, 
In the middle, then, we have our own production and all the energy that we purchase. That is less than 1% of our emissions. But still, of course, we do lots of work when it comes to buying renewable energy and also making energy efficiency gains. And the last, thing I want, the last point I want to make here is that, of course, our strategy is something that we have put in place because we have to do it. Mm. But it's also something we want to do, and it's something that we see as a great business opportunity for us. Because in the last nine months, we have actually seen an increase of companies taking action towards science-based targets. The increase has been 50%. And those customers and companies, in many cases, their biggest CO2 footprint really comes from transportation. So that gives us a great opportunity to help those companies to take down their CO2 footprint, uh, but also to help society to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. It's truly inspiring, and, and uh, people watching this might wonder, why Maria Stad? Why did you choose Maria Stad? Um, I would say that uh, it was we had a very extensive localization study being done, so mm. we looked into, I think, 10 different uh, There were many places. cities hoping, keeping their fingers yes. crossed, yes. Yes, but in the end, Maria Stad won, and first we limited to Sweden, and we could say that we chose Sweden because of the access to green energy and because of the big automotive cluster that is in Sweden. Secondly, we came to West Sweden, and we did that because of the uh, industrial and logistical competence that is available, uh, but also uh, that we have some of our main powertrain sites already in the neighborhood with Skövde and Vara. Mm. We also have our headquarters in Sweden, and then there is a big regional, uh, um, our, our big headquarter, no, sorry, we have a big regional automotive cluster also in uh, West Sweden. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, we came to Maria Start. Mm -hmm. And that was chosen because of the cooling and process water in Lake Vänern. But also, and I think that has been clear from the previous speakers, because Maria Start's sustainability agenda fits very well with our ambitions and our agenda. And I think that has shown today. Mm -hmm. So now let's, let's look at the time line for the battery plant per se, because this is not something you just you put up overnight. It's a and big no. endeavor, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're still in the very early phases. We're still planning for this, but we will start construction next year in 2024. Then we will start production in 2028 and hope to have it fully up and running by 2030. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, I'm curious, I'm sure other people are curious too, how has this been received in Marie Stad and how many, for instance, people will be working and constructing and also working in the plant? Because that's, that's good news for, for any municipality to get a, something like this coming into their arms. Yeah, and I think we have had a, a great response from Marie Stad, but not only from Marie Stad, but from the whole uh, Skaraboy region. Uh, there are today, I think, something like 15 different muni municipalities cooperating to get this project done. And it's going to be a lot of hard work. It's going to be several obstacles that we need to overcome. Uh, but in the end, we are very. Um, we think that the work has gone very smooth so far. Uh, and as I said, it also feels very good for us to know that we share the same sustainability agenda as Maria Stad and Skaraborg. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Corey. Stay with me because yep. we're having some more people joining us here. And I think we'll just stay put here at the table here because we have the, the trio over there playing away on the game and they'll be, we'll be coming back to them shortly. So please come back on, on stage to San Valner from Maria Star. Join us. And also on Zoom, we have Henrik Brodin, head of energy at CERD. He should be popping up any second here. And CERD, I feel there, there you are, Henrik. Excellent. And CERD is one of Sweden's largest forest industry groups. Um, and uh, you'll see if we can all see you here. Let's turn a little bit to the side here so we can, we can look at you uh, on the screen here. So, um, so, so Susanne, let's start turning back to you again. And this discussion on how to speed up the transition in the transport industry, it is easy again to forget the role that municipalities play, right? We do this all over again uh, very often. So we talked briefly before on the role that Mary Stott played, but if you look at a bigger perspective, what roles do you think municipalities should play in this transition? 
Uh, they ha they have a very important role to move forward now because, uh, as uh, we are see with hydrogen, for example, we have a lot of money in the system for the green deal in Europe, mm -hmm. where the municipalities also can get support. And if uh, Sweden don't search for the money, they will go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's an easy catch for municipalities and regions in Sweden to get some support to develop the infrastructure that is also kind of the very uh, most expensive things we have in society, for example, in regions and municipalities. It's of often a problem. Indeed. To, get it, to get it going mm. and get value of it. So here we have a great opportunity to get support from the European region and the European Commission, for example. Yeah. And it's also, about, it's also about creating impact and showing what you're doing. And we, we met in Glasgow at COP26, and you actually chose a quite unusual mode of transportation to get to Glasgow. We took the train, it was <laughs> a, quite an endeavor, but you did something else. Please tell, tell the audience of the views. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, I have really to thank a lot of people of that because that's why I, I had this idea, I think one year before, when I saw all the airplanes flying into to the COP uh, top meetings, and I thought, what about if we could drive a hydrogen car all the way? And because it's it's always like this, you have to have a demo, or you have to do it live, to get people to understand that you really ca can do it. Mm -hmm. And if if we were a forerunner, we should do it. I thought, mm -hmm. and then we did it with uh, some help uh, from. Uh, uh, Toyota and other people, we uh, did this uh, schedule <laughs> and we worked really hard to, to get it going. But we went to Europe and it took, took us about two and a half days to drive. To Glasgow, yes. Yeah, to Glasgow <laughs> and we were three people, so we drive almost all the <laughs> day and night. And then we visit the climate uh, top meeting in Glasgow uh, for about one day. <laughs> And then we drove back for two and a half days. So sometimes you have to do the hard work to uh, stand on a stage like this later. Mm -hmm. That's well. Well, we, <laughs> well it was yeah. you created quite a you created quite a huge interest in, in Glasgow. Yeah. And you spoke about this, of course. So, Corinne, how can a great company like Volvo support municipalities in this transition? And um, do you have any reflections on what? What, well, for instance, what Susan told you about the told us about the uh, the uh, endeavor of driving all the way with hydrogen. Yeah, I I think it's very very interesting because I when I listened to you before also I was reflecting upon the fact that many of the things that you think are key success factors is the same things that we think are key success mm. factors. You talked a lot about ambition that you had very an, an ambition you had a vision about what to to achieve. You talked also about silos and not working in silos that we need to cooperate. And I think that's definitely something that uh, this whole transformation, uh, we're a huge company, but still we won't be able to do this by ourselves. We need to cooperate with municipalities like Maria Stad, with uh, different types of players. We even uh, cooperate with competitors on certain mm. things in order for yeah. this transition to happen. So I think you made a great point there with regards to uh, the need for cooperation and not working in silos. And it might sound easy, but it's actually quite difficult to get that to work. Mm. And I also uh, think that you said something that you talked about courage. I think uh, <laughs> driving a car all the way to Glasgow uh, is uh, maybe showing with hydrogen. <laughs> with, yeah, is probably showing both uh, courage and uh, a lot of commitment. Um, and I think that really needed very much. And you need to have people that actually take on the lead. Uh, and last but not least, I also think that you talked about the need for many different types of solution. It's not going to be one thing that fixes this. It's going to be different things. So. I think we share sort of the way of working. Um, and then, of course, we can cooperate in specific cases also on, on certain things mm -hmm. like the battery cell plant, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Let's turn to Henrik now. Uh, the forest industry, of course, operates with heavy machinery. And many of the mach machines are, are, are powered by fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, you also, the forest industry is also the biggest buyer of transport. Uh, transportation in, in Sweden. So what can a forestry group like Södra, 
do to reduce emissions and also speed up the transition to fossil-free vehicles? What are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, I think there are five different uh, areas where we, we have to do things uh, to make this happen. And it's, for, of course, the vehicles, but then it's also to build, we have to have, to have the energy supply, we have to have the infrastructure, uh, we have to have the carriers uh, with us, and we have to have the transport buyers. So all of these five have to work in the same, uh, same pace to actually do something. And as, uh, from Sörvlas' point of view, we actually are only in four of these different areas. We are among the biggest transport buyers in Sweden. We have thousands of uh, trucks coming into our sites every day. Uh, we have we produce electricity, so we have a surplus of electricity production. We have really big uh, effect as well. Uh, so we have the possibility to build the infrastructure, and we have an own uh, carrier, so we have our own fleet. Uh, so we can actually start to build this, build the new business models, build the infrastructure, build uh, everything except for the vehicle, and then to cooperate with the ones with vehicles. And also because we can start to work with these pilots, demos, and then we have to scale it up. Uh, but when we're sitting on four or five of these uh, um, points, we can actually start to make the business models between the different areas and uh, influence them uh, all the others in our value chain. Mm. Then, thank you, Henrik. I have a question to all of you, but I'd like to address it first to you, Henrik. What, what policies do we need to have in place to speed this up, this transition? Uh, for, for first, we have to start to decide the fossil is the ones that have to go, be gone and uh, not starting to fight between the solutions, which is the best solution, because we will need all of the solutions mm. to bring away the fossils. Uh, but then we also really need this. We need uh, policies for uh, investment in uh, new energy, uh, either this is biofuel, electricity, hydrogen, everything. We, we need to have good policies to actually be an investor uh, in bringing more uh, energy to the market. Fossil, uh, so uh, it's the most important. And then we also need to have long-term visions, not the revisions we've seen uh, right now with, for example, the Renewable Energy Directive that's revised so far. So we have to have long-term, even both in the EU and the, uh, in domestic policies, uh, that we actually should do this transition mm -hmm. and fight the faucets, not between the, the solutions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Henrik. Corin, a quick answer from you and then from, from uh, Susan, because I see we're turning down on all the red digits here. Okay, then I say three things. Mm -hmm. We need to have simplified and smooth permitting processes. Uh, we need to have coordinated and aligned regulation. We see today that that's not always the case. And when we get conflicting types of regulations, it gets difficult for us to implement. And last but not least, we need to have higher demands on authorities uh, and on member states to provide the enabling conditions for sustainable transportation, like charging infrastructure, like a green energy, etc. Mm. Excellent. That was, that was very clear. <laughs> Susan. Uh, I totally agree here uh, with the regulations because we have different kind of um, regulations that not are supporting each other. Mm. They go uh, vice versa against each other and uh, that doesn't work at all for the market. So I think that's one of the most important things. And then also the system perspective when we do like uh, when people search for funding, you have to think in a system solutions, not only like silos even there, mm -hmm. because we have to reach the higher goals now, not go on the small things only to get the, to get the speed going. Yeah. Excellent, Susan. Would you like to add something? It looked like you wanted no. to add something, Karin. You're good. I'm good. Excellent. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Hendrik. Thank you very much, Susan, and thank you much, very much, Karin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
everything starts with the kids, right? We spoke about this already. And we know that our children are the best nudgers of green behavior related to parents and also grandparents. That's why it was so great to interview Jösta Lindmark, who is sustainability strategist in Mariestad. We talked about what probably is the world's first fossil-free preschool. So let's take a look at the interview. Hi there, Jösta Lindmark from Mariestad's commune. Uh, you are working with a preschool that is self-sufficient considering creating energy for heating and cooking, etc. How did this idea come about? Uh, Maria Stad has wanted to be a place for innovation and uh, showing the world, demonstrating uh, that. And uh, the board for ex um, the board for education, sorry, for education in Maria Stad. They want to be a part of that um, mission, and uh, they, they chose to learn the pupils about uh, sustainable development, and then they can pass it uh, on to their parents, and to their own children and grandchildren. This is very clever, and of course, a proven concept to start with the children. So, could you give us some examples of how this? How this is manifested and in, in, in how, how you work with, this child, with the children and, and the preschool? Uh, the headmaster and her staff, they have um, put up some guidelines for sustainable development. And you could briefly tell them by uh, they want to keep the children safe and looking forward to a good future. And they want the children to work together and they want to get the same message from the teachers to the, um, the youngsters. So making a good future by um, learning and feeling safe. That's, a, that's great criteria. So, so Jostav, could you elaborate a bit on, on the, the, what is the main characteristics of the guidelines that you, that you follow in this work? Uh, the main purpose of the guidelines is, of course, how can we show the world to get to um, uh, sustainable development by not using too much of the resources of, the, of our Earth? And how can we recirculate, like fun uh, furniture? And how can we, just as, like I said before, how can I look forward and feel safe that we'll have a good um, future for our own children. So I, I can assume you work with creativity in mind too when you when you when you work with this? Uh, sorry? You work with creativity creativity? Of course. In mind? Yeah, of course. So it they want to catch their own mind from the the young people, from the pupils. Of course that's you're right on there. So how many children are educated with sustainability in focus right now in Maria Stad? Right now, the, this, the preschool is not fully uh, used, so uh, about one-third of the 104 uh, pupils in maximum are in place. But um, we look forward to Maristad growing. We'll get more um, people coming here, and then we can welcome more children to the preschool. And we are, self, um, we are confident that it will be filled in maybe five or five years, I would say. So um, it's a good place. And a lot of parents, I think they want to put their children there, but uh, uh, we haven't got enough parents yet, but we will get them. So what would you say are the biggest learnings from this process so far? I would say that you, if you're trying new things, you know, a new project, and you are the first, maybe the first in the world, we think, you, have to, you need to be patient because you will have a bumpy road. You will face uh, a lot of um, difficulties like getting the equipment. There came the pandemic and make the delay. And you have to get a lot of permits to be sure that the school is safe for both the children, of course, and the staff and the neighbors, because the system is grounded on to use hydrogen. 
And hydrogen is, as we all know, it's, um, it could be dangerous if you are not absolutely safe and you have tested and tested again the equipment to see that it's absolutely safe. And you also have to find people who have got the drive to make this happen because always when you try new things you will find other people who are not sure that this is a good thing so you have to uh, you have to talk and, and you have to say to them that we will try and try and we f we are self confident that this is a good thing okay excellent excellent uh, Justa. so uh, what what has the response been from from the, the children and the parents and also of course the educators the teachers uh, the parents the headmaster she's called susan and her staff they were prepared that maybe parents would be a little afraid afraid of this hydrogen process but they were quite surprised but there has there has been nothing like that they have been curious and they have been the very keen on learning about this and when they have heard about how safe this um, uh, premises are uh, they have they are not uh, afraid anymore and they are very interested in the in the future and um, that the development will be uh, yeah it would be um, i lost the word <laughs> Sustainable. sustainable. I was looking for the word sustainable. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would be good uh, from the children and the parents. The reactions have been very positive and good. But there are some people in the municipality as everywhere. They are, not, they are hesitating that this is a good way to use money. And when you want to convince them, you have to be positive yourself and you have to be, uh, you can't force anyone to think that th if they don't like a thing, if they hesitate it. So you have to show your enthusiasm and your drive. And then I was, I'm sure we will make this uh, happen and it will be a good thing in the end. Well, thank you very much, Jesta, for sharing this story. And um, since we are, there are many people watching this, who knows, there might be examples in other parts of the world. And I know you're open for dialogue to spread the word of how you have created this fantastic preschool and the concept. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Best of luck and thank you very much. Thank you. Creating Sustainable Cities is the theme for the next panel talk. And I'm happy to invite on the stage Klaus Kolbey, who is co-founder and CTO of Semvision, and Elise Gross, head of sustainability, Sveco, Sweden. Please join me here on stage. And also on Zoom, we have Paul Larsson's chief sustainability officer, Orang Sells. And you can give them a warm hand, please. It's so wonderful to have a studio audience. We, we don't always have that, so it's always nice to get some, some, uh, some warmth inviting the guests here. And let's have you step a little bit to the side so we can see Per Larsons. Wonderful to have you with us, Per. How are you today? Just testing your sound here? Yes, I'm fine, thank excellent, you. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, let's start with Klaus. Uh, concrete. Concrete has been labeled a problematic and destructive material in, in, the, in the world for many, many years due to the immense uh, emissions of, of, carbon, of carbon dioxide, of course. Um, so if you look at if the cement industry would be a country, it would actually be uh, the largest CO emitter in the world after China and the US, which is, of course, mind boggling. Um, but your company is now reinventing the process of creating cement. So please tell us about this. Yeah, thank you for letting us be here. Um, just to give a little bit background about the concrete, you know, the societies are built by concrete, but there are uh, forecasts that say that in 2050, 75% of all infrastructure 
in the mega cities in the societies mm. has not yet been built. 75%. 75%. So it, we have a massive construction taking place, and it's due to immigration and population growth, mm. mainly in the developing world. You know, in sub saharan Africa or in Africa, there will be 2.6 billion people living in 2050, double the amount of India today. That's a lot of but, cement. But yeah, that's a lot. So we have to do something with this amount. That, that's the challenge. And our solution, you know, traditional cement use, uh, they mine uh, virgin limestone that con that's, uh, uh, contains CO2, it's calcium carbonate, and they use a lot of fossil fuels to remove the CO2 from that, that generates uh, CO2. So our solution is, first, we have a new type of cement, innovative, with much less calcium. Uh, we use waste material, recycled waste from industry uh, and, and the process of the industry, instead of the virgin limestone that does not contain C2. And we use, uh, we electrify the process since it uh, takes much less uh, electricity and energy to produce. Mm -hmm. So what do you say much less, roughly how much less carbon will be this cement be emitting? Yeah, we, we have produced zero emitting C2 in our pilot plant now. Just wanted to have you say yeah. that again. Excellent. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so Lise, um, Sveco is very often involved in the early stages of planning the city. So how how do you how do you manage to sort of on um, sort of upstream make make the process of creating sustainable cities less CO2 emitting? Yes, um, I must say it's in the early stage where you can create the most bang mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. buck that you invest. So it's very important, but it's also where it's most complex and uncertain in terms of what we're going to do, how will it be and everything. But I must say I feel very positive right now, although we only have seven years to handle this, that uh, through mainly two things. One is the digitalization and the involvement of digital tools to handle complexity. And I will describe that a little bit more thoroughly. And the other one is that the, the money has now really taken interest in what is, uh, can be labeled as sustainable or not. Mm. And we can use the, like the EU taxonomy, for example, biodiversity, climate risk, climate ad adaption, climate mitigation, or so social values. Big levers finally to put. Yes, yeah, so we can use those co KPIs mm -hmm. when we make plans and we can visualize those values like according to the EU taxonomy, in Tullaboy, for example, we made a, a, a sustainability plan and we used both the uh, sustainable development goals and the EU taxonomy to show how this plan, will, what kind of effect it will have. We can also show in the digital plan the carbon cost of different material choices, like you were saying, just the normal concrete compared to the improved concrete. Mm -hmm. What will be the benefit in both currencies like uh, kroners or euro and to, to buy these two different types of concrete or, or a wooden structure? And what is the uh, emission in carbon? So we use uh, different currencies to visualize that in a plan. Then we can see that if you make a whole uh, new area out of wood, wooden construction. What is the carbon cost? What is the cost in carbon and what is the cost in materials uh, to buy these materials? Mm -hmm. And then we can color code that with like harsh pink if you are uh, outside of the carbon budget for the city and maybe a light pink if you are within the carbon and budget. And if you're way off, it's red. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you have kind of like a walk of shame mm. for the developers who are like off the carbon budget for the city. Mm. And the ones who are within, they, they look better. So main barriers before we turn to Pa, please. What, what were the main barriers? Well, I think we really, I mean, we live in a new economy. Mm. Uh, carbon is part of our co economy, like many of the uh, industries have, have said. We have carbon. So carbon dioxide is a, is a currency. We have kilowattimmar uh, energy which is also part of our budget nowadays. Everybody has mm -hmm. from the household oh, to yes. the industry. So if we include these new currencies when we make mud budgets and city plans, not just kroners or euro, we have to include the other currencies, carbon, climate risk, uh, and uh, energy, of course, and also transportation. Mm. Uh, these are new currencies that have to be visualized when we make plans and also that we, when we shop for it, the procurement processes have to include these currencies, not just to make a new development and which has still have a lot of climate risks in them. 
That is not yeah. a good economy. Or not to have uh, carbon or biodiversity, these other uh, that the money now wants to see that we different, have a Different way of, of calculating, excellent. Yeah. So let's turn to Per Larsson's now. Per, when, when other companies uh, uh, see waste, you see resources. So could you please walk us through a little bit of, of how Brank Cells works to create these systems and also um, to uh, turn waste into resources in smaller districts, but also in, in larger, even in, in countries and cities? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the question. In 2015, we understood that in a future circular economy, there is no waste. Uh, and then there's no need for a waste management company. So therefore, we understood that we need to develop solutions that will keep our possibility to stay in business, but also bring back the resources that are so much needed. I know in my backdrop here, I have a very good example of that one. Mm -hmm. This is our first uh, Azure Salt plant that is being inaugurated on Friday. And here, Klaus, we have more than 100,000 tons of ashes that is perfect to replace limestone in cement production. Uh, uh, so I would really like to talk with you going forward. But the sun that we are, are producing, in this case, a, a possible uh, raw material input for your process, we're also producing salts. Salts that can replace virgin production in Belarus when it comes to potassium, as an example. So this is an example of how we, we, we extract the resources out of the household waste incineration. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the material that can't be recycled due to that there is a toxic contaminant, we separate out the toxic. Mm -hmm. But we have other processes also when we talk about how we, can, how we can develop waste into resources. One is, of course, how we convert a fish sludge or fish poo into energy or how we are producing phosphorus out of huge uh, uh, amount of, of what's today called as problematic waste, that is, uh, that is uh, sewage sludge. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we can create a high value product of what has been really problematic. But these are just a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Per. So this is really a circular economy for, for sure. Uh, so major barriers or obstacles to make this really scale, what would you say they are? The major barrier barriers are that mm. today's legislation mm. are based on linear principles. So it means that if it has been based, it's very problematic to use it as a resource input again. And, and even if EU has a huge ambition to have end of waste process in place, it really is not functional. And the same we see with standards. Standards can in many places say, well, if it has been original waste, you're not allowed to use it. So both standards and legislation need to be changed. But if we do that, suddenly uh, my favorite theme is how today's wastewater treatment plant can become future resource plants. And the good thing out of a financial perspective is that the cost for the society will go down. Mm -hmm. And we will not need to then, then mine as much phosphorus as we're doing today, or we don't need to produce as much nitrogen of, uh, fertilizer with with, uh, with the use of natural gas. We can use what in, in the wastewater already. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Per. Um, you have great solutions in, in, in your company. Uh, and if you look at the, the team here over here uh, playing the board game, what would you say is the most crucial advice you have to, to create sustainable cities leading forward? And also, that's a question to, to both you and, and Per. If you would pick out one key message to, to policymakers uh, to make this happen. What would that be? Yeah, uh, no, uh, cooperation in the value chains uh, mm -hmm. between the different sectors. To have an overview, I heard the discussion was that before, not looking to silos, ah. uh, the value chains, uh, but also broaden the perspective. You know, we, we're looking for solutions here in Scandinavia, in the Western world, but what we learn here in Mariestad or in Sweden, we have to implement that in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia. That's, that would be crucial. Otherwise, we will boil the planet. So have that in mind also. And then to do it in other regions of the world, you need to collaborate with other, other players, obviously. Exactly. With other uh, challenges at hand. Yeah, but many of them are the same. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's slightly comforting. Not really, both, actually. So, Elise, uh, what, what would you say the key uh, factor here? Well, I would uh, tag on to Pilot Chance here. It's about creating the foundation and the arena for a circular society, a sharing mm-hmm. society, which will increase also social uh, values. Uh, and I think this, uh, this game that they're playing that is really uh, offering the citizens to become engaged also in terms of their own behavior and to understand the complexity of what a climate neutral Maria Stad really would be for them and mm-hmm. to understand this complexity. But for a circular community, we did a, re- a reference calculation, 15,000 uh, citizens. 15, uh, one f- five. 15, that is like a normal size development, mm-hmm. you can say. Uh, it, if it's really based on circular values and sharing, sharing energy between buildings, walking and cycling much more, uh, eating more locally produced food, everything that is available in Maria Stad, for example, it can reduce climate impact by 97% wow. compared to a, a reference of what we build today. And it can reduce the energy demands by 75% That's very and reduce promising. cost, health costs by 1 billion kroners. Mm. These figures are so interesting that my message would be really engage the citizen in what kind of circular behavior and services they want to have. And and the benefits from it. And the benefits from it, from the community side. And set the arena so it is possible to share and enjoy more together in that sense. Excellent. And you get the final word here, Pat, Pat, on on this this topic. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say that have policymakers to really understand the potential that business can contribute mm-hmm. and make sure that before you make the, the laws, make sure that you then listen to business and their potential. Next week, I will meet with the, um, the coming EU presidency, uh, and that's Spain. And that's very, I'm very pleased that Spain, in this case, turned to business and asked, what are your innovations? What can we do? What does it mean for, for a legislative process going forward before they become president of the EU. So the dialogue with policymakers, really important. Well, thank you very much, Per. Thank you very much, Elise. And thank you very much also. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Let's now take a look at how the climate game is developing. How is it going here? Yeah, it went pretty um, well. Of course, everybody wants to know who's in the lead. Um, well, we finished, but it is 1-1. <laughs> I one. finished, you won. <laughs> you, you finished already. Okay, okay, okay. So, so uh, the learnings from, from this game, uh, how will this help and how can this create a carbon neutral, even climate positive, uh, by start in the future? Well, what are you saying, Aris? Yeah, it's a, a very good way to learn how mm-hmm. everything is related to each other. For example, you have green energy, and then if you reduce green energy, uh, reduce. If you increase green energy, you reduce pollution because you use, of course, alternative sources of energy. If you reduce traffic, you also reduce pollution. But then, of course, there's also challenges. For example, if there's some project that is more uh, science-based, maybe you need to do some research before that, and that can be that can take some years, for so example. Many learnings here. Yes, well, Edwin can probably explain it better than I can. Yeah, I mean, we wanted to show how the systems interact and uh, also like highlight why actors might do what they do, why you might like look for sponsors, because you can't just build a thousand uh, wind farms that cost a lot of money, and mm. you need to highlight the challenges with uh, transitioning to green energy and uh, sustainable society. Mm-hmm. So Maria, representing the municipality, what would you say are the biggest challenges for, for Maria Stad when you play the game and you realize this is what we need to, to, to act on? Uh, I think the main challenge is that we, we need to work together and uh, everybody needs to, to know that and really act like that. Mm. For example, here I played as a political party but I, I did a lot of investment, and that was not so popular about in the uh, at the citizens. You need to help yeah. me. I think I got a lot of bad opinion. Mm-hmm. But sometimes you you need to do that. You need to be a leader. You need to take take care of of the the city. 
Indeed. Mm -hmm. So for all of the people watching here online and, and, and in the studio, how can you get your hands on this game? Uh, well, it's not out yet. We're working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we are working on ga game balance, uh, UI, well, not UI, but um, visual, uh, like, explaining. Uh -huh. And uh, Iris is working on art. We have, like, three cards with game art, and then all of these cards should have art eventually. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're working on that, but uh, hopefully sometime this fall. Hopefully. This fall. Here. The climate game will be at this fall, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to share the information on the We Don't Have Time platform when, yep. you, when you publish, and we, so we can start playing. I really want to play this. It looks fantastic. Well, thanks so much. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Although Marie Stott has come a long way, this is really only the beginning. So let's now take a look a few years ahead and talk about the future of green local governments. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Marlene Olsson Lundqvist. She is a member of the munis municipal board in Marie Stott, and she will share a keynote on how green local governance can play a crucial role in scaling solutions and also, of course, reducing emissions in the years to come. So please give Marlene Olsson Lundqvist a warm hand. You have our full attention, Molly. Thank you so much. <coughs> I want to start by thanking you so much for being invited here today, me and my colleagues from my Stad, and giving the opportunity to participate in this great context. We appreciate that very much. Almost 10 years ago, my Stad was stuck in a downward spiral. Major industries had shut down, and jobs and tax revenues were reduced. <clears throat> but people also talked more and more in our region, Skaraborg, about the concept of the big city and, the th and then the periphery around it. It was in the big city that the society should invest, and it was in the big city that the growth was going to take place. And we who lived in the surroundings were just to be seen as such at hangarounds. Much has happened since then. Uh, Susanne earlier talked about uh, the beginning of the transition journey in my stad that began in 2015 with the Norquan Initiative. And my point in bringing it up again is to emphasize that the collaboration model that we started then and which we now see is so important for the green transition. It's in, it <coughs> it's in collaboration that we succeed, is our conclusion. The municipality took the lead investing in becoming a test and demo site for industrial renewal at that point, and the ideas came from collaboration and consensus with the companies. It has not been a straight road, as those who follow my start uh, have known, um, but during this journey, the business world has become more mature uh, to drive the green transition. Now it's business that drives development, and the best we can do from the public side is to join hands with them, or kroka arm, as we say in Swedish. We have to listen to what their needs are and make it easier for them. So now we have started the Norkvan 2.0, uh, where we once again hold workshops with the companies to find out what is the next step for their, from their point of view. What support, what support do the companies need from the municipality going forward in order to develop and create change? And the answers that we get is not rocket science in any way. It's like faster processing of applications, assist them on one way in to be accessible and visible from the municipality and be engaged in their business. The importance of dialogue with the young people has been a present all the way in the journey for Majestad, as we have seen numbers of examples on here. Uh, and we have just started workshop series on sustainable lifestyles for youths between 18 and 30. <coughs> to listen to what young people have to say about the sustainable Majestad of the future. It's them who's going to live in Majestad, so it's important to hear what they have to say. And what they say is functioning public transport, very high on their list, also be able to ride the bike through all the city, but also to create a lively city centre so more people are attracted to shop and live and to stay in my start. Another platform for dialogue, with, uh, for dialogue work with civil society and citizens is through the bi it, our Biosphere office, which works in our Biosphere area, Vänneskärgården with Kinnikulla. They work in projects with various initiatives for sustainable lifestyles, reducing energy consumption and initiative for the environment that can be done on micro level. As I said, the municipality cannot cope with the transition alone. 
we have to do it in cooperation with the world around us, both at local level, micro level, and on other levels, like here today. So what is important moving forward in the major transition that Majestad is facing now? With the aim of being 15,000 more residents by 2040. Majestad is a rural town with lots of green areas and close to Sweden's biggest lake, Vernon. We want to take care of the water, the forest, the greenery and the farmland. Uh, we want to offer outdoor life and simpler life that a smaller town brings. That is our unique selling point and we have to keep that in our goal. And this must be done side by side with growing sustainable, of course, economically, socially and environmentally. We want people to be able to live in our labor market, the region of Skaraborg, and commute to and from Maristad in a sustainable way. That's why we were very happy just a couple of weeks ago uh, to hear that the Regional Traffic Association and the State Railway are finally hearing our, um, our, our municipalities' request regarding investment in our regional railway and also increase departure on the main line Gothenburg Stockholm, which stops in Törboda, where I departed from today. Uh, but that has been a long road, and maybe one can conclude it with it simply required a Volvo battery factory. But a changeover of this size, and in a short period of time, naturally, it has its challenges. Uh, the need for education adapted to society's new challenges will increase. Uh, we are facing major investments the state needs to step up to create conditions for energy supplies and infrastructure. We can't do it alone. Swedish authority needs to change in order to more quickly meet application links to growth. For example, in my start, we have worked very hard to shorten the process time for building permits. And we differ between simpler and more complicated building permits. It would be very reasonable that one could have the same view on, for example, environmental permits on national level. It's not reasonable at all that an, an environmental permit should have a processing time of 18 months. The, implita the implementation of the EU's taxonomy will require, will require significant change in Sweden, Swedish municipalities' investment strategies and priorities. And probably the municipalities will need a lot of guidance on how to address these new challenges and how to be able to help the companies to navigate around it. It's a whole new field that requires, and the requirements are yet unknown. So what lies ahead in Maristad to keep working towards the sustainable development goals? The interest uh, for study visit to the hydrogen facilities at the filling station and also to the preschool, Kronoparken, as Jösta talked about, continues to be extensive. And that is fascinating. In June, a study was presented on the possibilities of making use of residual products such as oxygen and heat from the production of hydrogen at the filling station. And the study included analyzing various circular business models linked to residual products. Thinking cir circularity, now that we are facing many changes in Mariestad, we'll be able to create new business opportunities, uh, new business opportunities and jobs, while at the same time contributing to economic growth and competitiveness. Going forward, the ambition is to focus also on areas that has not been given so much space so far, partly in the leisure sect sector, with increasing dialogue around outdoor life and leisure life, which we see a big demand for but also the sectors around agriculture and fishing, which has a lot of potential in the future of green transition. Despite many challenges, we are, of course, very excited about the opportunities that we are facing. And it's important not to get stuck into details, because done beats perfect. If you don't try, you can succeed. As our mayor, Johan Abrason, used to say, we concentrate on the actions and write the PowerPoints afterwards. In collaboration, we create the future municipalities of Mariestad. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Marlene. I, I fear, or maybe this is a good thing, that you will be, have a great influx of people wanting to move to Mariestad, but that might not be a problem. I hope not. Mm. I'm sure that it doesn't. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with this, we end the session of local green governments.
We now have the pleasure to offer you a screening of the Climate Emergency Feedback Loops. Uh, this is a series of five short films uh, featuring 12 leading climate scientists that explores how human-caused emissions are indeed triggering nature's own warming loops. So we will first watch a pre-recorded interview that I did with the senior producer and writer Bonnie Walsh, and then the first three parts of the film, Introduction, Forests, and also Permafrost. And uh, while you watch it, you can enjoy some lunch. Uh, this, there's a lunch um, buffet inside here in the, in the back, back of the room here in the club. So en please enjoy, and I'll see you back in a bit later. Great to have you on this broadcast, Bonnie Walsh. You are part of a team that has produced a fantastic series of short documentaries about feedback loops. So uh, could you please, please tell the audience uh, how this work came about and also what the story is about what you want to achieve with these films? Um, sure, we had um, a producer come to my colleague, Susan Gray and I, and say that he's been hearing a lot about feedback loops in the climate and has been asking people that he knows, very well-educated people, if they've heard about them. And he was very surprised to hear that a lot of people didn't know what they were and hadn't heard about them in terms of the climate. And he wanted to make a film to educate the public about climate feedback loops. So we proposed to him to do short films for the web uh, so that anyone could see them and enjoy them and learn about them. And so that's how the project came about. We started researching the most important feedback loops that were impacting the climate and trying to figure out how to create short films that would um, feature several of these climate feedback loops. So how did you decide which feedback loops to choose to, to make the films about? Because there are plenty of them, right? Yes, there are many, many of them, and we only presented a fraction of them in the in the series because there are so many of them. We, I spent about six months researching, and I really kept coming back to the same sort of what I thought were the most important ones that um, were impacting the climate and ones that people may have, you know, may be familiar with, such as the Arctic sea ice melting and the permafrost thawing in the Arctic. And uh, because there are so many wildfires and droughts and floods in the climate these days, um, I looked into those kinds of uh, feedback loops, what was impacting those. And we ended up finding, I think there's about 12-ish 12, 12 that we cover in the, in the four films. We have an introduction film and then four films. And I think we cover about 12 in the four films. And we, we decided to categorize them in terms of forests, permafrost, albedo, which is the re reflection of the sun's rays at the, uh, at the poles, and uh, atmosphere, because of what we'd learned about the jet stream affecting the weather. So that's how we came on the, um, the four topics, the four films. And Bonnie, the films are beautifully narrated by Richard Gere. How did this come about? Our producer, Barry Hershey, uh, knows Richard Gere from his uh, Buddhist community. He and Richard Gere have, have been together with the Dalai Lama several times, and they have a relationship, a friendship that goes back many years. So because of that, we were able to get Richard Gere to be our narrator, and we were very lucky because he was fantastic. Yes, he does really, does, he does a great job, and it's very to the point, but also, um with some, some aspects of, of warmth and, and, uh, and empathy that's, uh, that sort of really he brings forth uh, in, his, yeah. in, in his narrating. Yeah, and he has, he has several children, including some young, very young children. And so I think he, you know, he's, very, he's very concerned about this as a parent and that comes across in his narration. It does. So um, Bonnie, in terms of picking which feedback loops, there are quite a few. Mm -hmm. How did you make the decision to prioritize the four that you prioritized? And also, could you please tell the, the viewers which they are? Yes, yeah, sure. So I spent about six months really doing intensive research, reading everything I could about feedback loops and talking to many, many scientists about their work around feedback loops. 
And we were start we started to see a pattern. So we saw a bunch that happened with various forests, the boreal forest, the Amazon forest, um, the temperate forest in the United States. Uh, then we of course knew the melting of <clears throat> the melting of the sea ice was a huge one, and that was the albedo effect. And we realized we, you know, we had to cover that one. That was really important. And then along with that came because that happens mostly at the North Pole, we looked at the South Pole where there's less of an albedo effect because the ice is so thick, it's not really going away anytime soon, but the glaciers were melting. And so we decided to put those, both those feedback loops in one program. And then we started looking at atmospheric feedback loops and realized there was, there was a lot going on in the atmosphere. Um, the jet stream, water vapor, oceans warming, creating more water vapor. So we decided to do one about atmosphere. And then the final, another main one, of course, was permafrost, because we were reading a lot about permafrost thaw. And so we decided to focus on that. So we really tried to find kind of the main ones that people have heard about or that were really important to know about and put them in, a, you know, put them in four shows. So that's how we, that's how we decided to do it. And we worked a lot with, um, this center in kind of in our backyard on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, we're based in Boston, called the Woodwell Climate Research Center. And we ended up using about six of their scientists. And we focused a lot on, on their work, which you know covered all these topics. So how have, have the films been um, re re received so far? Because they've been out for a while, but not that long. Mm -hmm. How are you spreading them? And what, what kind of feedback do you get and what kind of reception do you get from from uh, the people watching them? Yeah, we've gotten unbelievable feedback <laughs> for feedback loops. We people seem to really, really love them. They're they're just very straightforward science films. They just try to explain the mechanisms behind the warming, and um, we've gotten we've used them in a variety of ways. Right now, we're tr we're really pushing hard to get schools and universities, educational institutions to use them. And um, many, many are and think they're, you know, really important, an important tool for teaching about the climate. We also ended up creating a one hour broadcast documentary from the five shorts. Uh, we got a distributor in the UK and we created a broadcast version called Earth Emergency. And it's been sold around the world and it airs, it's aired several times already in the United States on our PBS channel. Um, so that's been getting a lot of traction too. And the, the short films have been in, I think by now, about 50 film festivals and have, have won several prizes. Um, and we're, we're really encouraging their use. We've had events with organizations like um, Climate Reality Project here. We've had, we presented them to our state legislature. And I was just told that they, that a climate bill was passed right after many legislators saw our films. So I hope that we had something to do with that. And um, we're just really trying to get them seen as much as possible. It's an urgent and very strong message. And I wanted a lot of good metaphors in the films. There's one uh, that I really, um, that, that felt very strong about, I felt very strongly about it, but the scientists saying that it's like driving a car in a very thick fog and you know that there is a cliff somewhere mm -hmm. um, but we need to be aware of, of speed and also how we navigate here mm -hmm. so when you watch these documentaries um, there is of course a, a there is a sort of a balance between creating too much despair so mm -hmm. people actually get paralyzed mm -hmm. uh, and bringing in a sense of urgency and also a call to action so so how did you navigate in, the, in these treacherous waters? Because it is difficult when it comes to climate, climate action. Yeah, it is. And we did have to strike the right balance. At first, we were just telling the science <clears throat> and we weren't really going to talk about solutions at all. We were just saying, this is what's going on. Here's a science film. And then we realized it was just too depressing not to inject any hope into it. So we um, decided to end each of the five shorts with you know, a little glimmer of hope, like here's what we could do to reverse these feedback loops and make them, you know, um, cool the atmosphere, stop melting the permafrost and the sea ice and kind of restore things back to how they were. And we really tried to focus on 
natural solutions like reforestation or stopping deforestation and depending more on natural systems and of course cutting fossil fuels and emissions and all that but we did try to end each one with a little bit of you know what can you do what can we do to reverse the loops and you know also we tried to send the message to for people to vote to elect the right officials and hold them accountable because that's really i think the only way things are going to happen is if the people in charge <laughs> start making the right decisions Indeed, and and uh, as you state in the, in the first overview, I think it was that this we've had extreme uh, snow globe Earth and and hot house Earth before, but this these situations were not created by us humans, and this one is, of exactly. course, we all know this. Yes. And since we created it, we should also be able to to solve it, right? Mm -hmm. There is a strong sense of 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 call to action, a sense of hope that I that I really appreciate it because. Yeah. Uh, if we get too paralyzed, it's not going to happen. Not, 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 nothing's going to happen. Mm. Right. We don't want to make people feel that nothing can be done and just throw their arms up and say it's over. We really want to know that there are things we can do, if, but we have to come together and do them. Indeed. So uh, in terms of, of directing your, uh, your attention uh, towards the politicians, mm -hmm. how has that been received. I mean, you, you mentioned that you you uh, appreciate that people and tell them to vote. That is, of course, a, a key cool uh, tool for transformation. But when you've been in direct dialogue and sending the, the, these films to politicians, how have they responded? Well, we've only had one situation, as I mentioned, where we were able to show the films and bring in some scientists to legislate tours in Massachusetts, where we live. And they were really, really well received. I mean, I feel like we educated a lot of people. I feel like a lot of people know there's global warming and know about climate change, but they don't really understand the mechanisms behind it. And so having that knowledge really gives them, you know, informs them in a way that can help them make a decision, make the right decision, we hope. So that, you know, we're, we'd love to do more of that. And we, we feel that that was a really positive outcome because of what happened with this climate bill getting passed in our state. So we'd love to do more of that. Of course, we'd love to get get the films to people in Washington, D.C. and have them see it. But um, we haven't been able to crack that yet. Hopefully, one of these days we will. Well, since you are with us here today on the We Don't Have Time broadcast, you will have a big audience. And um, I'd say that it's a good, good point to encourage people to spread the word yes. about these fabulous films because... Um, yeah. We really don't have time, do we? We don't. And the films are there. They're free. We, you know, our our producer made sure that they would be free and available to anyone who wants to see them. So they're they're up on our website, which hopefully you'll advertise <laughs> and uh, allow people to to watch them. So sending people off with a with a why they should be watching this and spreading uh, the word about the films. What would that be from your side? I'm sorry. What what was that? Sending sending signing this interview off with with a call to action oh. to to the viewers. Uh, why why do why should they be watching these films and why should oh. they be spreading them? Yes. Well, one of the best things that scientists say you can do to help combat climate change is to talk about it with people, to make it part of the conversation, and these films are perfect ways to make this part of the conversation. They're short. They're between eight and fourteen minutes. They don't take that long to watch. This way you can arm yourself with information and be able to have a conversation with your relative, your friend, your neighbor about why it's important, why we need to understand what's going on in the climate and try to fight it. So it's, it's, uh, it's very strong, it's very powerful. Uh, would you say there are any, any limits to who we share this with? I'm thinking of younger children. Have you thought about this context when you're, when you're approaching schools, for instance? Yeah, so we do. And we actually have a science curriculum based on the United States standards for grades 6 through 12, which is around 12-year-olds to 18-year-olds here. And so we, we really do aim them at middle school and higher. Universities use them as well. But if, if, if there are teachers in that, for that age range, there's a great science curriculum that can uh, supplement their, their science teaching. Um, younger kids could see them. I mean, they're not, they're, the sciences might be a little complicated for little kids and, you know, we don't want to get them too 
um, you know, upset. <laughs> so we, we were thinking probably, probably 10 and up are good, is a good age range. And preferably together with the parents. So you can also yes, exactly have right. this conversation about, um, what, what, what we all can do and what we're yeah. all doing. Yeah. Course, and the just... curriculum has activities that students can yes. do to try to, you know, make change in their, in their communities. Mm -hmm. So after having completed this fantastic task, because it is a big task you have achieved, I'd say, congratulations. Thank you. What is the next step for, for your team here? Um, well, we've all sort of gone off in different directions, although um, Barry and I are still doing a lot of outreach work with our impact producer, Melanie Wallace. The three of us are doing a lot of work to get the films out um, and make sure that teachers are seeing them. We, um, I'm actually speaking at the Kansas Science Teachers Conference in a couple of weeks and showing them the films and talking about them. So we're really trying to reach science teacher associations, school districts, universities. So we're still getting the word out. Um, Susan, our director, has gone on to work on an, another climate film. For, uh, I sort of sense that might be the case, yes. Yes, so Susan's doing that. I'm actually developing a completely different type of film that has nothing to do with climate, but I'm still doing the outreach with the climate films. Oh, well, fantastic. So to, to conclude, uh, if you're watching this, you could share it with uh, teachers, you could share it with your local politician, right? Mm -hmm. Because we do know that uh, 10 emails to your local politician, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a big sort of media storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we send it to our local politicians and also to our uh, elected higher officials, we have actually had a, uh, um, uh, um, we, we tried to, well, we did educate some of the uh, parliamentarians in Sweden on, on climate, uh, climate action. So there mm -hmm. is some, some are interested, of course, obviously some are not as interested, but yeah. they need to get this information anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so please do share there. Um, our website is feedbacklupsclimate.com. And so you can share that link with anyone and encourage them to watch. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Bonnie, and thank you for your fantastic work uh, pr producing and creating these, these strong messages. Thanks for showing the films at the conference, and I hope it goes really well. Thank Thanks you. for having me. You're welcome. Okay. Ecosystems are facing severe challenges, 
And with more than half of the global economy dependent on healthy ecosystems, including agriculture, conserving biodiversity has become a crucial concern for businesses. Join us now for a session to learn more about the states of the planet and the role that business can and also need to play. We will highlight coming policy initiatives and how they relate to business, demonstrate new business tools for biodiversity action, and also interact with businesses that are making exciting progress in this field. We start with a keynote about the global state for biodiversity by Alexandre Antonelli. He is the director of science, Q Science, the, the Q Royal Botanical Gardens. So Alexandre will be joining us via Zoom. Please. Welcome, Alexandre. You have our full attention for your note. I'm sorry, Alexandre, but we cannot hear you. Uh, so it just if you test the sound devices on your side. And I'm looking now to the technicians too, if, they're, if they can be of any assistance. Here we go. Go ahead, please start again. And a warm okay. welcome to you. Thank you. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually today. And I just want to start by showing uh, the, a picture of the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil, which is one of the world's global biodiversity hotspots. And it's one of the most beautiful places I've seen in my life. And it's also not far from where I was born and grew up and where I would play as a child. And my early interest for nature has followed me throughout my years and shaped my career to become a biodiversity scientist, uh, to explore the amazing diversity of life on this planet, to discover new species and to shed light on how nature works and why it looks the way it does. But since I was born in the late 1970s, uh, we've lost about one quarter of all tropical rainforests. Uh, and that's due to the expansion of agriculture industries and cities. And deforestation is not only a problem in the tropics, uh, of course, but it's also happening at a very rapid pace uh, as this image of forest cover loss, loss uh, from satellite images shows uh, over the last two decades. So nature has never been in such a bad state uh, throughout human history over the last hundreds of thousands of years. And while we've increased the world's produced capital, such as buildings and roads by 100% uh, since the early 1990s, we've also lost about 40% of our natural capital. And that's uh, things like forests, fish stocks, and other natural assets. And less than 15% of Europe's habitats can be considered to be in a good, healthy state. And while the destruction of and the deterioration of habitats uh, and they are really the primary cause of biodiversity loss. Uh, we know that climate change is, of course, an additional and very serious threat to many species. Uh, and they also play uh, you know, an increasingly uh, big role in terms of threatening because of the warmer climate, climate but also more uh, less reliable climate for each year, as this plot here shows with the average temperatures uh, across the world. So, Combined uh, habitat loss and climate change alongside other stressors, they have led to a major decline in the population of wild species of, of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and fish, as shown here by uh, fantastic work by WWF and ZSL uh, and their Living Planet report that came out last year. So globally, there has been a decline of 69% uh, in the population size of those wild species. But there's also a lot of variation across regions, uh, like Latin America, where I come from, where those animals have declined by an incredible uh, 9 to 4% uh, over this period. And we at Q uh, have worked together with scientists around the world to assess the situation for plants and have found that two in five plant species are now threatened with extinction over the next decades. Uh, and that's about you know 40% of 350,000 plant species, which is of course extremely serious. So why should we care? Um, you know, everyone here is going to be affected by the loss of biodiversity in nature. Uh, nature provides us free of charge, um, basically everything we need to survive and, and thrive, and that includes medicine, food, fibers, beauty material, 
uh, pollination services for an immense amount of money, uh, nutrient cycling, soil fertility, uh, the regulation of climate both locally and globally, uh, the, control, the control of uh, pollution, both in our air and water, disease regulation we've seen with COVID and other pandemics that can really uh, be affected by the loss of nature, the prevention of erosion, landslides, uh, of course, recreation and tourism, which economically are very important activities for many countries. And last but not least, all, also our moral and ethical duty, because species are not our slaves, and which right do we have to uh, uh, turn them into extinction. So in a sense, I think that this diagram actually summarized the situation quite well and came out just at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we were really focusing very much on the, the COVID situation, how we're going to handle that. But we knew that after that, we would have a, a long period of economic uh, drawback and possible recession. But in the longer term, we also know that climate change and biodiversity loss are going to be the most far-reaching far -reaching and uh, detrimental uh, challenge that we're facing today. And of course, it's not a competition between climate change and biodiversity laws, and those are very interlinked. And one example of that is uh, the, the production of food, because if you want to tackle linked challenges, we also have to think about linked solutions and also think about solutions which are going to benefit the most marginalized and the poorest on this planet. So food is a really good example of this, because on the one hand, we know it's the biggest driver of biodiversity loss, um, both on land and at sea. It also contributes more than a third of all greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, and is also a major contribution to, uh, contributed to pollution. And so we know that, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's a really serious and problematic situation, but on the other hand, it's also our biggest opportunity, perhaps, because if we are if we manage to turn things around uh, to produce more sustainable food, we'll also be able to tackle those three uh, intertwining challenges of biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution in a cohesive way, benefiting everyone on this planet. So with, with this, I, I think that the situation is very serious, but uh, I am very pleased to hear that there'll be uh, good presentations today about action. And I really want to, to take, I, I want to thank you for the actions you're taking today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alexandre. A wonderful scenery in the background here at Kew Gardens. Um, uh, what would you say is the key role for businesses to play when we are addressing the loss, this immense loss of biodiversity? Uh, I really believe that business is a huge and unique opportunity here uh, in this process of bending the curves uh, on climate change, biodiversity laws and pollution, uh, the diagram that I showed. And the key thing for them, I think, is to assess the full environmental impact of the products and services they offer and to find innovative ways to greatly reduce them, but also to create net positive outcomes. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Um of course, the biodiversity crisis looks different in different parts of the world. And uh, according to WWF, um, we, well, in Sweden and Western Europe, with the conversion uh, of, of how we treat land roughly 100, 100 years ago, and WWF states that businesses have a res responsibility to stop the habitat loss, of course, and also protect the biodiversity uh, in the hotspots related to their global value chains, the company's global value chains. Um, what, but we also need to sort of take into account the so-called biodiversity debt. So what are your thoughts on, the, on these, these statements? Yes, I really agree on that. And I think, you know, we need to realize that um, what needs to be done is very context specific. Uh, just as example, uh, while in many regions there's an acute need to restore forests, like uh, in Brazil, for instance, and we've seen some images just before my talk, in Sweden, many species are actually threatened in open landscapes, such as meadows and heaths. Mm. So covering those areas with trees just to tackle climate change would actually be a bad idea. So we, we're not going to solve this crisis by waiting for someone else to take actions. And I really think that we all must take part in this. And that includes businesses, they have a key role in this, but also governments, um, you and me. And you know, while legis legislation can sometimes help, um, like making the most serious environmental crimes, uh, like the ecocide uh, legislation to be condemned under law, and that's a move supported by the European Parliament last month, we also need a lot of voluntary action before damage is caused. 
and to pay back, as I said, um, you know, our debt to nature so it, so it can recover and we can continue to use it sustainably. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights, Alexandre Antli. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. On January 16th, WWF launched the Biodiversity Risk Filter, BRF, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. But what is a biodiversity risk filter? And what is the role of businesses to protect and enhance biodiversity? We'll now dig a bit deeper into this and, and we'll uh, and enter on stage, ask to enter on stage Camilla Valima. She's expert on business and biodiversity at WWF Sweden, and she will now enlighten us about this. So please give Camilla a warm hand. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you here, Camilla. Thank you. you have the table and you have our full attention. Thank you very much. Okay. I will talk to you about what we think that all businesses should do all over the world, depending, depending regardless of what sectors you're in. And we, need, we know that you can do it and you need to do it and uh, it's possible to act and scale up, increase the pace. I can't see my slide, that's why I'm a bit confused. Okay, in a second. Great. Um, hmm. And I'll click forward here. We'll see the lovely pictures from Alexander again. And then you'll soon see why I started the way I did. Okay, so we're going to talk about what all businesses can do and should do to scale up and increase the pace on biodiversity. Some, peop- some companies think this is a new issue, and we'll, we'll show you that it's not entirely. We need the business sector, like an Alexander said, for us to reach the new global targets on biodiversity that came up now for 2030, and also the climate targets. Just briefly about WWF, in case you don't know us, we're an independent uh, conservation NGO. And here comes an... WWF oh. is lying. They're passive. Lovely. They are cooperating with fossil fuel companies and banks. They're just here to cooperate with the powers, the governments of the world. WWF does not want change. They just want your money to be passive. That's our statement from XR Sweden, Mm. Citizens Assemblies Group. And we're all in this together, so thank you. We're all in this together, (laughs) This is your WWF mm. is just lying and getting the money from people, ordinary people that think that WWF wants change. They don't want change. Mm. Well, this, this was your message. Uh, and uh, would I, could I please ask you to leave Camilla to share her presentation no, now? No. no, but I'll have to do that. Sorry, they because this is trying to get interesting. attention mm. by participating <laughs> here. And they want just to participate because they want you to believe that they are working for change. But in reality, we WWF ha- is lying. Okay. okay, we have, so we have, you've made your point now. You made your point. <laughs> you've got a live show out there, you've made your point, millions of people have seen it, mm. now can we just ask you to leave the stage? You've mm. made your point. So why do you put, cooperate with WWF when, 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 uh, well, we're cooperating with when you, they, they are, and you need to cooperate with us. They have massive resources, on, they have a lot of money, let's go. they don't come want on. change. Come on, come don't on. Don't believe WWF, so done. You've made your they're point. they're not doing what they, what they really should. Okay. You. We need change now, not in 10, 20, 40 years. We, yeah. all, uh, we all agree with you on that one. Uh, and uh, 
course, we need all types of climate activism, <laughs> but we need also to give the floor to the person that started your presentation. So uh, in favor, we need to be active, <laughs> but also now we need to represent and share your presentation, please, because that's what you're here for. Yes, thank you. Um, we really agree that we need to increase the pace on the work and, well... Um, <laughs> What I'd like to say, apart from the fact that we were uh, founded a long time ago and active in nearly 100 countries, I, rep I represent the WWF Sweden, Swedish office. Our mission is to stop the degradation of the planet's natural environment and build a future in which human lives in harmony with nature. And why I want to stop there is that, just like Antonelli showed, that it's very important in this transformation when we work towards conservation or sustainability or climate goals that will also ensure human rights and uh, indigenous people's rights. We're not going to talk that much about it in the coming sessions, but it's always with us. As I think you all know, the biodiversity is fundamental to business. We're all, of, all business sectors are dependent and, I and impacting nature. And according to World Economic Forum, more than half of the world's GDP is dependent on functioning, directly dependent on functioning ecosystems. And with that, of course, you mean, we mean the, the ones active in nature immediately, agriculture, forestry, fishing, and mining. But, I mean, the other half of the GDP is directly dependent on nature. Um, just like me standing here, I need food and water, and I've covered myself with clothes from agriculture, so that all, all of us are interdependent on biodiversity. There is, however, some hope. I'd like to shed some hope. Um, research also states that we can turn this, bend this curve back on biodiversity. We need more conservation efforts, and luckily we've got the global targets now, that 30%, it states 30% need protection globally, 30% restored. But that's not going to be enough, as you see on the green, bending the curve. We also need to take a step back from nature and produce more sustainably and consume more sustainably. And there's also there's 23 targets in the global biodiversity targets, but one is also about halving the impact from pollution. But if we do this together, we're gonna, work, gonna make it work. And if, what, what should a company do then, or a business? What is biodiversity for a business? Well, we state that for it to be credible and to take a full scope of biodiversity, you need to work with two arrows, two areas. And the, and the red one is uh, to stop contributing to biodiversity loss. There you find the five drivers for loss, like the IFPES, uh, the government of Panama, have identified as the reasons why we lose biodiversity. And we have the conversion of land, uh, forest to agriculture. It could be pollution, you know, plastic pollution, eutrophication, and you have the resource over-exploitation, over-harvesting. And you also have invasive species and uh, diseases that are coming up more. And climate change, like uh, Alexander talked about, is if we can't reach the climate targets, we're, we're going to have climate change being the main driver for biodiversity loss. And it, you could call climate change and biodiversity as Siamese twins. Where climate goes, biodiversity needs to go. You need to work with both. You need functioning nature to be able to combat climate change. And as you see in the red arrow, these are very familiar topics. This is environmental work since decades ago. And you could say that we collectively have failed to do enough, even if we have good examples of environmental work. Um, so we really need to scale up. On the other hand, these are well-acquainted uh, topics for us, so we really know what we need to know to, to work harder. In the green arrow, you have the more newer topics for businesses, and where you should be a, play a role in also contributing to conservation and restoration. And then you have the more sustainable use of, uh, of uh, natural resources, agriculture and forestry practices, where we have certifications that we need to improve and use more. So it's a, there's a lot of things that can be scaled up and increased you know, in, the, in this work. Where are the companies today then? We did a report with Bain & Company, uh, released in February, and we interviewed 10 of the largest Swedish companies and had a survey for 40. And this also been done in Finland and Denmark. And it showed that 
Quite few have tangible targets on biodiversity. Quite a lot of them, though, realize that they have a large, there's a large risk of biodiversity loss. And they have a very high interest in working more with it. So they may not be ready, but they're willing. I can recommend reading this report. It's a global report with a Swedish perspective, where you can find a lot of tools and knowledge and roadblocks and discussions on how to address biodiversity. I'm going to stay on the higher level, and I'm going to go back to a few points that I think that all companies can do today. As you've understood, we want you to take a whole perspective of both not stop to contribute to, to loss of biodiversity, but also increase the positive. And you need to look at the value chain, just like Alexander was talking about. And some of these issues in the red arrow are related to general business practices. Climate change, fossil fuels shouldn't be used anywhere in the value chain. And that goes for contribution to eutrophication, etc. So that's where you can scale up the level of your targets. When, the other thing about biodiversity is that it's local. The species actually live in nature, so you need to be checking your value chain. Where are you? What activities do you do? And what are the state of biodiversity there? And that's a lot more complicated. And I'm going to get back to you with an example of how you can address that. And you need to set ambitious targets and science-based targets. And we have science-based targets for climate since a long time. And in May, science-based target for nature will come. That will be version one. And they've taken on a large scope, targets for nature. So it will, be not, will not be comprehensive as a start. But there's a lot of science out there to have science-founded targets for all the other areas. So we need to have ambitious science-based targets. And like we said before, um, or I said before, we need to take a step back as well. It will not be enough to produce more sustainably. We need to conserve and protect and restore more. So we need to work harder on producing more value with less resources. And even here, you can recognize what companies have started to do, right? Resource efficiency, circular economy. But it needs to be scaled up and increased the pace a lot, because seven years is not a long time to 2030. You mentioned, Katarina, the risk filter that we launched in February in World Economic Forum. Mm, it's, a free, uh, it's a risk filter that's online, that is free of use. We had a freshwater risk filter previously, and uh, that's been there for 12 years. And now we're introducing biodiversity risk filter. It's based on global data sets, so anybody can go in here and look at the state of different biodiversity topics globally. And also, uh, there's information on different sectors and the impact they have. But the most interesting part is that you can go in and plot in where you are in your value chain, where the, your locations are, and you will get back information on how high the risk is for the company, but also the risk level in nature where you are. So you can get a first prioritization of where you have so-called hotspots, where you should work also on the ground, apart from these general higher targets. And this risk filter will also um, be of help then in some of the coming regulations and frameworks. We have the CSRD for the EU on reporting and the target setting for SBTN and the disclosure framework with TNFT. There will be loads of acronyms and there are many, many more coming and frameworks and tools. But this will help in the prioritization for that. OK. Doing all this, taking this full grip and looking into your value chain that we all know is very challenging, not just to know where you are. Um, it's going to take time, and it's an iterative process for a company. So we really urge everybody to act on everything we know now. And every, every single act in nature actually counts, but you need to choose a bit with care, because there's also a fragile state out there. But there is a lot of knowledge. We're going to see a few examples from the other companies on where they're doing uh, projects in their value chain, where there is more material to their business. And this is very important. But we can also do local projects uh, in collaboration with the local conservation uh, organizations or municipalities or other experts. 
This could be in an industrial uh, park, for instance, where you uh, where they've changed the light to red lights for the bats, for instance. Even in the local, uh, if you choose well in local context, it can also be of importance. And we have a lot of uh, certification schemes. So use credible certification schemes with ambitious biodiversity criteria and work with them to improve in this area so that they can you know, help you on the journey. We have one example here that is from natural pasture beef. In Sweden, we have a lot of old uh, agricultural land that, that with species that are dependent on uh, grazing, and it's not financially viable today to keep cattle there and those lands, so there is a certification scheme for that. There is as much as 40 species per square meter in these pasture lands, so it's very important. We're going to hear more about certification schemes from uh, Axwood later on. So to <laughs> sum it up, um, we really think that you need to take a full grip on biodiversity work on your strategy, both on the, what we would call the environmental area, the red arrow, because we need to scale it up radically, the pace on reducing the impact, and set the science-based targets or science-founded targets, and set your journey and educate everybody that needs to be educated. But the most important is to act on what we already know, and that is to take a step back, work on resource efficiency, work on the new business model to actually use less resources and less space in nature, and work with projects. And we're going to get back to the advocacy and policy part towards the end of the session as well. All of this can be scaled up, and we can increase the pace. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Camilla. Thank uh, you. Sorry about the intervention here. Well? We have invited uh, climate activists to join us on Saturday. And of course, we're all here to, to create more dialogue, but it's just unfortunate that it was a bit interrupted, <laughs> like yeah. interrupted your, your, your conversation. But you handled it, uh, handled it very coolly. So uh, for, f to really clarify uh, mm. the businesses here, yeah. three simple s things to get them started if they have not really picked up their pace yet. I think that they should look at the, <laughs> the, the two arrows and make a gap analysis of what they're doing today. Mm. What, are the, what topics of these are they working on? What are they not covering? And then you get to the next level of the value chain to see how much of the value chain do we know and how can we map that? And then use the biodiversity risk filter tool, for instance, to get started and explore the um, frameworks that are coming and see how they can be guided. Thank you. And there's, of course, plenty of support to get from WWF. Uh, yes. So please uh, take a seat. Thank you. Because uh, you'll, be, you'll be intervening and joining us uh, uh, later on. But now we will uh, move on and we are going to hear from an interesting collaboration here. Uh, company activities. First, we'll hear about the ongoing collaboration in South Africa between WWF and the multinational clothing company H&M. So I have with me on Zoom to clarify how this works. Uh, we have with us uh, Jaco Dutois, Biodiversity and Policy Manager, WWF and HM Group Partnership. And there you are, Jaco. Uh, wonderful to have you join us. It looks like you're in Sweden, but I know you are not. It's just the backdrop. Um, so Jaco, um, the H&M Group uh, seems to have made significant process uh, in the topic of biodiversity. Uh, what do you think are the success factors that we can learn from in this collaboration and how, how you work together? Thank you very much. Um, so I hope I can talk you through our work together a little bit and then mm -hmm. in summary come back to those specific success factors because exactly. I think there's some so learnings to share. You have, you, have, you have our attention, fire away. <laughs> Thank you, without a sign either. Um, so are my slides up? I cannot see that. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So while my presentation today will focus on biodiversity, it's very important to recognize that this happens in a broader context. So if you look at the left on the slide, H&M Group's biodiversity ambition falls under the circularity and climate pillar of their sustainability approach. 
And that sits next to another pillar on fair and equal practices, all built on a foundation of respect for human rights. So even though we don't talk about those in short presentations like these, the work on biodiversity has to happen in that context. Likewise, uh, if you look on the right-hand side, our partnership with H&M has a focus across climate, freshwater, and biodiversity. And we see these as interrelated topics. So if we take out little bits, then that doesn't mean we don't think that the others has to be addressed in conjunction with those. Next slide, please. So for WWF, our broad approach to company action on biodiversity can generally be broken down into three areas, commit, act, and advocate. So the commit part is where companies broadly start setting the direction of travel and develop the strategy to get there. So in the H&M example, H&M set an ambition in early 2020 to work, work towards a net positive impact on biodiversity. And this statement of intent was a critical first step because it meant that the resources and staff time had to be made available for this area of work. And then the next step, almost analogous to what Camilla said earlier, was to then stand back and get a better understanding of their departure point. So they commissioned a study on their biodiversity materiality for the top five commodities that they make use of. And the graphic on the left presents a summary of that uh, research piece, showing that the size of each box shows the amount of relative land area required to produce a commodity, but then the colors of the boxes within that indicate the ecological importance and, and the severity of the impacts on that land. So you can see that the large red and yellow squares in wool and cotton demonstrate that the land used for that production is where there's a real impact on biodiversity that has to be prioritized. Um, the report then includes further details on where these are areas are and what some of the impacts might be. So WWF is now working with H&M to complement this work through using our biodiversity risk filter, which was recently launched. And that can provide a more nuanced understanding of potential biodiversity risks that go just beyond just the uh, land use. And all of this work then in turn is positioning H&M to be ready to set more specific time-bound targets, including potentially against the guidelines of the science-based targets network when, as they come out. Traceability to farm level remains one of the major challenges that we face in this, in this sector and industry. We need to resolve that, but it's also encouraging that we are finding interim workarounds that means we don't need to delay action while we wait for that traceability to be developed. Next slide, please. Because the crisis is so urgent and we need to act while we plan, uh, we've already started implementing projects. Um, and I'll just talk about two specific ones today. So particularly, we're introducing regenerative farming practices in the Satpuda Pench Wildlife Corridor in India. And so this landscape still functions for people and nature by providing livelihoods for communities through cotton growing, while allowing tigers and other wildlife to move between protected areas but it is under threat from large-scale commercial agriculture and infrastructure development. So by working together to support smallholder farmers to adopt regenerative farming practices, we aim to reduce their input cost, enhance their profitability, and regenerate natural systems, which will all in turn help to secure these vital wildlife corridors. Similarly, in South Africa, we're working with commercial and communal farmers in and around the area earmarked for the country's newest national park, and by introducing regenerative grazing practices for sheep, we aim to address overgrazing and unsustainable land use related to wool production. And it's interesting and encouraging that if livestock is managed regeneratively, it can actually fulfill an ecological niche and contribute to the healthy functioning of the natural ecosystems within this grasslands landscape, which is also a critical water source area. So such projects are invaluable to develop an understanding of the challenges farmers and suppliers face on the ground, and to, to start acting immediately. And then we do face this challenge of how do we take projects like this up to the scale where we can reach hundreds of thousands of suppliers towards adopting more regenerative practices. Certification certainly plays a role, but it has to be combined with landscape level action. And what's clear is that collaboration at multiple levels is required if we are to achieve the necessary systems transformation. Next slide, please. And this is why WWF also works with H&M Group to engage policymakers and to collaborate with other companies. So over the last couple of years, our partnership has supported the call for strong government frameworks for biodiversity, including through events like co-hosting a business and biodiversity workshop during Stockholm Plus 50 with IKEA, supporting H&M Group company leaders to speak on this topic at the World Economic Forum in Davos and at the Biodiversity COP15 conference in Montreal at the end of last year and supporting all of this through media outreach to emphasize the importance of this issue for companies. 
and coalitions like Business for Nature have been critical collaborative channels for this work. Next slide. So that was really a lightning tour of some of the work we're doing together. I hope that the experiences shared shows that it is possible for a company to work on biodiversity, even though it can seem like a very complex topic. While many of the answers for the challenges still remain, many of the answers still remain to be found, our partnerships with companies like H&M are working to get closer to that level of change required. We can only solve this crisis through collaboration and taking action as soon as possible because we really don't have time. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much indeed, Jocko. Uh, so what would you say are the key success factors that other companies can take away from this, uh, from this collaboration with H&M? Thanks for picking that up again. Yeah, so basically in summary, I think it's really important to do that moonshot ambition setting, identify the end goal, and then allocate resources and staff time to make that happen. Mm -hmm. That was critical for H&M Group. Mm -hmm. Getting expert advice to understand material impacts and dependencies in your starting point, and the WWF risk filter is a great uh, starting point for that. And finally, key partnerships. So this is an example of how WWF and H&M Group are working together. I mentioned Business for Nature, and there are many others through which companies can get into this topic. Well, thank you again, Jocko, for, for joining us, and best of luck with your continued work. Thank you. And now, Camilla, I'll let you introduce uh, the next collaboration. You can do it from sitting position, it's fine. It's between WWF and one of the leading company, furniture companies in the world. So yes, give, give the, inf uh, the uh, introduction. We're going to see a movie about a joint project in Indonesia that's connected to forest, forestry. Uh, we've worked uh, together with IKEA for almost 20 years, and all the time on forest, the forest side. Um, a lot on FSC spreading that. I mean, we've certified the size of Germany of forest during this time. Um, we've also worked on climate and cotton and the fresh water. But this is a very interesting film to see where there's all, both um, connecting to natural reserves for wildlife, and this also provides a corridor apart from the livelihood that we're going to see. Excellent. Thank you. So let's watch the film. Cerita cerita dari leluhur kami mengakui bahwa orang hutan itu asalnya dari manusia. Mereka pergi tinggal di hutan yang lebat. Orang Dayak sudah lama bertani menanam rotan. Rotan yang sangat sakral untuk orang Dayak dan juga dipakai untuk kebutuhan sehari-hari. Dan rotan itu dia menghasilkan banyak bahan. Dia punya kulit, dia punya tengah. Dan dia juga bisa digunakan dengan adanya seperti itu hubungan pohon dan rotan itu sangat erat rotan tidak bisa hidup tanpa adanya pohon sedangkan kami orang Dayak tidak bisa hidup lepas dari hutan kita sudah membentuk koperasi untuk bisa mengolah rotan secara berkelanjutan dan mencari pasar dibantu oleh WWF dan IKEA sehingga kita mendapatkan sertifikasi FSC dan kami juga mendapat sertifikat tanah supaya tidak dialih fungsikan untuk hal-hal yang lain kalau kita tidak menjaga hutan kita tidak menjaga orang hutan kita harus mempertahankan hutan supaya nanti anak cucu kita masih bisa menikmati dengan adanya hutan. Well, that was truly beautiful, and it also really shows how we are all interconnected and also completely dependent on the ecosystems. Um, X Food is one of the largest food retail groups in Sweden. 
But how does this company tackle biodiversity issues? Well, luckily we have with us here in Stockholm to talk about this, Helena Allard, sustainability innovator at Axfood. So please join us here on stage. Thank you. <laughs> And you have our full attention for your keynote. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I'm going to talk about Axfood's biodiversity work. So, first, Axfood in brief. Uh, we are one of the largest players in food retail in Sweden, and uh, we reach about 4.5 million customers each week. And our most common concepts. Uh, known to Swedes are Willis and Hemköp. An Axfood sustainability strategy is to work with everything that have uh, an impa impact on us and everything that we have an impact on. And our device is sustainability in everything. And we divide our work into three areas, so it's food, environment, people. And our biggest impact comes from food production, so therefore I'm going to focus my few minutes here. And food production is the main driver of uh, biodiversity loss, as we know, and uh, we have a huge responsibility to bend the curve here. And Axfood recently launched a biodiversity strategy, and uh, it consists of four parts. So first is to increase the share of products, uh, with ambitious biodiversity requirements. Two, improving the minimum stand of, standard of all, um, uh, for biodiversity for all products. And halving food waste by 2025 and being a positive force for biodiversity in uh, society. And this strategy is the first step to summarize our current work uh, to be able to further accelerate our work in this area. So it's more is coming later on. And I'm going to talk about our use of credible certification schemes. And I would say they are the most important tool we have to both uh, get a more sustainable food production, but also be able to offer uh, consumers more sustainable choices. And many uh, certification schemes include measures for biodiversity. So it could be to preserve nature, uh, minimize the use of extra harmful pesticides, or, for example, creating habitats at and around production sites. And here are some of the certifications we use. And we use them in different ways. Uh, so, partly for increase the share of uh, more sustainable uh, goods on the top to be able to offer conscious consumers more sustainable choices, and also for raising the minimum requirements for all. And we have thousands of products in our stores, so it will be, be impossible for us to have our own um, comprehensive sustainability schemes and control programs. So we're happy to rely on credible certification schemes that are adapted to production conditions in specific countries, and that also uh, constantly are uh, developing their criteria and pushing the production into more um, sustainable uh, production. And uh, one example of how we use them for raising the minimum requirements is that we only use uh, sus sustainability certified soy, palm oil, cocoa, coffee and tea in our private label products. And uh, for increasing the share of more sustainable uh, produce to uh, be able to offer conscious consumers more sustainable choices, we have uh, sale targets. So by 2025, we should sell 30% uh, of sustainability labeled products and 10% of organic labeled products. And last year, we reached about 26% of sustainability labeled products. So uh, I would conclude that credible certification schemes are truly useful and effective tools uh, to get uh, an effect on the broad supply uh, of a company and also to get a steady base for further, more specific uh, projects uh, regarding biodiversity. Yes, that's all. Well, thank you, Elena. Thank you. Uh, a question related to the, the crux we're in now with, with the, the inflation, and people are 
as the statistics are showing, showing less the buying less of the certifi cert certificate uh, cert certified products. Yeah. So what can uh, Axfo do, and what should we as consumers do in this difficult situation? Because it is about the economy uh, for the for the uh, families. Yeah, we have to keep on uh, offering uh, more sustainable uh, labelled goods. Mm -hmm. But we also, uh, for example, Axwood has a proposal for uh, abolishing or reducing the tax for sustainability labelled products. Uh, so therefore, it's getting uh, equally uh, expensive to buy uh, sustainability labelled products. And uh, as a consumer, you can still buy some products um, mostly important, like cocoa, coffee, tea, bananas, for example, that have a really high impact on biodiversity. So you can focus on a few products. You don't need to buy all uh, sustainability label products if you don't have the money to. Excellent, excellent recommendations. Thank you very much, Helena. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, continue with another example from the fashion industry with Gina Tricot. Um, and I'd like to ask Camilla to highlight and also to tell us why you're highlighting this example. Yes. Well, they are going to show an example of a, what we call a collective action project. And it's related to water stewardship. And the fact that well, why we like collective action so much is if you're a, if you're a conscientious company in a river basin where, uh, along a river, and you're the only one that stops polluting the river. Mm. It's not going to change the river. So therefore, it's very good if we can collectively join all the stakeholders, all or a lot of the companies, the municipality, the authorities, the farmers are the stakeholders in a project, so you can get a bigger effect. So that's what their Gina Tricot is, is part of, is collective action in Turkey. Mm. Mm. Excellent. And we will now watch a, a video. Could you uh, describe who's in it, please? Yes, it's Rebecca Watkins. She's a sustainability... Hmm, I don't know. I'm not sure I have a title. I might yet. have it in my script. <laughs> Thank you. Sustainability <laughs> director. Oh, director. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, she can be here and can mm. be live. So we, it's a recorded presentation from her about their work and ends up in the Collective Action Project. All right. Well, thank you. Let's watch it. Yes. Hi all, I am Rebecca Watkins, working as Global Sustainability Director at Gina Tricot. I am so sorry not being able to join this session live, but I have recorded this short presentation that I hope will be of interest to you all. Gina Tricot is a Swedish fashion brand founded in 1997. We primarily sell fashion and accessories to women, but also to younger girls, as well as have a small home decor line. Dina Tricot has stores in Scandinavia, but also a European web shop, as well as business-to-business -business consumers selling our products, products in Europe and Asia. All the way from the start of the company, doing business with heart has been one of our core values. We want to have a positive impact, as well as be a positive force, both for people and for the sustainability transformation within the textile industry. As a small brand, we believe in partnerships to scale up our impact, and we team up with experts, scientists, innovators, but also with NGOs. And we are therefore very proud to be able to work together with WWF Sweden since three years back. As we know, water is critical for our life on our planet, and it's also crucial to our business. Water impacts occur at all stages of the textile value chain. To mitigate the risks, linked to Gina Tricot and our business, we work with water stewardship in partnership with WWF Sweden. Through the stewardship model, we assess water risks in our supply chain, identify challenges, and work in a transparent and collaborative manner to implement solutions. During our partner period, we have assessed the wet processing units in our value chain through the water risk filter provided by WWF. Through this free online tool, we get to analyze the risks in our supply chain linked to physical, regulatory and reputational water risks. And by better knowing the risks and location of the risks, we can better pinpoint where and how to focus our actions to have the biggest impact. 
The fashion industry stands for 4 to 8 percent of global annual carbon emissions, where the largest part comes from the production, and 20 percent of all wastewater worldwide comes from textile dyeing and treatments. We have a huge responsibility to decrease this impact. At Inatricot, we have set an absolute target to reduce our climate impact within all scopes by minimum 50 percent until the latest end of 2030. We're glad to have our near-term target validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative during 2022. The next step for Yenatrico in our sustainability journey is to look closer into our impact on biodiversity. And by using WWF's Biodiversity Risk Filter, we hope to better manage and mitigate our impact within this field. As mentioned before, we believe in partnerships, but we also believe in collective action to be able to increase impact. Through our partnership with WWF Sweden, we have joined a collective action project in Turkey, more specifically in the Buyuk Menderes area and Delta, located at the west coast of Turkey. Turkey has always been the primary production country for Yenatriko, with a share of almost 28% during 2022. Therefore, it was important to us to have a collective action project in the country. The Buyuk Mendes area holds a large ecological importance. It also holds 14% of the national cotton production, and this is one of the target sections within the project. Cotton is also Yinatriko's most important fibre, standing for almost 50% of the fibres in our products. The Buyuk Menders project strives to ensure sustainable water management and the objectives are, among others, to enhance technical capacity and implement best available techniques in the textile industry. But also to implement water stewardship for cotton production, including regenerational agriculture practices. The project also strives to spread the best practices within the textile and cotton sector at a national level in Turkey. Long-term goals for the project are better water quality, healthier freshwater habitats, as well as enhanced biodiversity. Thank you so much for listening to my short presentation. I hope it could inspire you in some way. Take care and have a great day ahead. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Corporate climate action, uh, like what we just watched and heard about, is of course extremely important, but it can only get us so far. We also need policy, right? To speed up this transformation and to help us reach the new goals for biodiversity by 2030. And we need now to shed some more light on this. And joining us by Zoom to talk about is, is Guido Brockhoven. He's head of policy research and development at WWF International. So please, now you need the clicker, because Camilla is not only the keynote speaker, she's also the clicker woman here. So uh, Guido, wonderful to have you here, and you have you. our attention to talk about this. Thank you. I'd like to uh, reiterate uh, three uh, key messages that I've sort of filtered through the last 45 uh, minutes or so. Um, the, the first one is uh, that we have a global agreement to address the biodiversity crisis. The Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was agreed in December last year, and in it, um, governments agreed on a number of commitments uh, for action to uh, halt and reverse biodiversity loss. Uh, the next slide, please. So the overall ambition of that uh, framework is indeed by 2030 to have halted and reversed uh, biodiversity loss. Um, and underneath that overall ambition, the next slide, please, please um, there's a, a, a series of global action targets agreed um, for uh, governments to implement by 2030. There's targets around increased conservation, which also includes increased restoration and spatial planning, but there's also targets related to addressing the drivers of biodiversity loss and reducing our footprint of production and consumption. There's targets in, in that cluster specifically addressing and identifying a number of uh, sectors that drive biodiversity loss, such as food and agricultural systems, such as forestry, fishery, um, and also the finance sector. There's also a series of targets that address cross-cutting issues such as circular economy, nature-based solutions. 
There's a cluster of targets around finance, both to hold financing things that are bad for biodiversity and to increase finance that is good for biodiversity. And there are targets that relate to applying a rights-based approach, which means upholding the rights, for example, of indigenous peoples and local communities in the implementation of the framework. So the overall direction of travel to 2030 has been agreed and governments have committed to that. Now, if we go to the next slide, that overall framework also provides guidance to businesses. Again, on the one hand, to identify and eventually reduce and halt activities that are negative for nature. Um, and this is actually a quote from Business for Nature, the coalition that was advocating for the requirement to um, identify and disclose uh, the risks and dependencies that uh, businesses have uh, on nature um, as, as sort of a first step towards really eliminating uh, the dependencies and, and the negative impacts of businesses on uh, nature. But there's also, in the next slide, there's also the opportunities that the framework creates, for example, by recognizing nature-based solutions, which are solutions to societal challenges, such as climate change, that have also uh, biodiversity benefits and the need for a just transformation of some of these sectors that drive biodiversity loss. And this graph also shows uh, some work carried out by the World Economic Forum that identifies that these just transformations uh, can potentially generate up to 10 billion uh, business opportunities, uh, business value by 2030, and up to 400 million uh, new jobs that can be created through those uh, transformations. So the framework also sets uh, the uh, the overall direction globally of travel for the business community. And then my third message is in the next slide, and that is really about implementation. All elements are now in place for ambitious implementation uh, of actions to achieve those globally agreed and committed targets. Now, the implementation will primarily need to take place at the national level, um, and the mechanism, therefore, are these so-called national biodiversity strategies and action plans, in which these global targets need to be translated into national targets. And again, a commitment and requirement of the global framework is that these uh, national target setting exercises will be done in consultation with stakeholders. So certainly also there an opportunity for business to engage at the national level in that national target uh, setting exercise to translate these global commitments. So really three uh, key elements uh, that will enable uh, businesses to, to set the direction of travel. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Guido. Uh, for companies listening in here, uh, I'd like to address the question of collaboration with you. Uh, how do they sort of collaborate and, and strengthen their forces to this policy that needs to be pushed forward? I mean, we really need to make the policymakers understand that there are many companies behind. So how do you, how do you find other companies to really sort of join forces? Yeah, I, I think there are coalitions um, both at the global level, but also at the national level where companies uh, can work together um, to engage in these stakeholder processes to set these national targets and to uh, encourage uh, government to, uh, to make them ambitious mm. um, and then to indeed uh, implement them in collaboration with civil society and, and, and the private sector as well. At the same time, of course, at the global level also, we need to continue to uh, hold countries accountable for what they've committed to, to doing. And, and there are also the business coalitions working at that level, and they need to continue to engage also at the global level to make sure that this uh, ambitious framework will be achieved by 2030. Well, thank you very much indeed, Guido. Thank you. Welcome. And Camila, join me here up on the, on, on next to the table because I have one final question for you. Yes. Um, companies, again, it's basically the same question that Greta got, got. How can WWF help? Because I, that's basically what they said. It would be sort of seesawed it over to you. Uh, you can help in, in addressing these topics, of course. So how, how, do, how do people find help and how do yeah. they collaborate with you? Well, since it's... Uh, 
global companies, the, the first thing they can do is look up the national mm -hmm. country office because there are different resources and, they, and the, when the national plans, it's important to be in the country as well. Uh, the other part is you can obviously contact us, us <laughs> me, and uh, you have a lot of resources on the, on the web page with the risk filters, but not only that, but also links to all sorts of engagements in the climate and biodiversity uh, sectors. And so there's lots, lots of material, and don't hesitate to contact us. Panda.org is the global starting point. Panda.org. Yes. It's a lovely website name, I think. Yes. It's, been the, it's been there for a while. Well, thank you very much, Camilla. Fantastic work at WWF. And your, a th big thanks to the, your colleagues, too, of course, joining us here. Thank you. <laughs> so it's now time for me to hand over to my colleague, Nick Nuttall, and he will head a session on some very interesting solutions to make food production sustainable. So stay with us. Great. Uh, for many people, uh, the last UN climate conference held in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, was literally groundbreaking in the sense that two issues, nature-based solutions, uh, and uh, also, uh, to use the broadest possible term, sustainable agriculture, came out of the shadows and into the sunlight as highly promising, cost-effective solutions to multiple challenges, from climate and biodiversity emergencies up to good livelihoods for farmers, and human health, which is very important uh, everywhere. But we're just at the start of this journey, and we need to rapidly scale up if this potential benefits uh, from moving to more sustainable food production and agriculture are to be harvested at scale and on time. Right here, right now, we're going to have to, uh, several guests, uh, special guests. Uh, I'm going to hear from them what needs to be done and why from their unique perspect uh, perspectives. So it's my pleasure to welcome on stage, yeah, we've got Olga Grunvalund, who's founder and general uh, of Reformaten, which calls itself a movement for a positive global food system. And we have uh, Susanna Valner, who's deputy CEO of Restart Earth. Please join me on the sofa. Uh, hopefully joining us from uh, Melbourne in, yes, there we go. We've got Chris Armitage. He's the CEO of uh, the Global Evergreening Alliance. Hi, Chris. Great to see you. Uh, and also we've got with us, uh, we've got uh, Gus Teha. He's Chief Operations Officer at Renature, uh, which supports farmers and corporates uh, scaling regenerative agriculture. What we're trying to get out of this basically is, what do we do now? How do we actually fast forward these things? Rather than just talking about why sustainable agriculture is good, what do we actually do now? Um, so. If we take the thesis that our food and agricultural system are currently not everywhere fit for purpose, how do we fix them? And what is your idea for this? Um, so let's start with you, Olga. You're in I have the all the solutions. <laughs> all the solutions. I mean, it's a massive subject, right? No, Agriculture no, no, not. is huge. We could be talking about yeah. smallholder farmers in developing yeah. countries or big, huge farms in some parts of the developed world. It's, it's, it's too big for us to actually solve in 30 yeah. seconds or 30 minutes. <laughs> but let's have a go about what are, you, what are some of your hot ideas? Yeah, I think like the most important thing is to acknowledge that it's a very complex subject yeah. and that we need to look on sol uh, solutions that are holistic because like sustainability is uh, economic, uh, uh, social and uh, ecologic. Mm -hmm. So the solutions that we look at needs to uh, apply all different dimensions. Mm -hmm. And also we cannot only look on the uh, impact of the biodiversity or the climate. We also need to look on the public health and social justice questions. Mm -hmm. And also like it's very complicated as uh, uh, different documents like from a global to a very local level is controlling the food system. Mm -hmm. And 
people have different priorities and the interest in the food system. So I think like the first step is to create a we like a, a more knowledge within the actors that work in the food system of how it's actually affecting the different silos. Mm -hmm. Because all like if you look on the silos, then we we uh, come up with solution that will be, uh, maybe harm the other silos. So if everyone would start to eat non-organic, uh, 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 non-organic avocados from Mexico when they don't have any groundwater mm -hmm. and farmers are suffering from that, then we have a huge other problem. Mm -hmm. So I think like knowledge and then uh, policy transformation. Okay. Short. Yeah. Susanna, uh, tell us a little bit about it. And by the way, Susanna is doing a marvelous job today because actually she's got a real challenge with her voice and she's been sucking some tablets called Revoice, the Gelo Revoice, they're absolutely fantastic. I had those at one of the last climate conferences. Um, Susanna, give us some thoughts uh, on, on what kind of switches and changes we could see to actually improve the agricultural food production story. Yeah, uh, I, I can see because uh, as I was in my former role, uh, business manager in Maria Stad municipality, and we worked close to this area also, uh, but we didn't really get there. And uh, then I was uh, then headhunted to a company that is uh, like a startup, uh, and we are working now on a project or a system that uh, is like Olga told, holistic. And uh, we are going to take that to the market. And what I noticed with everything in this field is that you have to have the system solution. You have to go all the way. You can't just take uh, pieces if you do a system. Like if you do, like we did in Maria Star, the hydrogen station, you, you can't only take the hydrogen, you have to take the hydrogen, the oxygen, the soil, and put it together and use everything in the system. And you have to do that to a solution. And maybe you have to add different kind of techniques together to get the new innovations, mm -hmm. to get this kind of systems. So that's what we are looking at right now. And I can see there are many new techniques coming that we could approach. And then our funding will have to keep in step with that because today our funding and our research is too much silos. So for a researcher to get funding, he has to go for the silo, but we need a system. So there we have a real problem, I think, a really okay. challenge. Yeah. OK, we might nail this down in a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, Chris, uh, you're over there in Melbourne. I don't know if that's a picture of Melbourne in the background, <laughs> but it looks like it's got lots of boats. Sounds great. Uh, well, great. Um, Chris, uh, your work is, is a lot in the, the developing countries as well as in countries like Australia. Uh, the soil is a big story in this, isn't it? Uh, uh, how we take care of our soils. Um, give us a glimpse. What are your big ideas? How do we fast forward sustainable agriculture that benefits the planet and, and its people? Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to compliment you on the framing of the question, which um, focuses on systems. I think a big part of the problem is that we haven't really been taking a systems change approach in developing so many solutions. Um, as, as you mentioned, my perspective is more focused on uh, developing countries and smallholder agriculture. Um, and, and I'd suggest that uh, scaling up sustainable or, or regenerative agriculture, particularly with the integration of appropriate trees into cropping systems, is a significant part of the, uh, the solution, not just to address our food production needs, but also the interrelated uh, global challenges that we've all been trying to address for decades now such as uh, food insecurity, acute rural poverty, land degradation, um, and more recently, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of NGOs, technical research organizations, governments, UN agencies, and, and the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. The collective capacity of these organizations is absolutely massive. The science is undeniable. There are some extremely accessible practices that that have proven really effective in increasing productivity, reliability and resilience of food production systems to the impact of climate change, and which have also proven effective in restoring degraded land to a more productive state. Yep. So why haven't the practices been adopted by vulnerable rural communities all over the world? There are a lot of reasons, but I'd suggest one of the biggest ones is that the, the vast majority of programs um, supporting these practices are, are really small scale. They're fragmented, 
They're disconnected from each other. There are very little coordination and few opportunities for projects to learn from one another or to further, further innovate. Mm -hmm. um, and this is at least partly because most NGOs rely on grant funding to implement projects, and most donors are looking for something new, another pilot which will never be scaled up. Right. Um, but I think we, we can all recognise that we can't rely on grant funding to address these global challenges. There simply isn't enough of it, and the heavy lifting needs to be done by the private sector. Like me, I'm, I'm sure you've all heard it said that the private sector has enormous resources available to support this work, but there just aren't enough investable projects, which is a bit ironic because most NGOs complain about there not being enough available funding. But I think the key is understanding what an investable project is. Most large corporates don't want to invest in 100 small projects. There, there are too many transaction costs and it's not their core business. They'll all have specific needs and, and they'll all want some kind of a return or at the very least concrete measurable outcomes. Mm. Um, and they'll want to work with a, a project implementer that's credible, that they can rely on to manage their investments and that can be held accountable for results. Yeah. And these are things that the vast majority of NGOs struggle to deliver. Mm. And if the investor is interested in carbon offsets, that adds another layer of complexity and necessary scale because carbon projects are, are extremely expensive to implement. But at the end of the day, I'd suggest that the only way to fix food production or agricultural systems or to scale up regenerative ag is to recognise the complementary and necessary roles of diverse stakeholders and work collaboratively to develop programs at a really massive scale. We need to align the interests of investors with governments, program implementers, grassroots organisations and communities. And this requires really effective coordination and facilitation and to build on proven effective programmatic models. And, and it requires key stakeholders to understand the opportunities and choose to participate. So increased visibility of sessions like this is going to be key. Right. Thanks. Thanks that's great. Let's uh, let's turn to Gus as well. Uh, Gus, um, Renature, it's it's a relatively it's a newish uh, organisation, isn't it? Um, what 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 are you specially focusing on? What do you see as the main solutions to these multiple challenges of of giving farmers decent livelihoods, healthy food, and not trashing the planet? Right. I think, first of all, thanks to Chris, because I think he covered a lot of the topics that I was was intending to cover. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main oh, thing, sorry, you know, <laughs> speaking more from a, from a corporate perspective and, and being one of these project implementers, for us, I think one of the key uh, challenges and opportunities that we see is that uh, the farmer is really at the center of this transition. I'm very much a believer in the system that we have to change. Um, but in that, we should not ignore the fact that farmers are not helpless spawns in a project that need grant funding, but they are entrepreneurs and they, they usually have the skills and the knowledge that is needed to implement a lot of regenerative practice and principles. But what they do not have access to is all of the information that is applicable to their situation. Mm -hmm. They do not have a voice in how these projects are uh, basically constructed and therefore they have very little incentive to adopt practices for the longer term. Um, they don't have access to knowledge about what the business case is. So how will the investment in regenerative agriculture pay itself back over time? And more importantly, we have to recognize the fact, especially for the 600 smallholder farmers in the global south, that they have been part of a system that has not acted in their interest. That they don't have the necessary financial buffer that is required to swing to a new system of agricultural production. And so if we want to ask farmers to switch to a system which I think the science and also now um, the, the data from implementation is showing is really ultimately a better way of producing. If we want them to risk their livelihoods, then we have to provide them with the resources, mm -hmm. the financial resources and the knowledge to be able to make that switch. And there, I do see a very important way in using grant financing and philanthropic money in a different way, not sending it over, making a, a, a nice project that looks beautiful on a website. And then after a few years being surprised that it doesn't, it's not self-sustaining. But we need that money as capital, as catalytic capital, and we need yeah. to invest it at a first stage to kind of decrease the risk for the farmers, so that they can make the transition and mm -hmm. ultimately reap benefits of a better 
a business case. Mm -hmm. In the end, we're all convinced that we need to change the planet for the better, mm -hmm. but we need to convince the CEO at the top that looks at the bottom line. If we can convince her or him, then all of the other ESG goals that we can meet with regenerative agriculture, fantastic, let's do it. But in the end, we are in a capitalist system and we do need to make sure that the business case works out. So okay. for me, that is something that we need to solve. Okay, Gus. Uh, yeah, Olga, let's come back to you. So um, we, this is a very large subject, right? Mm -hmm. And a very complex subject. But yeah. we'll talk about shifting a, a, a system of agriculture that's been based on mm -hmm. chemicals and subsidies and whatever, uh, which has stretched all around the world since maybe the Second World War, mm -hmm. and how to move it into a completely new arena. Um, what, what are your thoughts and what you've been hearing? But I think a very important thing that we also have this issue with the, like many uh, small scale farmers in Sweden also closed down since the 19s, uh, nine out of 10 has closed down mm -hmm. because the Euro European, uh, uh, the cap, the European policy. Yeah, within, the common uh, agricultural yeah. policy. Uh, yeah. That is not, uh, uh, it has not been working so good for, for a sustainable food system. Mm -hmm. So, but another thing that is very important to speak about, uh, it's also the fact that like when you go today, everyone get their food from I say super bad markets. <laughs> you don't say I don't super markets, you say super, super bad, bad markets. markets okay. Because they're not so good. <laughs> uh, uh, but that is mainly because of like how the, uh, like when you go to a supermarket and buy something, then a very small percentage of that money goes back to the farmer. Mm -hmm. Like the biggest portion of that money goes to the packaging mm -hmm. uh, and the shelves. Mm -hmm. So how can the farms be able to treat the landscape in the best possible way when they don't get any money for it? Yeah. So they are locked in a fucked up system so therefore we have to change all these middle hands as well and as long as we don't do that they will not be able to to work yeah. because they are under really like hard pressure one, one of the most shocking things my work for the UN Environment Program yeah. headquartered in Nairobi was that there were actually farmers in Kenya yeah. who had contracts with supermarkets in Europe mm -hmm. that specified the shape of the beans that they should grow or yeah. the color of the broccoli yeah. and if they didn't meet these standards the supermarkets said we don't want this food, even though they contracted it because it broke the contract. Mm. And in the contract, they couldn't even, the local farmers couldn't even eat the food. Yeah. They had to trash it. Yeah. And if you think about that in a country like Africa, where people are starving, or a continent, mm. and that, that supermarkets had that power yeah. over farms there, it's absolutely breathtaking, right? Yeah. But it's the same here, like in Sweden, we have three big supermarkets. We have Ica, Axe Food and Coop. And like all the supermarkets, they do their business and they are harming the planet's health and the people's health by it. And then they have a nice little foundation that do the good uh, window out to the world and say, oh, we're experimenting this or we're doing that. So I'm very tired of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, a bit like ExxonMobil saying that they're in investing in algae as a way of substituting yeah. the fossil fuels. Look, we are planting they turned out to be 0.001% yeah. of their business business model, yeah. Mm. Um, Susanna, um, I know that your voice is a bit challenged, but just can you briefly just dig a little, what is this special new business that you've got? I didn't really understand what it was at all. No, that's the meaning, <laughs> because it's innovative. <laughs> it's so top secret. <laughs> yeah, that, that You can is. just say it exists, but you can't say anymore. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So right. It's a cliffhanger. <laughs> it's a cliffhanger. But I right. wouldn't leave a safe job in a municipality. Is it hydroponics or is it, is it normal agriculture with cows and fields or what is it? Chemicals. Increase it. <laughs> no, no. But I think, like, uh, I think we should take care of the soil we stand on. Take care of the soil. So it's yep. a bit, uh, it's a bit of that. Yeah. And that. <laughs> yep. But uh, I can't say anything right now because okay. we are working on a new system. So I maybe in uh, a couple of months or okay. something I can this say is more. Okay, intriguing, isn't it, ladies <laughs> yeah, and gentlemen? Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, let's come yeah. back to our other guests over yeah. there. Um, I mean, one of the things I think was a standout at at the last UN climate conference in Sharm El Sheikh was food and was nature-based solutions and sustainable agriculture. But there was also this fantastic report from Conservation International and our friends from the Exponential Roadmap on the fact that. Um, if you apply nature-based solutions and sustainable agriculture, however you define it, whether it's regenerative or organic or whatever, that, that you, we could as a world actually uh, meet our 2030 climate targets of halving emissions by 2030 through sustainable agriculture and through nature-based solutions, which actually left me leaving Sharm el for the first time in ages from a UN climate conference, being a bit optimistic. Um, Chris, uh, maybe you could come in and then, then Gus, did you, did you, do you feel that we are at a new crossroads? 
Chris. I mean, there was so much momentum at COP27, which I'd never seen before on these topics. I completely agree with you, Nick. Um, agriculture has always been seen as a, a major contributor to greenhouse gases, but it, uh, it wasn't seen as a significant potential contributor to greenhouse gas removals mm -hmm. until quite recently. Um, I, I think one of the, the main challenges, though, is coming up with solutions, doing the science, showing what can be done um, is, you know, it, it's a great start providing awareness and, and creating um, a, a sense of hope and uh, something that people can focus on. But the main challenge is, is actually getting the commitment of key stakeholders to, to participate in, in these approaches and to do it at really massive scales. Mm. It's not something that one organisation can do. Um, it's, it's something that everybody needs to get behind, not just to appreciate or to be aware of it, but to contribute to it. So um, for me, COP27 was a great opportunity to build awareness and to promote ag as a potential solution and also to, to highlight some of the more progressive early movers from the private sector. Um, you know, we were promoting climate asset management that was investing significantly in farmer-led carbon removal programs. But I think COP28 will be where we can showcase the results um, of a lot of the work that's been done since. We can inspire stakeholders from around the world to get behind a really massive scaling up of regenerative ag. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to you, Gus, on this, I mean, so if you're a large food company like, say, Unilever, yeah, mm -hmm. or Nestle, the, the, the big boys, as they like to call them, and big girls as well. Um, people tend to be a bit cynical about them, but some of them are actually recognised that, say, regenerative agriculture is going to be absolutely critical for whether they're going to meet their climate targets. Mm -hmm. Because they can cut their emissions in the way they produce the food or make the food products, you know, uh, and also their operations. But actually, they're reliant on emission reductions by a long chain of farmers out there that provide the food in the first place for them to repackage it as products. So are you seeing in your work that some of the, even the big players are starting to open their eyes up to the fact that we can change the system? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think um, when you're talking about these big organizations, uh, pretty much all of them have done the math internally in looking at the ESG commitments that they have made based on either internal uh, intrinsic motivation or external pressure. It's probably a little bit more of the latter, but let's leave that in the middle. Um, these organizations have made big commitments to gender equality, to uh, saving water, to lowering uh, the use of agrochemicals, to lowering their carbon footprint, to increasing biodiversity. And they made these claims without really knowing what they were getting into. Now, it's up to us to hold them to those claims. And they are internally doing the math on what they call cost avoidance. So calculating for the future, what will it take me or what will it cost me if I need to offset all of these carbon emissions through carbon credits versus what if I inset them in my supply chain? And what if I, when insetting in my supply chain, also invest in gender equality, the inclusion of disenfranchised groups, or maybe even diversity of, of uh, farm owners, and all of these ESG topics that they that they have claimed, um, they are starting to wake up to the fact that regenerative agriculture as a toolbox or sustainable agriculture, make it even broader, offers ways to meet these ESG targets um, in a way that they can also internally justify it by showing that there is a business case for this. Mm -hmm. And for me, combining that also what came out of COP where there was mention of the word business case and there was mention of really looking at outcomes and solutions and seeing regenerative agriculture and sustainable agriculture as a solution to the problems in the world and not just as a contributor to it, mm -hmm. that for me creates a lot of positive movement and it really makes it so that I believe that a lot of companies will come forward with more holistic and more structural programs within their supply chains that will actually help them meet the ESG targets that they've set for 2030. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, yes, I, I am... I am cautiously optimistic about uh, how these uh, topics will develop. Right. Coming back to what Chris said, though, and ladies here as well in, in the studio, I mean, where are we going to get the money for this? And this is what all I find interesting. I mean, I mean, a lot of uh, modern agriculture relies heavily on fossil fuel subsidised fertilisers, for example, if we remove the fossil fuel subsidies from fertilisers, because, I mean, fertilisers are basically based on oil production. 
there could be hundreds of billions of dollars there that could go into farmers in Africa, but also in Europe, right? Do we reform the subsidies within the common agricultural policy, which seems to, you know, in the past used to create things like milk mountains. Mm. Actually, can you have a milk mountain? No, milk lakes, weren't they? Not milk mountains, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, where, where are we gonna find the cash? There's governments, there's philanthropy, there's reforming subsidies, blah, 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 blah. Um, yes. Susanna. Yeah, I think it is. You have the taxonomy coming now and where the company is going to have to show what they do more openly. Mm -hmm. And you also have the big finance system that's searching mm -hmm. for good project, good mm -hmm. green projects, because with the taxonomy is supposed to support that to become greener. And that the finance market knows about this now. So they search for green, uh, green projects. So if you have a good package and you can show the cases on, on a system level for them, they're going to see the business in it. Right. So I think you have a lot of money there if you just can show the case for them right, right. correctly. Right. And, the, and there we have, have a lot of money. I mean, obviously, it depends where you are. So this yeah. could be more applicable in ends to, to say, a European or North American model. But, but mm. um, Olga, did yeah. you want to say something? Yeah. I always want to say something. Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so We've only like got four <laughs> minutes, but that's OK. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but you take all the money that exists now. They are in this unsustainable system that is short-term thinking and really not sustainable, fair or healthy. Mm -hmm. So through sustainable business models, we can move the money out in the fields in, uh, into the soils. So by creating, like, if you go to a restaurant and they serve a menu that is based on produce that comes from farmer that cares about the soil, voila, you move money into a, good, a better system. But today, the issue is that the uh, food environment that we live in, it's shit. We don't get access to this kind of good food because the whole structure in our society is not allowing that. Yeah. So when you go to a, a supermarket, super bad market, uh, then you will not find promotions on uh, produce that comes from healthy soils. You will find promotions on three liter Coca-Cola or something. Yeah, yeah. We are. So by shifting the food yeah. environment and make it easy for people to eat right food, because today is also a question of the class and education, who can afford this and who can yeah. find this. And that's also wrong. How, how it begs an interesting question on the consumer pressure here as well. I'll come back finally to our two gentlemen on Zoom. But so if you, can, if you could demonstrate to consumers uh, in particularly the richer countries, that, that things like regenerative agriculture, where the soil is taken care of, that the minerals and the nutrients come coming from that get into the food, therefore you're going to be a healthier person. Couldn't that create also a kind of consumer demand for more sustainable based products? Oh, I, Olga, you can have the final word in a second. Chris and, and Gus, um, we're, we're winding up very fast here, but consumer pressure? Could that, could that work for the regenerative side from the health side? Um, well, I, I think consumer pressure does um, a, a lot. I, I don't know whether developed country consumer pressure is, is going to um, do a lot for scaling up uh, regenerative ag in developing countries. Okay. Um, as Gus said earlier, I, I think the, the small scale farmers and pastoralists need to lead, lead a lot of that work and they need to recognise the incentives for the, the, the direct benefits that they receive from adopting these more productive, more sustainable practices. But I think consumers can certainly put a lot of pressure in other ways um, to support uh, in investments and, and to support the, the support of their governments um, you know, as part of these multilateral systems. Right. Gus? Yeah, I think I'm personally not a very strong believer of a big structural change being led by consumer demand, but still very much influenced also by corporates and, and, and rightfully so, right? You don't have the time to get in, read into every topic that there is in the world to worry about. But what I do see is that consumers are the reason that a lot of these big companies are now thinking about changing because there is a change in consumer demand. There is a changing political climate. I think the key thing that we need to recognize is that these companies that also need to make the change, so the Nestle's and the Unilever's, they all they are not agriculture experts. They buy their products from processors. So what they need, or for them, it's very risky and very scary to invest in agriculture because what do I invest in and who and where is my farmer? And that's all big, scary topic that they like to stay away from. So how do we make sure that the investment that is or the, the financial sector that is looking for these investment products 
that it's one thing to collaborate with the corporate world, but both of them are all a little bit scary to invest in smallholders in rural Africa. I think there, the international community, but also national governments can play a very important role in providing a de-risking uh, part of the finance. So meaning yeah. they can de-risk the investment of the corporate and the financial world into what is perceived as scary, so that we can start testing and that we can start failing. But at some point we will succeed and we will find out this is how we bring access to finance to the farmers that we want to make the transition to a better food system. So ultimately, I think their governments have a very important role to play. And ultimately, if you take it back, uh, it's not consumers, but it's we as citizens that have a very important role to play into influencing also our governments. Good point. Yeah, good point. I, I'd, I'd love to talk. have a whole show on de-risking, actually, in the developing world, not just in food and agriculture, but on everything. That's such a, a hot topic, which uh, flies past most people. Olga, you have the last yeah. say oh, here. Happy to join. Yeah. <laughs> you have the last say, Olga. Okay, but I think, like, in a good food system, there we look on the attrition instead of just calories. Because, like, today, when you go to McDonald's and buy your food, it's actually very expensive if you would look on the nutrition you buy. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Swap to that, nutrition instead of calories. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what an absolutely massive subject, which is almost impossible to pay justice to. But I, I thought it was quite a lively discussion. And, and thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll be coming back to this topic with four more guests later with their perspectives on what we need to do about food systems and our culture. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you for coming in on the magic of Zoom, uh, Gus and Chris. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Good. So now we're moving away from uh, agriculture and food production, but we will be coming back. And now we're going to go to uh, circularity and complex production. The manufacturing sector needs to reduce their emissions faster to be in line with the landmark Paris Agreement of 2015. And for this, we need to rethink our production processes. In this section, we've got representatives from Tacton, Volvo Cars, and a company called Xylem. And they're here to discuss how circularity can reduce emissions and the use of extracted resources in complex manufacturing processes involving many parts and many different materials. How do we make these processes circular with low emissions? Right, uh, let's introduce now. Uh, do we have a little video first? Maybe not. Let's then go to introducing our guests. If we could just roll the teleprompter, that would be absolutely fantastic. First, it's my pleasure to welcome Bo Gildenwang. Bo, are you with us? Yeah. Uh, come, come the back way up. Otherwise, you're going to have to jump and show us that you were actually a member of the Stockholm Olympics in 1912, which was How a long, long time ago. <laughs> come and join us here. Uh, we've also got on stage Owen Griffiths, who's head of the circular economy of Volvo Cars. And joining us again on the magic of Zoom, we've got Stephanie Smith, uh, Director of Global Product Sustainability at Xylem. Uh, yes, she's coming over there. Fantastic. So we just moved from food and agriculture, as you may have seen, and now we're going to circular economy, complex manufacturing systems. So let's uh, dive in here. Um, Bo, let's start with you first. Uh, what is Tacton and what does it do? Yeah. Volvo cars, I think a lot of people know, but Tacton, maybe not yet. So uh, give us a heads up on that. Yeah. So um, Tacton is uh, actually a Swedish-based uh, software company. Uh -huh. And we, uh, we've been here around about 25 years. And what we offer the market and our customers is we work with 
manufacturers who, who build very complex products. And we help them with their configurator to put those products together so they can actually sell it to the, to the customers, to okay. their end users. Okay, so it's using software to bring together many physical parts, is that correct? Uh, yeah. that, that, that the company would have. With a car, you need wheels, you need a steering wheel, you need an engine, you need a boot. Uh, you You're need talking a... millions of pieces that yeah. has to go together into one configuration, into one product. All right, so um, coming back to you then, Bo, as mentioned earlier, manufacturing, absolutely core in a modern society, um, but also contributes 20% of the global carbon emissions. So from your perspective, what can be done through what you do to solve this issue of, of uh, the climate change emissions associated mm. with manufacturing? And you have something called CPQ. Yeah. It sounds a bit like one of those robots in uh, one of those science fiction films, doesn't it? Yeah. What was that now? Star Wars, was it? No, it was another one. Um, but this actually stands for configure, price, quote. Yeah, you're right. Um, so how does this all work to actually increase the circularity, cut the emissions, and deliver yeah. a better world? So going back to what you said, that yeah. how to configure a product to price it and bring a quote to a customer. Mm -hmm. A car is actually a fair simple product because it only contains around 30,000 pieces. Just imagine if you have to sell a factory or if you have to sell a very long assembly line or a very complicated truck as well. Then we are talking millions of components has to go together. You have to put it together and, and build a configuration, a sales configuration. Then you have to price it and send a quote to a customer. Therefore, CPQ, configure price quote. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. And for many, many years, the key differentiator has very much been about price and TCO. It means that a customer can come to one of our clients and say, I buy this truck, I want to buy this factory, give me the lowest price, or give me the best price, tell me when you can deliver, what is the TCO over 15 years? And that has been fairly simple, but it's still a complicated process. Right, right. I think this is going to change significantly, because one thing is price in the future, but another thing is emissions. Mm -hmm. So there will be end customers. So our customers' customers will ask, Comment like yours, one thing is the price, one thing is the TCO, but tell me about the impact on the environment. Right. And if they can't tell that, end users, their customers will not buy from them. Right. I think that's going to be the, 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 the next paradigm when, when you're selling and building very complex products. It goes for many products already today, they want that visibility. But when it becomes really pro uh, complex, millions of pieces has to go together, a lot of different data, a long supply chain, to get that visibility, that transparency into the product is going to be essential because mm -hmm. end users will demand that in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And that's a small little company like ours, we're only 300 people, headquartered here out of Stockholm. Mm -hmm. But we work with the absolute largest manufacturers globally, mm -hmm. like Volvo, like Xylem, for example. Mm -hmm. We can make a huge difference. We are rated as the best in the world in what we do. And so we can actually make a difference here. And that's why I think it's our obligation as well to invest in our platform to give that functionality to these manufacturers so they can start to be transparent to, uh, towards their customers. Mm -hmm. it, is, it, is it part of your work on the traceability then? Uh, like uh, if, if Volvo cars, for example, I don't know, buy a component from say Indonesia or China or something like that, that you can trace that as well? Is that part of the story or is that somebody else's job? Well, how do we, how do we unpack what The biggest challenge what? right now to get to where we want to get to is the data. Yeah. What is the emission data on that specific component, the life cycle assessment yeah. of that product that goes into a bigger configuration? Mm -hmm. To get that data built into the configuration, that's the data we need to provide. That's what, that's what we, uh, we need to get into the configuration. Right. That's the biggest challenge right now. Okay, good, good, good. Because remember, we've got an intelligent audience here in front of us and millions of intelligent people out there, but they don't know all the intricacies of the, as this, uh, uh, as you experts do. So it's up to me to try and tease out a little bit what you say so that we're all happy in the room that we are seeing genuine advancements in terms of sustainability going forward. Uh, Owen, uh, Volvo Cars. So you've sub uh, you committed to be a circular company. Uh, 
tell us a bit about how your company is putting this into practice and how it affects your business model and revenue. So, in fact, I suppose the, 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 the implication of this is, is it actually good for your business model and revenue to actually be a circular uh, car company? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, firstly, thanks very much for having me here on stage and uh, representing Volvo Car Sustainability Team. Uh, yes. Circular business is is broad in its scope, and we've got to think about it in, in, in what it means. It's, a, it's an operating model. It's a way we engage with the market. It's a way that we engage with the supply chain and think about the, the, the customers and the life of the products in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have these two targets for 2025, one of which is uh, to generate a billion sec in savings or new revenue generation from right. circular Circular Sec business. being sw Swedish krona. Swedish krona. It's okay, about 100 right. million euros. Okay. Yeah. And, and competitive, competitors of ours are doing a similar sort of thing. And within that, yeah, we have to identify ways that we can save money. And, and people earlier on the stage were talking about the business case for transitioning to sustainability. And I think what circular economy offers is an opportunity to find ways that we can um, encourage better choices. Uh, when we decide on materials, when we decide on the ways that we put products together and the size of products and the way that we then engage with those products over the life of the vehicle um, and then the way in which we get engaged with the end of life of vehicles, all of which uh, are currently being dealt with. So people are still selling stuff to car manufacturers. People are still dealing with vehicles at the end of life and customers are still going to the garages to get their cars sorted out. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that we can see that by putting a, a, a lens on that and asking for um, improvements in recycled content, uh, maintenance and, and upkeep of products and the way that products are dealt with at the end of life, mm. we believe that you can not only have uh, in sustainability and circular benefits, mm -hmm. which benefit climate, biodiversity, water consumption and pollution, mm -hmm. um, as well as transparency in, uh, in the supply chain. But then the, the, the business aspect comes alongside because you're starting to be able to say, um, can we provide new solutions to customers or improved solution which retain value? Mm -hmm. uh, a very good example here would be that the traditional method of dealing with end-of-life vehicles has been uh, let's avoid those being shredded and sent to low-quality solutions. And, and we've got good infrastructure to encourage that. Mm -hmm. The next generation, the circular generation, and I think the ELV directive will support this, is to look at be the best ways in which the material that's coming to the end of life can be recirculated at a value mm -hmm. that is higher than it would be traditionally dealt with. It's traditionally downcycled into construction solutions. This is not Volvo Cars business as usual. This is Volvo Cars circular business. And we need to start taking a new look at the whole value chain mm -hmm. and, and the way in which we can engage in that. And if there's not an opportunity for us, and this is just going to be a cost for us, it, it's hard to get momentum. And so the way that we can see that we can do this is find out the, the parts of the value chain where we can take a positive step, improve the value retention and the functioning of the value chain as a whole. And then those additional benefits, some economic benefits will be shared by us and other parties in the market. Mm -hmm. And the knock-on consequences, the environmental implications will be improved. Mm. And just to ask you a question, I mean, I think for the audience out there, they think, well, okay, this all sounds great, but but how how are you, in a sense, made accountable for these things that you might do? Is it under directives in the European Union? You mentioned the end of life vehicles, for example, that's a directive in the EU. Yep. Is it your science-based target that you have, uh, which is you know monitored by the Science-Based Target Initiative and others? Yeah. Uh, Exponential Roadmap, for example, uh, one of our great partners. There, there, are, there are layers of of monitoring what you what you talk about and therefore what you achieve. Yes. Yeah. So it's not just like you say, oh, insane, we're going to do this, <laughs> and then in ten years you don't do it, and then it's like, it doesn't matter really. Um, no, 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 no. Absolutely. So, so yeah, you have the ELV directive, which is probably going to evolve into the circular cars yeah. regulation or directive. And that is yeah. now going to cover what we do at the front of the vehicles and yeah. what we put into them and what happens at the end of life and the through life. We have CSRD, which is, is tracking the way in which organizations um, uh, do ha have inflows and outflows of raw material. Yeah. We have the EU taxonomy, CDP, right. yeah. um, S&G. Carbon disclosure blah, project, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. These come 
yeah. there, are, there are enough of those. I think actually the real, the real challenge is for an organization like Volvo Cars to put its, to put its statement out there and say yeah. that we're going to achieve these targets by 2025. Yeah. And then this is what we're going to do for 2030 right. and then we're going to do for 2040 because we're, we're, we're on the market, which yeah. means that our shareholders uh, react when we are on or off track towards yeah. our targets. And, and Bo, what Bo's doing is helping you with this as well, right? So in fact, you're a component in this broader landscape yeah. of EU directives and other things, helping companies achieve what they say they're going to do. So all the regulations yeah. just even just makes it even more complicated yeah, yeah, yeah. product because you've got different regulations in different regions. Yeah. You've got different subsidiaries that you can actually go for in different regions as well, yeah. which you have to put together just to build the product yeah. itself. Yeah. So so that's why this becomes more more complicated and much right. more complex. Right. Is that all a bit clearer now? Do we all understand a bit more? Audience, yeah. hello, are you alive? <laughs> we talked about the end of life directive. I hope we haven't got moved that fast. <coughs> um, Stephanie, uh, okay, we're all chatting here in the studio, but we know you're there. I also want to say, I've just learned something. I couldn't understand why so many of our guests from around the world had Stockholm-based backgrounds. It was really confusing. <laughs> and I realise now it's because it's Stockholm Climate Week. So everybody's got a Stockholm background. Fantastic. Stephanie, yeah. water scarcity. A big problem in many regions, right? And water is also part of the story because it's also part of manufacturing in many, many places. Uh, 2025, estimated 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. Um, you have in other presentations highlighted the close connection between this problem, water contamination as well. Look, tell us about what is Xylem, what is your technology, how does it relate to water, solving the water scarcity problem, and how does it affect the manufacturing story as well, if you could do that. Yeah, sure. thanks, Stephanie. Happy to do that. And where, thanks, you coming, where are you much. coming in from, Stephanie? Where are you coming in from? Uh, I couldn't I couldn't be farther from Stockholm. I'm actually in Springfield, Missouri, in oh my, my home God. office. Okay. Um, yes, right. Couldn't <laughs> be farther. So in many ways, actually. Uh, so Xylem is a, a very large global player. Uh, we have over 350 locations. We're in 50 different countries. And, and sometimes I like to tell people that you know, every drop of water you use from your tap or in your in your toilet probably touched a xylem product on its way to you or its way away from you. So our technologies really span the whole global water cycle, uh, whether it's environmental monitoring, uh, the work, the the pumps, the blowers, the mixers that are in your wastewater treatment plant, your drinking water plant. Um, and then layered on top of that, the, the digital technologies, the, the smart integration of all of those technologies. So we're, we're really embedded in water infrastructure. And I think an interesting difference between us and what you're hearing from Volvo is that, you know, we're not selling to that mass market and consumers. We're selling to your infrastructure and your cities. And, mm -hmm. and yes, we have some direct to consumer products, but really we're we're embedded in that inf that water infrastructure around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so so when we look at this issue of circularity, uh, we really are trying to understand our emissions and our targets. But because our customer base, our customer base demands of us that we be as transparent as possible about information related to our climate impact, um, our carbon emissions and so forth. So, so we're kind of, we are a supplier um, and then we have tens of thousands of suppliers. And so we're in this, we're kind of sandwiched between these two realities. And that means tools like what Bo is talking about. We need tools like that to provide transparency to our customer base. But then we're also trying to get that kind of transparency from our suppliers. Mm -hmm. So, and this is really important because, you know, we feel like our customer base, you know, these are the people on the front lines of water scarcity, you know, the biggest issues on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so we want to provide them with this information they need. And, and we feel like we play a really critical role uh, in meeting the Paris 
targets. Yep. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, Actually, no, I, I might have talked so much I, I forgot it. <laughs> I think what's interesting and what's revealing is is that I think for a lot of us kind of ordinary people that don't really think about this every day, we imagine companies as being kind of slightly standalone things with 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 some relationships here and there. And then suddenly what's happening is it's this, these kind of relationships are becoming deeper and more important uh, over time as the world tries to tackle these big issues like climate change, like water scarcity, so meeting the sustainable development goals, basically, um, yes. uh, and, and all these other things. So what your suppliers do, who are standalone companies in their own right, with their own... Uh, a partners in some other chain somewhere, everybody's in a, some kind of chain in which everybody's got to do something or else the whole pyramid falls down. So it's no, we're yeah. in, we're, we're, they're kind of ecosystems that have developed almost invisible to the normal uh, human being that are so absolutely crucial to all the things we love, like fighting climate change, making sure there's sustainable water everywhere, uh, we get rid of plastics or whatever it is. Uh, to create a better world. And I think this is why this kind of conversation here, for certainly our audience, I think revealing this, that you're, you're not all alone, are you? I mean, you're actually in this massive global ecosystem that could either succeed or fail, depending on what everybody does in it. So yep. it's, it's, an accountability, it's an accountability mechanism of sorts yeah. as well. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think another interesting thing about that, I, I listened to the last session and they were talking about how we're used to operating in silos, but we know these solutions are very systemic and they have to be interconnected. They were talking about that in the, the context of, of food and agriculture. It's the same here. In fact, we are very much connected to food and agriculture as well in the water yeah. sector. And yeah. so I, one of the things I like about, you know, initiatives like SBTI and these others is perhaps even inadvertently, it is interconnecting us in all of this. Mm -hmm. So so for a company like Xylem, and this may differ, actually it may be quite similar for Volvo, I'd be interested to hear, our, what keeps me awake at night is that the 95% of our carbon footprint is in the use phase of our products, mm -hmm. scope three, category mm -hmm. 11. At yeah. some sense, you think that's out of my control, but... I mean, a pump has to use energy, right? But it really forces us now, what we're thinking about is, okay, how are people using our products? How can we influence them mm -hmm. to use the product better? How can we use digital technologies to say, don't run that, run that pump 24 uh, seven, only run it when you need it. Use a variable frequency drive, use our digital platform. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, you know, Companies like Volvo, you know, clearly their emissions are coming through the use of their yeah, yeah. products too. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'd be interested to know how they're thinking about that. So let me just quickly in, in go back ecosystem. to... Let me go back to Bo because he was nodding uh, towards me. Bo, you wanted to come in here. Uh, yeah. yeah, because around the, the circularity, yeah. one thing is right now that demand is coming from end users, from customers, customers. Mm -hmm. Another thing is regulations. So that is driving behavior. But uh, sooner or later there will also be some accountability. There's some responsibility that needs to be taken. And I think some years ahead, someone, a large manufacturer, will have to take ownership of the emission impact of the life cycle of the product they are selling. Mm -hmm. And for you to take that responsibility, you want to own the life cycle. Mm -hmm. So I think customers are going to buy a service much more. You see it already now in many businesses, right? But, but, but for them to take responsibility for a 15 or 20 years life cycle of a product, they want to own that product for, throughout the whole life cycle. So customers are going to buy products as a service for, 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 the, for the end customers to get a guarantee mm -hmm. that the circularity is actually guaranteed by the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to happen as well. Mm -hmm. But that, that is happening to some degree today. We, yeah. we account for the, the products we put on the market. We are mindful of the, the use phase uh, and, and consider the way in which they'll, uh, where they'll be used and how they'll be used. And, and we have to take account for that. That's our mm -hmm. carbon footprint. But I think you're absolutely right. It's the, it's the parts of that that are not visible today. What happens when a product comes to the end of its life? Is it coming prematurely obs obsolete? Or, and then once it is obsolete, what is done with it effectively? Yeah. Um, 
And, and the other thing I just wanted to say, that the, the lady that spoke a little bit earlier very passionately about this topic as well, talked about the fact that this is a systemic issue and, and we've heard it again. Mm -hmm. the, the reason that we have to have all of this reporting and all of these levels of scrutiny is because the cost of externalities aren't included in the cost, the decision making. Yep. So it's still cheaper to buy a highly polluting mm -hmm. material or product mm -hmm. instead of a, a more sustainable product because the cost of externalities are not there. And yep. we've taken a big step with carbon pricing, but only at the point at which you have pricing on other in externalities, it, uh, are things going to balance out at all. Yep. So it'll be inherent in the economic systems, yep. which is which is which is quite a, a complex narrative to get across, but it, that's the foundation of why this um, yeah. should, be, uh, should be considered. Absolutely. I mean, externalities uh, have always been a major headache, right? Because they're always invisible, whether it be co mining in China, where many people were, were often killed. Uh, those are never part of the calculations or the water use of coal-fired power stations was often never calculated by anybody and they would be sucking water out of uh, agricultural production systems and things like that. Now with circularity we have the chance, don't we, to start factoring in those externalities. We're not there yet but I see you know, there is a circular, is it a circular directive or draft directive in the European Union I think on circularity? Yeah, yeah. circular economy action plan, the Green New Deal. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they're very busy in Brussels right now, aren't they? They're, putting, they're pumping out more directives than I've ever heard of. Uh, I don't know if they have externalities or not. But um, So, it's good that they're doing this, but trying to fit all the bits of the jigsaw puzzle in is with the complexity. I don't know what it's like in the US, uh, Stephanie, we'll come to that in a minute on the circularity thing, but it's clearly a topic that once was you know, talked about, and then it disappeared off the page, then it came back, then it went down again, but now it seems to be firmly on the agenda, that that's, even the, the bureaucrats have really worked out, this is absolutely critical to get to where we need to get to. Um, are there missing policies still that, that you are aware of, things that you f think could go faster, or... Um, well, one I'll, I'll ask the two people in the studio here, Stephanie, and I'll come to you in a second. I think there are, to be honest, because yep. there's there's been released new regulations more or less every week, every month. Yep. So imagine they have everything covered and completed today. Was I don't think that's realistic. Right. But but if you just look at what's happened over the last one or two years, it's 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 huge steps that yeah. have happened. Yeah. And 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 it's just going faster now. So. Yeah. But I think there will be more coming. Yeah. Yeah. After. I think one practical one which uh, which is important to raise here is about uh, mobility solutions, sharing mo shared mobility. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, it's not um, in the, the the tax systems for uh, vehicles that are in urban environments that are shared by multiple people mm -hmm. are not incentivized. They're actually taxed like taxis, which means that they are much higher than the self-owned vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if we actually want to increase shared mobility in urban or suburban environments, mm -hmm. we need to encourage that, not penalise it, because it displaces vehicles. A dis displaced vehicle is the best type of vehicle, isn't it, really? Okay, yep. I'm saying that as an automotive manufacturer, but yep. we can provide it through things like Volvo On Demand, yep. where we can actually provide urban mobility but that, that also needs to be supportive. We need to have that. So the frame. devil is always in the detail, isn't it? Always in the detail. Yeah, so there are some, some, some big grand schemes out there right now to really accelerate this, and it's kind of slightly watch this space because we all, there's so much coming out. We need to know what the devil of detail mm. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephanie, I'll come back to you in the US in uh, Springfield, Missouri. Yeah, I, it's, you know, back to your original question about uh, policy, I, you know, for Xylem, for a manufacturer like us, we're, I would say, rather fortunate that we do a lot of business in Europe because that is helping pull us in that direction uh -huh. uh, towards the green economy. We don't, I would say, uh, have the, the right policies or even uh, cultural motivation, maybe I'll put it that way, uh, in the U.S., uh, so, which is sad because we're one of the biggest consumer markets on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so it, it's my personal opinion. Maybe I, I can't speak for the behalf of Xylem entirely on this, but it's my opinion. We're a little behind on that, maybe a lot behind on that in the U.S. And so what's good for us is that a lot of our customer base are the people 
who are on the front lines of the climate change impacts on water. I apologize, you may hear my mowers with their big gas guzzling motors outside my window right now. But um, so we're finding that the pull is really not coming from the policy side of things. It's coming from the customer base that we serve who are on the front lines of seeing these issues. You know, the people in California who are, you know, and all along the Colorado River who are desperately trying to figure out how to manage water Mm -hmm. in the, the drying and burning climate out there. And so the policy is behind the need, but we're seeing the market pull us in that direction anyway. Good point, Stephanie. We're, we're running out of time now, but I think it is a good point. You need leaders in the world uh, to actually, or leading groups of countries or countries to do things that pull the market in the right direction, and then everybody can follow it. It used to be California, of course, with uh, with some of the car regulations, with uh, emissions that were very, very strong, and then the other car companies had to come along. So this is good. Um, in the end, what we're really looking at, the work that you do, Bo, Volvo Cars, what Zion's doing, and this whole circular thing is about ending waste in the end, isn't it? And that and nothing is, is a lost resource. Everything can be brought back into the economy mm. like nature. And if we can mimic nature, then we have a chance of actually creating a truly sustainable future. Yeah. That's a nice, simple way of doing it. Yeah, I thought uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think what we, we see is the overarching principle here is we need to decouple yeah. the, the use of highly impactful raw materials mm -hmm. from the well-being and the productivity that people need for a, a functioning society. Mobility yeah. without the need to keep demanding high impactful raw materials. Yes. Well, it's a shame we've only got 30 minutes because this is actually a massive topic again uh, and we dive and dive deeper. We, we've looked, looked a little bit at circularity here through the lens of the wonderful work that Tecton's doing and relationships with Volvo Cars and Xylem, two emblematic companies. Uh, obviously, uh, we'd need the whole day if we were going to really, really delve into this any further. But I think it gives a glimpse into some of the shifts that are happening in terms of manufacturing, in terms of society's... Um, you know, urgency and, and, and also the policy switches that are coming to try and create this, what has been in the past, a, a beautiful, bright butterfly, the circular economy. But maybe we can just lean out and start maybe touching it and catching it, and that would be uh, good for everybody. So thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thanks a lot. And uh, we shall move on. Um, there we go. Very popular. Thank you. Um, now then, we're going to have a coffee break, which is always a bit of a thrill. Uh, and during that, we're going to have another video. Is that correct? And uh, somebody was going to give me some information about that video. Ah, the video's name's on the PowerPoint. OK. It's called Subtitled in 20 Languages and narrated by Richard Gere, Climate Emergency Feedback Loops. Is that it, tech team? Which PowerPoint? Uh, sorry, I'm being given instructions. There is a PowerPoint here. Ah, uh, no, we're going to see three interviews. Aha, we had a problem with the video before. We're going to get three interviews from the informal meeting of the EU environment ministers from earlier today, not far from our studios. We're going to hear from the Swedish uh, Minister for Climate, uh, the European Commissioner for the Environment, and Patrick Ten Brink, who's the Secretary General of the European Environmental Bureau. OK, guys, thanks a lot. Roll, roll the videos. Thank you. Good morning. 
Today we are starting our informal meeting with the environment and climate ministers who have gathered here to discuss how we can make best use of the possibilities ahead with competitiveness and a sustainable development together. Ministers who have gathered here to discuss how we can make best use of the possibilities ahead with competitiveness and a sustainable development together. And uh, this is what will be the main focus for our meeting, how to make best use in the times that we are in right now with a difficult economic situation, with the pandemics and war uh, affecting our economy, and making best use of the development that needs to be made regarding uh, the sustainability and environmental degradation within, within each other. Uh, so we have uh, invited all of the ministers and invited them to bring a business leader each that has uh, made a big success in actually transitioning their, their, uh, the work that they do, their production. And uh, with this, we will uh, focus the meeting on discussing what roadblocks and incentives they have made best use of uh, in the work that they've done to uh, contribute to a uh, green development of, uh, of our societies. So with this as an aim, we will have uh, the discussions during our informal meeting and we will have different breakout sessions where we will also discuss different aspects of the sustainable development, such as circular economy, biodiversity and uh, increasing competitiveness in different uh, aspects of our industry. So this will be our focus. We're very much looking forward to this informal meeting and we can now open up for questions. Who wants to start? I'd like to start. Uh, yes. My main hope is that we actually have more dialogue than we often have. Uh, this one-way communication can be necessary in some forms, but sometimes we also need to have the dialogue and exchange of views and actually discuss how we can create better incentives and what actual roadblocks uh, politics sometimes might create that stand in the way of a positive development. So I'm hoping that we can have quite fruitful discussions where we have a lot of exchange of ideas, where different countries can show what has been a success in their development and what has been uh, difficult uh, challenges that they have faced and to actually make sure that we share all of the experience and knowledge that different member states have uh, and can make better use of. So my uh, hope is that we will have more of an exchange than we usually have during these meetings. Thank you. Jag tycker det låter som en god idé att bygga ut vattenkraften. Vi är ju i stort behov av all fossilfri energiproduktion och jag är säker på att vattenfall gör en god bedömning av var potentialen finns. Finns det en möjlighet att bygga ut vattenkraften i den utsträckningen som man nu planerar så är det väldigt positivt. Det är precis som de säger att vi har ett ökat behov av mer fossilfri energiproduktion och den här regeringen ställer sig positiv till allt som är fossilfritt och kan bidra till en mer robust energisystem än vad vi har haft hittills. Regeringens energiminister är nog mer insatt i de specifika diskussionerna kring, kring hur vi ska hantera utbyggnaden av systemet. Mitt ansvar ligger ju mer på lagstiftningen och regleringen av vår energi. Men det, det råder ingen tvekan om att hela den här regeringen har kommit överens i, i tidavtalet också tillsammans med vårt samarbetsparti om att vi ska bygga ut all fossilfri energiproduktion. Och det är ju i linje med den här utvecklingen som Vattenfall nu tar sig så att det är väldigt positivt att de gör så. Men samtidigt miljöprövningen som står här, vad är utmaningarna i den? Mm. Jag hörde Vattenfalls chef mm. se för hård att det kan bli. Mm. 
Jo, men det är ju så. Och tillståndsprocesser är en, en stor roadblock för Sveriges egen del att, att se över. Eh, och där har vi ju gällande vattenkraften så har vi ju pausat napparna som de kallas över ett år. Och den, det året vill ju vi nyttja till och se över hur vi kan utföra dem på ett bättre sätt än vad vi har gjort hittills. För det är precis som Vattenfall men också många andra vattenkraftsägare påpekar att det är väldigt, väldigt krångligt för dem att, att hantera den prövningen. Och så behöver det inte vara. Samtidigt är Sverige väldigt, och den här regeringen är också väldigt stolt över eh, den starka miljölagstiftning vi har. Och vi ser behovet av att uppdatera eh, vattenkraftens miljötillstånd. Eh, så att det är en pausning ett år och inget annat som gäller. Och vi ser fram emot att nyttja den tiden som behövdes på grund av energikrisen eh, till att se över hur de kan fungera på ett bättre sätt också framöver. Bättre än vad de gjort hittills. Well, that's always a difficult uh, uh, matter to handle because uh, we have a responsibility as a government to whole of society and sometimes when you're in a situation with the economic development that's going in a certain direction, you have to be considerate of, of that. But of course, we're aiming to, for example, with this meeting today, discuss how we actually can make best use of the difficult situations that we are facing in society, such as, for example, an energy crisis where you can see that the, the war and the development has, has uh, uh, made the energy uh, policies of Europe change and in that time, in that crisis, make best use of that change and make sure that we switch towards more green alternatives when it comes to our energy system. So that is a good example of how we can actually make use of the difficult situations that we're facing to increase and, and um, speed up our transition. And I think that we need to make more examples such as that. Uh, but the difficult times we are facing can of course be uh, um, somewhat of a challenge as a politician who's uh, aiming to better our climate and environment because sometimes uh, you tend to prioritize climate crisis lower than an economical crisis uh, instead of making best use of the situation you're in and trying to develop our society in a more sustainable and economically strong uh, development. So that's what we're actually aiming to do today, to discuss how we in different ways can increase our competitiveness and make uh, our businesses thrive in a future economy that will be more and more fossil free and more and more sustainable. There are quite a few appeals from uh, larger Uh, that wants you to step your, up your efforts on climate issues, mm. uh, climate matters. Mm. Isn't that support enough to feel that you have what you need to move forward with the measures? Mm. Yes, it is. And I do feel that I have a strong support. I think it's very important to see uh, when you look at Swedish climate policies in the context that we're in. Sweden is uh, at the forefront of the climate transition and we have had quite a big development on uh, lowering our emissions, which makes the, the state that we're in uh, a bit different than other states. So uh, what I tend to look at is how we can make our climate policies more efficient, as I sometimes see that we put in billions of kroner in uh, different um, political measures that don't result in lowering emissions in, the, in a proportionate way. And that is something that I, as a responsible uh, liberal politician, is very keen on, on taking care of. So uh, we do have an environmental budget that is the next largest that we've had in modern time. It's bigger than the one for 2021, 2020, 2019. And so it's not that we're lowering our ambitions, it's doing it in a more efficient way. And this can sometimes, you know, be a bit uncomfortable for, for uh, a lot of people who are quite used to the uh, earlier governments who, who uh, are not uh, the same as, as this one. Uh, so we're aiming to have a more ambitious, but also more efficient climate policy. And of course, that can be a bit uncomfortable, but there's uh, no need for concern on the matter of how ambitious we are and how keen we are on, on accomplishing our climate goals. And I think that a lot of Swedes should feel comfortable in that, that Sweden is at the forefront of the tr green transition and that in the Swedish parliament, you have seven out of eight parties who have uh, voted through uh, quite uh, harsh and strong climate policies, which make, of course, my work easier to do. Uh, so I do feel a lot of support, not only by, by people who have voted for this government, but also by, by the parliament, who has uh, uh, quite good guidelines for us as a government to work uh, from. Thanks so much. Hey, sir. That's the <laughs> Finns det någon risk att Skåne och Karls Elvar kommer att byggas ut? 
Jag tror att Vattenfall kommer göra goda bedömningar av var det finns en potential att bygga ut vår vattenkraft. Och jag tror att det är viktigt att vara tydlig också med att det politiska stödet finns. Vi behöver bygga ut all fossilfri energiproduktion i den utsträckningen som vi kan. Och det här är ett gott exempel på det. Jag tycker det är viktigt att vi tar hänsyn till vår naturmiljö och gör goda beslut där vi avväger de olika allmänna intressena som finns i det här. Vi har ett stort intresse av att bygga ut vår fossilfria energiproduktion av, av, för totalförsvaret, för vår säkerhet, för energi men allra främst för klimatet. Eh, där väldigt många industrier vill sluta använda fossilt men då behöver mycket mer el. Eh, samtidigt så ska inte det ske på bekostnad av vår naturmiljö. Så det handlar ju om att göra goda bedömningar där, där olika intressen ibland också kan stå emot varandra. Där litar jag på att Vattenfall och energiministern håller god översikt över hur man på bästa sätt bygger ut vår energiproduktion. Men det allra viktigaste här är ju faktiskt att vi behöver öka takten i hur vi bygger ut vår energiproduktion med havsbaserad vindkraft, med kärnkraft, med solenergi och också med vattenkraften. Så det här är ett väldigt välkommet besked. Nej, men jag tror att det, vi har starka miljölagar i Sverige och de är där av en anledning och det är ingenting som regeringen ämnar att ändra på. Eh, men vi är väldigt måna om att vi bygger ut vår energiproduktion, inte minst för klimatet och för att minska Sveriges utsläpp. Tack så mycket. Det är det som är svaret. Jag kan lova att Sverige kommer fortsatt ta hänsyn till våra starka miljölagar och att vi gör balanserade avvägningar. Naturmiljö kontra utbyggnaden av vår energiproduktion. Hur ser du på EUs roll i den gröna omställningen? Jag ser EUs roll som otroligt viktig. EU är ju en part i det globala klimatarbetet som verkligen driver på för ambition och för en snabb omväxling av våra, vårt samhälle, av vår ekonomi. Och det tycker jag är positivt. Samtidigt så har ju EU också ett ansvar som den roll man spelar i världen där vi har välutvecklade ekonomier och starka demokratier som självklart ger oss godare förutsättningar att ställa om. Så det är också viktigt att ta hänsyn till. Men jag tror att EU kan verkligen också vara starkare i att utnyttja konkurrenskraften och våra företag till att ställa om på ett sätt både med reglering och lagstiftning men också med incitament och med en, en syn som kommer från politiker i att vi vill att våra, våra företag och vår industri är grön. Och vad är den viktigaste frågan du vill lyfta under de här dagarna? Den viktigaste frågan jag vill lyfta under det här informella mötet det är att vi ska lära av varandra och föra god dialog och lyssna och se vad finns de goda exemplen och vad ni haft för olika utmaningar och hur den är klarat av dem. Det finns mycket våra 27 medlemsstater kan, kan lära av varandra och ofta driver vi på för vår egen linje men nu som ordförande från Sveriges sida så vill vi se till att det sker ett utbyte och att vi faktiskt pratar om hur vi kan lära av varandra. Tack så mycket. Mm. That is a very good question. I think there's a lot of uh, alternative examples of, of different barriers. Uh, I think that an important one is, of course, the economical uh, thresholds that can sometimes uh, be created when you're trying to transition your your uh, company. Uh, and that is something that we will discuss here today. Uh, that is also why we've invited, for example, the European Investment Bank and other representatives who are from the financial side to discuss how they see, where they see potential for uh, green investments and, and so on, uh, to actually discuss how we get the financial flows to move towards uh, the fossil-free economy and to a sustainable development. And I think that that is an important focus for us to have in the upcoming months also uh, when we have upcoming uh, global discussions and meetings, how to discuss how we streamline the finances going more towards uh, the development that we'd like to see because the economic threshold uh, can be a big uh, pushback for the companies, for example, that want to make a, a transition but see the, uh, see the costs of it instead of the uh, profit that will be in the future. So in, in a way of transitioning our economy towards a more fossil-free economy, we need to make sure that the economical thresholds are lowered and that we streamline our finances to move in the right direction. Thank you so much. President Thank you. Okay. Good morning um, to everyone. Of course, happy to be to be in Sweden. We have a busy agenda ahead of us. 
uh, I'm just coming back from G7, uh, Japan uh, meeting, where I think uh, was another great chance of reconfirming uh, EU's uh, leadership in green transition. And uh, G7 communique is an excellent communique where we managed to agree on uh, targets on renewables, we managed to agree on the date as regards the, the plastic pollution. So it only reconfirms that when we started in 2019 with the Green Deal, we should continue. And we have a very busy time again um, in front of us to finalize some of the very, uh, very important uh, legislation between now and uh, the next summer. So the uh, time is, is, is really limited. I also want to congratulate Sweden on a great idea of bringing uh, businesses together into this meeting. That's a great format uh, because very often when we take our decisions, we of course consult the stakeholders. And I think this is another opportunity for them to reconfirm uh, their commitments our commitments and, of course, uh, move forward in the implementation of the European Green Deal. What do you think are the main obstacles uh, for not obtaining the Fit for uh, 55 goals? I would say now there is no obstacles, to be very honest. Uh, since we have legislation, it's uh, time to implement. And the biggest part uh, for 2030 will be on energy. I think... Uh, Russia's illegal, unjustified attack on Ukraine reconfirmed that our dependence on fossil fuels, on autocratic regimes is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous to our competitiveness. It can be, at the end of the day, the high price of human lives uh, paid. So, of course, we need to avoid that. And renewables is a great solution. So I really see it as, as an as a opportunity to uh, move forward and implement and we see it with a huge increase of, of uh, sales of PVs, of uh, heat pumps, of projects increase, that we will be able to hit that target by 2030. Okay, thank you. May I ask you, maybe you know that Sweden has a tax on shopping bags, plastic shopping bags, and they are now discussing to remove that tax. Uh, have you, do you have a view on that? I think, uh, first of all, Sweden always claims a champion of sustainability in EU and it should maintain it. And tools that are effective uh, within the society should be upheld. Uh, if it's not a tax, then maybe a, a total ban of, of, of some of the, the, the plastic bags. I think now we are in a very important uh, moment where we are heading towards a global agreement on, uh, uh, on plastics. And you will be in a leading role. So I think we should always lead uh, by personal example. We have countries who already banned it uh, years ago, and uh, they moved on. Uh, the beautiful thing about this is that, you know, new generations, they don't even remember that there was a plastic straw or a plastic bag, so we shouldn't be worried about such things. So if we remove the tax, we, we might have a ban instead. I would say that we need to get rid of uh, these plastics products which we uh, consume in, in a blink and then they are thrown out and uh, they are stay with us forever. That's the biggest problem. Plastic is a great material, but we need to use it uh, sustainably. And those plastic products that have alternatives, they should be uh, changed with those alternatives. And I think, you know, we all have already many uh, multiple uses bags and, and, and um, plastic bag is something that is a, a past. So I think, you know, uh, Plastic, uh, especially single-use plastic um, uh, uh, goods that can be easily replaced, they should be replaced uh, without a hesitation. And uh, plastic bags is a definitely a, a past and we should ensure uh, that uh, they are less and less uh, used and uh, you know, each member state chooses their tools to implement, but I really hope that Sweden will find a tool which not going to have a counter counterproductive uh, um, uh, results. I don't think so. society is asking for more plastic bags. On contrary, they want a clean Swedish forest, a clean uh, shores of the Baltic Sea, and not polluted uh, with, uh, with plastics, which uh, is used for a few minutes and then stays with us for thousands of years. What are the enabling uh, conditions and uh, incentives that could help uh, businesses to improve competitive sustainability? 
So, first of all, of course, we have put forward uh, very important initiatives as Critical Raw Materials Act, uh, as our uh, Zero uh, Emissions uh, Act, which will ensure that uh, businesses that are moving uh, towards uh, uh, net zero emissions has a competitive advantage. I think, you know, legislation that we have taken is already uh, becoming a global one. I'm just returning from Japan, where, for example, on a batteries legislation that we have adopted in EU, we're talking on Japan to have a similar uh, legislation, similar methodology, how the batteries uh, would be assessed. So I think those first movers advantage can tremendously uh, help EU uh, to scale up technologies and then uh, absolutely export them to other parts of the world because we see that, for example, G7 block, which is uh, a very important part of the world's GDP, they are all in 2050 club. 2050, I mean zero uh, uh, full decarbonization by 2050. So, of course, we will need a massive deployment of technologies. EU is on this uh, journey already from 2019. So, I believe our businesses have a solutions to, to, to offer. Okay. Uh, on, um, I've got a question. Yes. Very difficult negotiation on battery restoration and on the third pesticide regulations. Why is it so complicated to negotiate these texts? And are you still confident there will be a common ground between the member states, which is not too much water done compared with the Commission's proposal? So I'll answer on nature restoration legislation. First of all, I believe that when we talk and we go through the details, many of uh, the, let's say, those skiers uh, that are really not based on the text disappear. Text is very much now, uh, or discussion I would say, discussion is very much now polluted by all different legislation which is not even in the text. So for example when I meet with um, representatives of, of agriculture, uh, with ministers responsible for agriculture, they say the, the big issue is land aside. But there is nothing on land aside on nature restoration. The targets are on pollinators um, and, 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 and uh, farmland birds and etc. So I think, uh, you know, we really need to look at the text. There is no threats. On contrary, we really want to combine the economic activities with uh, nature restoration um, efforts. Member states will have enough flexibility to prepare their own plans and of course implement it. We realize uh, very well uh, that uh, by 2030 what we need and what we want is the efforts deployed for a nature restoration. And then of course uh, with the time to reach uh, certain indicators and targets that I would say are very simple. But uh, the first uh, uh, winners of, uh, uh, you know, of nature restoration would be actually uh, farmers, the foresters, uh, fishermen and so on, because these are the economic activities. First uh, uh, winners of, uh, uh, you know, of nature restoration would be actually uh, farmers, the foresters, uh, fishermen and so on, because these are the economic activities that are dependent on nature and you cannot uh, divide them. But there's still very little time to reach an agreement and for the rich proposal was still not yet on the table. There won't be not enough time to adapt it before the end of the discussion. So why so many delays? And we are working against the clock with the, with the reach. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the, the um, LPPs, the, the reach was, was planned for the end of the year. We want to even advance it. So we could still negotiate uh, it this year. Uh, so Commission is doing its work. Uh, Commission is doing its part. I think with, uh, uh, for example, the council, I mentioned it a few times that we might have too few environment councils. Uh, and, you know, agenda is so rich now. We just, you know, finalized uh, Fit for 55. Let's not forget that it's not only environmental, but it's also climate agenda. So we have so many questions now, so we should maybe consider having uh, two days, uh, for example, uh, uh, formal council, where we could, of course, adopt, uh, adopt more decisions, especially now when we heading into uh, this end of mandate timing, where time is pressuring us. I had meeting with all reporters who are already assigned in the parliament, and parliament has 
has an ambition to finalize the uh, the proposal. So I think uh, we should work hard. Uh, I'm ready to do so um, with the co-legislators and, and, and finalize uh, EU's legislative proposals that are crucial, that our society expects us to finalize. Yes. So is there enough people in the Commission to do that? Is there enough time to do that? You're absolutely right. You're, you're absolutely right, especially when we talk uh, about um, uh, circular economy proposals that are that will require a lot of a lot of efforts, not only from DG environment, from other DGs too. Uh, human resources will be under pressure, and I think this is a very important to 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 note in 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 upcoming uh, years, uh, where of course those resources uh, should be uh, best dedicated. Well, I think, you know, if, if, if you look at uh, the society, at the Eurobarometer, um, and you look at, at our proposal, so for example, uh, uh, chemicals pollution. Uh, society is very much worried and they really want us to act uh, when it comes to nature restoration and when we talk about the degradation of biodiversity of the collapsing ecosystems society people Europeans you know living uh, in, in in different areas when they see collapsing ecosystems of course they want us to act uh, sometimes it's even too late uh, we have issues where it's uh, where situation is uh, is extremely dangerous. So I think we do have society's uh, mandate uh, to act. Uh, we need to. Time, time is uh, limited, uh, but uh, I think, you know, when we went into a Green Deal in 2019, we knew what sort of scope is this, what sort of transformational change it is. And, you know, Green Deal is not environmental or, or, or climate questions. It's a horizontal, you know. It uh, involves, first of all, social, where we have to have a just transition, where we have to have everyone on board. It's energy, it's transport and, and so on. So, of course, that's a massive change that we have to undergo. And I think there, that we don't have time to wait. If you look the, at the latest IPCC report, it's uh, very clear. And I think COP28 uh, will be a very difficult one, where we will be falling short uh, of 1.5 degrees if we don't step up our efforts. But as I said, you know, returning from G7 meeting, I clearly see that uh, many uh, other G7 countries, they're following the EU's path. Uh, it's never easy to be the first one. It's always you, you, you put and you, you, uh, you use a lot of energy for discussions, explanation and so on, but that's the democracy. This is how it functions and you know, I'm ready to answer all the questions to, to the colleagues, uh, politicians, ministers, uh, MEPs on the proposals that we have put forward. I think it's a solid proposals. I think this is the proposals which will ensure uh, the benefit of the society and creation of wealth decoupling from the growth of uh, the CO2 emissions. Thank you. Stand here. Uh, I'd like to speak immediately. Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Hi, I'm, I'm Patrick Tembrink. I'm the, uh, the Secretary General of the European Environmental Bureau. We represent 180 NGOs and civil society organizations across Europe, um, representing 30 million people. In the current climate of climate change, climate crisis, uh, the environment, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, pollution problems, we really need to have an accelerated approach to the green transition. And we also need business to do their part in this green transition. One thing of key behind the transition is 
how to innovate, how to motivate and how to catalyze this transition. And one core aspect of that is regulation. And the OECD and academia have over and over again shown that regulation is an incentive for competitiveness, is an incentive for progress. And so a lot of people argue against regulation, but actually the facts are that regulation is something which is a fundamental driver of innovation, a fundamental driver of competitiveness and for our sustainability. So in this context, the European Green Deal 1, the Green Deal that we have, is a major step forward in pushing an enabling framework for the green transition. It is actually encouraging and catalyzing a system change in many areas. If you think about the move beyond fossil fuel vehicles, if you think about um, a circular economy, and you think about the push for 100% renewables over time, those are system changing issues. The rest of the Green Deal is more of an incremental change here. So now, when, as we're in the Swedish presidency, and then we head to the, the Spanish and the Belgian presidency, we need these three presidencies to work together to be able to ensure the Green Deal one delivers. But we also need to go further because that won't be enough. And so we need a Green Deal too that also takes a global perspective and a social contract at the heart of it. But within this context, we need business to be able to uh, embrace that regulation is actually a positive motor for change and to be part of the solution. And we look forward to that today. Well, there's many bottlenecks towards it. I mean, one one key bottleneck is, of course, one key bottleneck is is the whole economic system, which is focusing on very short-term economic benefits um, over the sort of long-term sustainability needs. So that's a sort of an overarching one. And then you have a load of smaller, specific bottlenecks. Just to give one example, if you think about renewable energies, a key thing there is the permitting process. We don't have enough people in the authorities to do a assessments and consultation to make sure we put the renewables in the right place and to get the permits done on time. And if we all invest in Sweden, in other countries, in the capacity to do this, then we can actually move forward very quickly. So I think you have heard about the Swedish policy on the Lulusica and nature restoration. What's your view on this? On the Swedish presidency, well, I think at the moment we're at one level encouraged by the Swedish presidency being a neutral broker, um, because all presidencies should be that, uh, and that is encouraging that they're holding that line. Of course, the Swedish position with respect to nature is complicated by by the whole forestry ownership issue and also um, the roles. We think the nature restoration law is a fundamentally important piece of legislation to push because it actually creates the basis for a viable future for 20, 30, 40 years down the line. So in Swedish, in Sweden, considering its role with respect to the nature restoration law, with the soil health law, with the sustainable food systems law, we need them to say, let's not only think about the 2020s, but think about the 2040s and the 2050s, and then basically negotiate with that in mind so that we have a future uh, viable uh, farming, viable forestry and viable fisheries in 2040 and 2050 based on, on that approach. Yeah, is that okay? Thanks. We grow up, and we play, we invent new ways of doing things, and we collaborate, we prepare for that special date, and we care for each other. We do whatever it takes, but our world is on fire, and our future is at stake. We don't have time to wait, but no country business or individual can fix this on their own. Together, we can set things straight. Let's act. Through the power of many, we can make change happen. Let's encourage sustainable solutions. Let's suggest new ways of doing things and demand bad practices to stop. We all unite behind the one thing that matters to save our world. Will you join us? Do you want to act on the climate crisis but don't know how? With our app, you can send climate reviews to organizations and leaders. Our team reaches out to the organization to encourage dialogue 
Just download We Don't Have Time. Tap the green Create button and choose Type of Review. Give climate love to people doing great stuff. Create a climate idea to suggest a solution. Or send a climate warning to those who hurt the planet. To increase your impact, you can share the review. Because when enough people agree with you, organizations and leaders will change. Many even want your opinion. Because we have to work together. Do you want to be part of the solution? Hi, I'm uh, Ingmar Ensu and I'm the founder of We Don't Have Time. We are a social network platform and a review platform for the climate. And uh, what you could do on our platform is you could give reviews to leaders, corporate leaders, political leaders about what they do, good or bad for the climate. Uh, so if you see something that you don't like, uh, you could give them a climate warning and we will send this climate warning to the leader and have them to answer, have them to change and put, uh, put pressure on that issue. But you could also send climate love. If you see something that someone that are doing something great for the climate and to encourage that and to, to share that to the world so more people will look up to that action and, and do the same. And I think love is actually something that could work very, very well in order to solve the climate crisis. We can't just focus on the problem. We must also focus on the good action, what's actually out there that are working for solutions. And how this works, I could just show you a little bit of examples here. Here is a climate love from a company called Houdini that actually have given a climate love to an NGO called Ecoside Law of Alliance because they want business leaders to be involved to make uh, Ecoside Law so that it will be criminal to, to destroy nature. Uh, and this is something driven by a company on our platform. Uh, so this is the upside down. The company are giving love to the non-profit. Uh, but we have also a lot of private individuals on our platform and this is a climate love uh, from our user Muhammad to an organization called Rubicon because what Rubicon is a company that actually has a solution to the waste problem using artificial intelligence uh, and that is something that needs to be implemented uh, on scale in many many cities. So if you log in to the We Don't Have Time platform uh, you could give climate love wherever you see someone doing something great for the climate. And you could be inspired of so many other people around the world acting and working for change. We will never achieve systematic change without individual change. What's most important in order to achieve the systematic change is that if you do the change, you need to communicate it and inspire to others to act. And that's why I try to do my best to live as climate friendly as possible. So that's why I love my solar panels, for instance. It's not the renewable energy that is the best thing with it. It's actually that everyone sees in my neighborhood that I have those panels and uh, that it's communicating climate action and have them to think about it and have them to do the same. So just two months after I put up my solar panels, my neighbor house did the same and now has many more followed. Uh, so my recommendation for your climate action is to, to do something you, you're good at, something you like. If you're interested in food, focus on that. If you're interested in buildings, focusing on that, etc. etc. I try to do a lot of things, not just solar panels. Uh, for instance, I haven't been traveled by airplane since I found that we don't have time. Uh, so I only travel by on the ground, by train, etc. I don't eat uh, red meat, I sometimes eat meat, but uh, I'm not an absolutist. And I think that is important, uh, that you don't need to be perfect. No one is perfect. And actually, if you are perfect, that will scare people away because they, they will feel that they can't take off your action. So by being imperfect, uh, you will have more followers. Uh, and. Uh, it's impossible to live in a perfect climate friendly lifestyle in the system we have today, but it's absolutely achievable to do the very best you can and have others to follow. And I totally recommend it. 
But it's not just climate action on our platform. We are also planting a tree for all new members signing up to our platform. And if you invite your friends, we will soon have a forest together that we will plant for you. Uh, isn't that awesome? So if you want to do some change in the world, just give five minutes per day. Uh, log in to We Don't Have Time. You will find the app in the App Store and Google Play and on the web. And do some social media activity that will make an impact. Five minutes per day. If you do that, and if you talk to your friends to do the same, we will change the world together. Give climate love and save the world. Did it go wrong? Please tell me who do I blame? Just name them, what do we do in this moment? Take to the streets, they're empty, storm the parliaments, they're shut down, no one in charge but the rodents. But we're not going to let this thing get out of hand, you know. Got a plan, you know, cause we're not going to lose the best things we ever knew just because some bad wind blows. Talk to the trees, they listen, talk to the bees, they know, talk to the rivers, they've been around. Open your mouth and speak out, open your eyes and see. Open your heart, it's a key Cause we're not going to let this thing get out of hand You know, we've got a plan You know, cause we're not going to lose the best things we ever knew Just because some bad wind blows
So, green claims, they are absolutely everywhere. We've got sustainable t-shirts, we've got ocean-friendly jewellery, all kinds of wonderful plastics, climate-positive burgers, lots and lots of green claims out there, which is really, really good news. But how sustainable are these claims and how are these products too? Are they sustainable too? And what about the services we're being promised? And how can customers possibly have any idea or have any chance to verify many of the many, many claims they're seeing, particularly in advertising? Uh, just last month, though, the European Commission advanced a proposal for a directive on green claims to address misleading sustainability claims and greenwashing. Franz Timmerman, the executive vice president of the European Green Deal, put it like this. He said, with this proposal, we give consumers the reassurance that when something is sold as green, it actually is green. So in this session, we're going to dig a bit deeper into this topic. We're going to look closer into two ongoing cases as well in the European Union, even in advance of this new draft legislation from the Commission, uh, which are trying to hold companies uh, legally responsible for some of the claims they're making in advertising and other matters too. So we've got three absolutely wonderful guests. I've got George Harding Rolls. He's a campaign manager with the Changing Markets Foundation in, in the UK uh, that works in the UK, but also obviously abroad as well, George, because you're here in <laughs> Stockholm. <laughs> Please take a, a seat on the sofa. Uh, we've also got Lucas Boudet. Uh, he's Director General of the European Advertising Standards Alliance. And uh, yes, there is George, fantastic. And we've got Johnny White. He's a lawyer with uh, Client Earth. You might want to briefly say what Client Earth is in a second, Johnny, so that people understand. But it's a great organization, it's Client Earth, using lawyers to deal with some of these more challenging aspects of our society in respect to climate change. Um, OK, well, now, George. Uh, sorry, Lucas, uh, lovely to see you uh, coming in from, is it Paris or is it Brussels? Can we, give, uh, can we give Lucas some volume or maybe Lucas has to go off mute? I'm not too sure. Hello, Czech, you hear me all? Is it Fan working fine? Ma magnifique. Was that Brilliant. good French, everybody? No. Okay. It's working very well. Very well. Awesome. Good. So, um, Lucas, um, tell us briefly, what is the European Advertising uh, Standards Alliance? Uh, and then let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the European Commission's new draft legislation. So tell us uh, what, what your organisations. Absolutely. So I represent EASA, the European Advertising Standards Alliance, and we advocate for self relation as a means to ensure responsible advertising. So we have behind us the whole of the industry value chain of advertising, advertisers, agencies, media that benefit from consumer trust and advertising. And on the other hand, because they don't mark their own homework, we are the umbrella organization of what we call self-regulatory organizations. There are 27 of them in Europe and they enforce advertising standards, okay. ethical rules on advertising. All right. So uh, just give us your perspective then uh, on this, this draft legislation from the Commission, what they call anti-greenwashing uh, legislation. Um, do you as a, an alliance, in a sense, broadly welcome the aims of this proposed legislation? And, and why might you think it's important to, to have some kind of legislation uh, looking at green claims? Absolutely. So as I mean, Brussels and in Paris, maybe a few words of what we're talking about. As you mentioned, there are actually two pieces of regulation. A proposed directive empowering consumers for the green transition that came uh, about around a year ago and that will be voted today in Strasbourg. Uh -huh. And also another one in substantiating green claims, how you substantiate claims, which is has been out just a couple of weeks ago. And the aims is to ensure that consumers obtain reliable and useful information and products like the lifespan, the repair options. It sets minimum requirements for sustainability labels and logos. As you said, it prevents overstated environmental information, greenwashing, and also it provides specific guidances agreed upon, uh, guidance of how to go about substantiating claims. So we can only you know, concur and welcome these initiatives. I think it's extremely paramount to substantiate green claims because uh, if the claims are not substantiating, they are misleading, so they, therefore they deceive consumers. Mm -hmm. And definitely that would undermine consumer trust. 
and responsible businesses and advertisers, they have an interest, a business interest in ensuring consumer trust. Mm -hmm. Trust is key for reputation. And actually like 30 to 50% of a brand's market capitalization is a reputation. So they really take it seriously. It takes a long time to build a reputation and you can get it shattered like in seconds. So this is why we really welcome the aims of these uh, directives. Uh, because also this is why actually because of trust and consumer trust that the whole ecosystem comes together because they benefit from a healthy, thriving advertising ecosystem. I'm talking about advertisers, agencies, media. By media, I mean newspapers, magazines, radio, etc. They've set up collective self-regulatory systems to ensure that advertising is responsible. So what do you mean by systems? First is standards as the name behind me stands for, standards add standards. And they're not new, actually, standards for responsible advertising date back to 1937 in the International Chambers of Commerce's Code of Marketing and Advertising. And it says that advertising should be legal, honest, decent, and truthful. And this applies, of course, to, to green claims. And this code has actually a chapter D entirely dedicated to green claims. Mm -hmm. okay. Then, yeah. yeah. Let, hold it there. Hold it there, Lucas. Uh, let, we'll come back to this. Um, George, changing markets. Um, how does this proposed legislation, this so-called anti-greenwashing legislation, uh, what does it mean for your work? I mean, what are you trying to achieve and why could this be useful if it goes through with teeth? Yeah, so um, as an organisation, we're all about corporate responsibility. So, uh, you know, bringing, bringing a bit of accountability and responsibility to those who sometimes have got away with a lot of, uh, you know, their involvement in these various different environmental challenges that we face. So I always say that the greenwashing, or as, as an organization, we say that greenwashing is, is bad for three elements. So firstly, it misleads consumers. That one is, is relatively obvious. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is uncompetitive business practice. So between a business that um, can substantiate its claims and a business that can't, in a world rife with greenwashing, in a market rife with greenwashing, they just look like they're making the same claims without any regulation. And then thirdly, which is the harder one to get your head around, but the most important reason that tackling greenwashing is so important, is it acts as a smokescreen. It acts as a giant societal placebo where you look at the market and it's saying, oh, green this, green that, eco this, eco that, buy this, and we're all sorted. We're on our way to being conscious consumers and solving the climate crisis. You look at the science and you look at what's happening every day around the world and the climate crisis is, is biting us hard. One of those situations, one of them is lying and it's not the climate, it's not the science. It's instead the companies making misleading green claims. So clear the, clear the smoke screen, clear the market of those misleading green claims and you begin to see the wood for the trees, so to speak. You see actually what are the solutions that we need to be scaling up. And that's why legislation is the really important way to crack down on this. Mm -hmm. I've, I'm going to come to Johnny in two seconds. I actually have friends in the advertising industry, and they would often say to me something like, yeah, well, it's a bit complex in a short headline to tell a story. Yeah. Why can't uh, your friends in the environmental movement actually read all the texts behind the advertisement? And I say, well, people sometimes don't have time, right? So it's there's a bit of a there. tension here between the short ad headline and the is there not? Um, yeah, I mean, so substantiation it allows for, you know, the new regulation does allow for, you know, having a pithy headline and then backing it up with more information. It's uh -huh. just that what we're seeing at the moment is that we don't have any of that substantiation. Okay. So we did an assessment of fashion brands and found that 59% of the green claims that they were making were unsubstantiated. So regardless of the headline, there's no more information to go through to tell you actually what it means. Okay, good point. Um, Johnny, um, thanks. You're coming in from London, that's great. Briefly tell us uh, first what Climate Earth is, right? And then secondly, uh, let's come to already in ahead of any new European uh, directive or whatever on, on greenwashing, there are already legal claims being made against companies whose advertisings uh, are allegedly not in the spirit of what, what uh, Lucas was uh, talking about. Um, and uh, I know you've been working uh, on, with, with or supporting uh, some NGOs in the Netherlands and elsewhere uh, against something that, say, KLM has said, or Total Energies. Maybe you can talk about one of those cases. But first, what is Client Earth? And then talk about the legal route that you've been um, uh, helping some NGOs take. Certainly. Pleasure to be here. 
Um, so Client Earth is, a, is an environmental law uh, charity. Uh, it's an organization that seeks to use the power of law to help address environmental challenges that threaten people and planet today. And what that practically means is that we work on, on legislation, we work on uh, legal interpretation of the law, and we also work on enforcing the law, so through uh, court claims and complaints to regulators. Mm -hmm. Um, and so part of our work is, is for all the good reasons that George mentions, uh, is greenwashing. And it, it really has to be uh, within our work, uh, basically, because it's, um, it's a way that, uh, that unfortunately the transition that we need is, is obstructed and held up. And that's also why the European uh, government is acting in the way that it is. So the, the cases that we support uh, are examples of, of really problematic greenwashing practices uh, that exist, in, unfortunately, in the market today with specific sectors. And they tend to be the very highly polluting sectors and companies whose products and business operations we know need to change very drastically if we're going to have a chance of maintaining a livable planet for future generations. So those cases are against um, Total Energy in France, the big oil and gas company, and the, uh, the Dutch airline KLM. The cases argue that the sustainability advertising put out by those companies is misleading and therefore unlawful. The businesses uh, advertise fairly, in fairly common ways that they're part of the solution to the climate crisis. They say things like they're on the path to net zero by 2050, they're a major player in the, in the energy transition in the case of Total Energy, or they're on the path to a more sustainable future in the case of KLM. And the airline also markets high, its highly polluting product of flying as carbon compensated or carbon neutral, which is a type of claim we see quite often. And it means that the company has made a donation to an environmental project somewhere. The problem with this sort of marketing is that it really fundamentally twists the truth. Um, so oil and gas companies like Total Energy, which are expanding the production of the same fossil fuels we need to cut back drastically, are driving the problem and they're not driving the solution. They are not a major player in the energy transition. Mm -hmm. um, the aviation industry is focused on growing air traffic as it has in previous years, but we need to limit back frequent flying to levels seen a few years ago, which is hardly therefore on the path to a more sustainable future. And the idea of carbon compensation which is behind claims like, um, like carbon neutral, is deeply flawed because planting trees doesn't actually compensate for polluting products. <laughs> what it is actually is a way of selling fossil fuels or flights as green fossil fuels or flights, which actually simply don't exist. So these are all examples of misleading claims that can get companies into trouble with the law if they aren't backed up by the evidence. And I think it's worth just talking about the, the bigger picture to all of this, which George uh, explained and also Lucas did when he talked about trust. Because bigger picture, this kind of well-funded fossil fuel PR really has a, it creates problems. It, it creates a social license for the kind of these polluting companies to continue with these kind of harmful activities. And people really need to know what are the real climate problems and what are the real climate solutions. Trust is absolutely essential to making the kind of change that we need to make, not just for business and their survivability of profits, but also for the whole society. And we are in danger of that trust slipping away. Misleading advertising really blurs the distinction between problems and solutions. And that's why greenwashing has been called the new climate denial. It's how certain industries hold back climate action. So finally, this is really, for us, it's why we need the law to go further than even it currently does to try and protect people and protect the environment, and particularly when it comes to fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels at the moment kill more people than tobacco through air pollution alone, and that's before you even think about what it's doing to uh, the risks of, uh, for our planet from climate change. Mm -hmm. So we think that if we want to get serious about the transition to renewable energy, we need to ban fossil fuel advertising entirely, just like we did with tobacco. And that will really clear the air so that we can actually get on with the massive changes that we need to do. 
Okay, Johnny, that was very uh, comprehensive. Uh, you're getting an applause here from the audience. There is a live audience here in Stockholm as well. And there's a millions out there around the world. Um, Lucas, uh, just looking at uh, the European perspective here then, wh what do you expect the progress of this draft uh, legislation to be? Uh, when do you think there could be uh, final legislation on this? There will obviously be a lot of discussion between the industry and the commission and between companies and the commission. I presume people commenting on the draft legislation. Is, is there a, a time scale for this to become law or, or not? I don't know. No, it will depend usually of legislation. I can't comment specifically on this one. can take any time from six months to one year and a half. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But it's in the process, as I said today, one of the initiatives has been not discussed in plenary at the parliament that we go to the council. So it's mm -hmm. a regular, I would say, process. We're consulting all of the parties. So, of course, industry, but NGOs and everyone. And I think that's the whole strength of, um, I would say, uh, democratic societies as well, where we need to find the right balance. Mm -hmm. So I'm not justifying anyone's position. I'm agnostic as to, I would say, uh, the positions, but just to say as well that going too far, some companies would say, yes, then we don't want to communicate anymore. I think this is the case, for example, in Sweden, actually, where our member, the Reklam Ombudsman, has rendered uh, adjudications against consumer complaints against several companies and actually have uh, upheld the cases, which means that actually the campaigns needed to be removed and companies were will be complaining about it, saying it's a bit complicated to go about. Mm -hmm. So it shows, I think, the importance of providing guidance as well as how to go about, mm -hmm. because I think we can't simplify the problems. I think we have uh, maybe companies that want to act short term, right? And then there's those that believe in trust and long term, and we need to differentiate between the two. It means maybe, I would say, uh, tap down on those who are not responsible, but for the others, provide guidance for them to get right, because they also have the right to promote products that would be more sustainable if effectively they are and is demonstrated is good for them and for consumers to know they can, you know, purchase such products. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to help. I think sometimes it's maybe a bit more complicated to go about. Uh, and yeah, and I can then maybe later on touch on, you know, maybe the how we handle uh, cases of misleading advertising, because maybe just important because you mentioned court cases, but I would say on top of court cases, there's also self-regulation that comes in and comes on top. So it means the consumer can actually file a complaint if they see an ad that's non-compliant. Our network handles like 65,000 complaints and 61% uh, of them are actually on misleadingness. And out of those, when it's qualified as such, there's like 15% of green claims. So if a consumer or an NGO, an authority, sees an ad which is uh, irresponsible, they can actually uh, get a resort quickly because usually our complaints are handled within a month, if not a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And we also have landmark cases like HSBC in the UK, that's back in 2021. They were making specific claims about uh, specific investment that they were doing uh, it's sustainable, but without talking about the rest, about all of the other investments that they do in non-sustainable uh, sectors. And that yes. was actually, in a way, misleading by omission. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad you mentioned that, because actually after this segment with, with you three guys, we're going to look a little bit at uh, the, uh, the finance uh, industry and some of the claims in some ways that they get up to. Um, George, I mean, from changing markets, you're also on something called, is it Conscious Advertising? Uh, the Conscious Advertising Network. There we go. And, and what is what is it doing? And is, is it part of this landscape that we're discussing today, in a sense? Yeah, um, operating kind of at the nexus of, of media owners, advertisers, social networks, and really kind of acting as a multi-stakeholder initiative to bring all those guys into the room together to discuss mm -hmm. super important topics like climate mis and disinformation and hate speech and child protection, etc. online, because mm -hmm. we all live our lives online for the majority of the day, I think, for, for global North countries. And the amount of um, kind of power to shape the narrative that that has is, is incredibly strong. Mm -hmm. So some of what um, CAN is doing, the Conscious Advertising Network, um, is working with the UN to define climate mis and disinformation so they can start to act against it, but also, you know, something that I think um, fewer people than we good are aware of is um, how monetized uh, climate denial is and hate speech is online by the very same companies who have good morals and want to be putting themselves out there as kind of upholding climate, you know, climate science, that sort of thing. So, for example, you go on an advert, uh, you go on an article which is full of climate denial, all those banner ads down the sides, all those videos that play, 
can be monetized by those brands. And so can part of what can is doing is helping to kind of mm. raise that with the with the social networks, with the media owners, with the brands themselves to get them to get them to sort of mm -hmm. not fund that anymore, not fund mm -hmm. the, the denial. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, with our work in, in changing markets, because um, it actually picks up on a point that Lucas was making, it's great that there are so many mechanisms for consumers to raise greenwashing, but consumers have to learn what greenwashing looks like first. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something that we, our awareness needs to grow. So we actually built a website called greenwash.com, um, which has examples from the fashion industry, from plastics, and then lately of food, um, just to help people spot greenwashing in the wild, as we say, mm -hmm. um, how incredibly nefarious it can be you know sometimes it's so obvious blindingly obvious to anybody but sometimes it's really really subtle for example the examples that johnny was bringing up about carbon compensated climate neutrality these kind of climate washing claims are actually mm -hmm. something that meps have pushed to be banned outright in the um in the in the green claims directive because they are so misleading so yeah we built this resource as a way to help people to raise awareness and be a little bit more skeptical about right. what companies are putting yeah. out there yeah, because, I mean, there's also the volume, isn't there? There's the volume of advertising, if I can put it that way. I mean, I, mean, I don't know how many of us uh, 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 saw advertisements um, in the last few years by some of the petroleum companies. ExxonMobil, for example, had, it seemed to be everywhere you went, there were ads about how they were using algae uh, to create uh, oil that was, was, was green, you know? But you never saw any of their other kinds of ads very much. And it was always this one issue. And you thought, now ExxonMobil is completely into harvesting algae and turning it into oil. And it's only just recently they stopped uh, even doing that research project because it was only 0, 0.000 something percent of their business. Yeah. But the impression you got from the advertising was that this was the main thing they were doing these days. So it's also volume and not just content uh, that, that, that can overwhelm the consumer with, with, with information. That's true. Um, I think you all touched a little bit on the question I have, which is what could the people in this room do in support of this uh, legislation or what should they be doing? I think you've kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, maybe I'll just come back to Johnny. Um, Johnny, where are these, these court cases that you're involved in right now? Where do they stand? Where are they going? Uh, yeah. Sure. So um, they're, they're midway through the litigation process, um, and that is not a quick process. And uh, Lucas is, is completely right to point out that, um, that, that there's the complaints to the self-regulatory bodies, which can be a lot quicker, uh, but also are not binding as a legal matter. Um, and I think what this really means is that uh, to use the to use a phrase I've heard, we don't really have time for the uh, for the, no, for the it's, old... we don't have time, Johnny. <laughs> it's we don't have time, not we don't really have time. That's very British, isn't it? We don't really have time. Yeah, no, it's, we don't have time. This is very Swedish. <laughs> we do not have time, and um, <laughs> and uh, and in this case, you know, as a as a law, we simply don't have time for the machinery of enforcement, which is slow to run on these issues. Uh, we need to, we need changes in in sort of the the, the next two to five to eight years, mm -hmm. and the, a legal case takes one to three years, <laughs> um, so it takes quite a lot of time to to try and pick up the pieces after the the misleading advertisements are out there and after people's minds have been influenced. Um, so I think I think the, the question um, about what people can do is. Is for me, I think that they need to people can support and start thinking in terms of of just a prohibition on the kind of advertising from sectors we know we don't want influencing the conversation, uh, and that really is why there's been so many calls for a, a fossil fuel advertising ban. Why uh, cities uh, across Europe and beyond, like Sydney in Australia or Amsterdam in the Netherlands or certain cities in Sweden, has started uh, prohibiting fossil fuel advertising. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the where where this goes in in order to try and uh, control and clean up communication in time for the climate goals that we're so behind on. Yeah. No, it is true with, with the fossil fuel industry that I mean I, I've I've said to my colleagues here I would love to have a fossil fuel company on our show that had actually set a science-based target to decarbonise their 
emissions uh, up uh, and be net zero by 2050. I'd love to have one on the show to hear how they're going to do it. But there isn't one that we can invite on because I don't think any major mainstream fossil fuel company has actually adopted a science-based target. So this is a fascinating thing. Um, let's move on a little bit. We've only got three and a half minutes left. What could this uh, EU, uh, new EU legislation uh, be for other countries or other blocks of countries in the world? I mean, is this uh, very special, what's happening in the European Union? Because uh, it seems everything else in the world that's very special right now on climate change seems to be happening in the EU in terms of legislation. But uh, I think the UK is, is thinking about similar legislation, the UK, of course, no longer being in the European Union. Um, and are there other parts of the world looking at this? Anybody know? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the, the UK actually came out with their green claims code. Uh, the draft was in early 2021, and that was published in late 2021, um, looking, you know, looking towards uh, enforcing or reinforcing the consumer law in existence in the UK. This is more Johnny's area of expertise, so if he wants to chip in, that's fine. Um, but yeah, that actually, the Green Claims Code was incredibly, has been incredibly helpful for actually uh, really, really strong communication to companies and to consumers on what making substantiated claims looks like. And then over across the pond in the US, the Federal Trade Commission is in a consultation process for updating their Green Claims Guide. Again, it's guide, it's, it's, non, uh, it's not law. Yet, but you know, there's there's so much room for other countries to move. I was speaking to a Canadian journalist last week who was saying there's nothing there. Canadian? Yeah, no, no, there's nothing there. There's nothing in Canada yet. So um, there's there's. I think the EU has has um, done a really good job of setting out like quite a quite a quite a strong set of regulation that could be adopted by other countries. Uh -huh. Anybody else want to comment? Anybody hear about anything happening? And is it all just about advertising that we're talking about? Because when we say green claims, is it just advertising? Or is it other things? What's on packaging? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. So it's it not just what... It's marketing. in general, it's yeah. in general. Yes, only one of the articles is in communication specifically. Uh -huh. and it, it can cover any kind of claims. But just to come back maybe to the global perspective, I'm not an expert on the rest of the world, but what we see, for example, with GDPR and data, Europe was always, I would say, at the forefront sometimes with regulation that has been copied like in the US and elsewhere. So it's always a source of inspiration. But then, of course, the propensity to accept the level of regulation varies a lot from country to country. Mm -hmm. I would say like in some countries, like in the US, there would be maybe less. So it really depends of how whatever is going here can be picked up in different markets. So it may vary, but it's a source of inspiration. We've seen that with other pieces of regulation. Mm -hmm. Johnny, have you got any comments there? Yeah, I think um, I think well, I agree with what everyone else has said. I think that the um, the, the interesting thing about this uh, about this regulation is that it's all under a basic rule to just not have misleading communication, which is prohibited pretty much everywhere. And I think that wherever um, wherever the the advertising is in the world or wherever it's used, uh, the standard for how to avoid green claims that are misleading is going to follow the same lines that have that have really been set out in the uh, sort of perfected a bit more in the EU uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, good. Well, look, guys, we've run out of time. That's actually a lie. We've actually got 11 seconds or now we've got nine. But in there, and we've almost run out of time. Uh, we nearly have no time. Uh, and uh, I want to thank Lucas so much for being with us from the EASA. Thank you. Uh, Johnny coming in from London and lovely to have George here in, in Stockholm. Uh, very interesting uh, discussion and I hope the audience uh, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, George. Great. Uh, we're going to continue this now, but we're going to continue it with the finance sector, uh, because I think, uh, you know, uh, this is also an area where what is claimed and what is real also needs to be uh, looked at uh, a little bit more closely indeed. Um, I've got some wonderful guests uh, with me, and it's now time to introduce them. I've got uh, Steve Waygood, who's the uh, Chief uh, Responsible Investment Officer for Aviva Investors, uh, coming in from the UK. I think a lot of people will know who Aviva are. Uh, let me also bring up on stage Johanna uh, Lund.
Lundgren uh, Gesloff, who's head of sustainability at the Nordic, I think it's a Nordic pension fund. It's certainly yes. Swedish anyway, isn't it? Um, SPP. Uh, and we're going to have a little chat uh, with them uh, about this. And then we've got a couple of other guests we're bringing on uh, afterwards. I mean, uh, finance. I mean, it got a right uh, drumming last year, didn't it? Uh, from, you know, The Economist uh, uh, magazine saying that uh, ESG not fit for purpose. There were lots of reports about, uh, for example, uh, the Standard & Poor's Sustainability Index um, throwing Tesla out as an electric car company, but rating ExxonMobil quite high, which for those of us that care about the environment found it a little bit, um, well, it's quite frankly, rather amusing, uh, if not irritating. Um, but Steve, let's come to you first. I mean, on the, on the finance industry, trillions of dollars being promised to go into the green economy for ages now. Um, why is it so hard, Steve? Uh, and you've been in this, this game a very long time with, 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 with all your wonderful skill and energy. Why is it been so hard to, in a sense, get the finance sector fully on board with this green transition, this climate friendly transition that we need? It's, it's complex, is it not? Nick, thank you. And thank you also for the invitation. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, you say I've been in, in the game a long time. I have. And um, <laughs> I think my first COP was COP6. I remember meeting you in Paris at COP21. Mm -hmm. um, and Sorry I, about that, Steve. Yeah, you had to meet finance. somebody. Yeah. That's OK. <laughs> Sorry about that. It was, yeah, there were thousands <laughs> of us there, weren't there? But I, I, you, you would probably know this as well as me. It, it's kind of my first ever cop there were two other investors in the room and in glasgow they were absolutely everywhere you were tripping over them i know some of the colleagues in, in the un were, were finding it quite hard to find things for them to do and chief executives turning up and wanting to kind of profess their greenness but um not have a platform to speak at so you ask why is it not happening further and faster i think um three reasons one uh, it clearly pays at the moment to do the wrong thing um Climate change remains the world's biggest market failure since Nick Stern first said that in 2006 in the Stern view. Um, it's a, a market failure means the current structure of the markets is leading to a suboptimal outcome for society. Um, I'm obviously speaking for one of the world's largest insurance companies, and I, I work in the investment business. We see what actually hits the cash flows of the companies that we're analyzing. And whilst being climate aware does help the brand, does help the cash flows a bit, uh, it is clearly the case that digging fossil fuels out of the ground and burning it pays companies uh, at scale. Uh, after all, there are billions of consumers. So it's a market failure. And because it hasn't yet been fully corrected by those governments that signed the Paris Agreement, they haven't changed enough the cost of carbon. They haven't changed the regulation of corporate practices enough. They haven't changed the regulation of finance itself, us, enough we are still in a state of transition. So the good news is it's roughly parity now, the amount that's invested in fossil fuel uh, capital, uh, ex you know, new exploration and production uh, capital expenditure is roughly the same as um, money now being invested in the renewable space. That's about a trillion each last year of BNF figures, Bloomberg New Energy Finance figures. Um, but uh, you know, first and foremost, it remains a market failure. Uh, we could talk about short-termism and incentives in the system and poor regulation and regulatory failure and so on. But it's, you know, it, let's be honest, um, the current structure of markets is leading to about three and a half degrees if everything gets burnt uh, globally in, the, in the, the stock exchanges of the world. We're looking at three and a half, which is clearly nowhere near even the upper limit of the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. So whenever I turn up to these conference of parties and everyone's talking about whether one and a half degrees is alive, I think the conversation itself is absurd. Uh, it should start with the fact that the current global economy, the current markets are capitalizing three and a half degrees. How on earth are they going to get it closer to two before they start arguing about whether there's any glimmer of hope about one and a half? So I, mm -hmm. I can blather on, Nick, but hopefully that gives you a sense of where I'm coming from. Right. Um, let me turn uh, to uh, Johanna here. Um, so SPP. This whole way of trying to create accountability uh, in, in the financial systems, you, you're quite interested in the issue of data and the mm -hmm. transparency of data, presumably of the companies that you're investing in. 
Um, tell us a little bit more about that, because I think in our conversation we had before, it's not just more data that's, that's more transparent, it's more data that's transparent with the experts to be able to unpack the transparency of the data that's coming <laughs> forward, if I can sort of put it that way rather badly. Um, tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, but as you say, I think high quality data is, of course, uh, extremely important to make better decisions. Uh, I think when we talk about the ESG backlash, maybe Times Magazine says that uh, ESG is just humbug. But if you talk to investors, understanding, of course, uh, opportunities, but also the risks of investing in companies without knowing uh, sustainability data, uh, it, it is a big risk. And that's that's not humbug, it's important to know. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the carbon prices increase and you are stuck in a very carbon intense technology, of course that will affect uh, our investments. Mm -hmm. And you would never invest in a company without knowing the financials. Uh, you need to know to do the proper uh, due diligence, but you also need to do that within sustainability. And then you would of course argue that we need more data, but just getting the data and thinking then we can just plug and play it into a sustainable product. I think that's a bit an easy way to look upon it. Mm -hmm. uh, because for example, if you look at, we always take this example of an insulation company. They have quite high uh, carbon emissions in the production. So when we look at them, it looks like it's a bad company. They have high carbon emissions. But then when you use the insulation, that will actually save carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. But if we just buy carbon data uh, and say, OK, we're going to do a carbon efficient uh, product, uh, then we'll miss that. So you need someone to actually interpret the data and to understand what, what are the fallbacks uh, with this data. Mm -hmm. And I think we're quite far from having super high quality data. There are new regulations coming in the EU, the CSRD, the taxonomy, uh, but I, I, we're talking years and years be before it will be completely comparable and, uh, and of really high quality. But we need to start using what we have and we need to start pushing for, for getting it and for having accountability within the companies, boards and leadership groups for the data they present and right. then uh, being able to analyze it. Okay. Steve, um, uh, Aviva, your CEO was in a magazine article, I think it was ESG magazine or something like that. Um, it's not the one I normally pick up on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he was saying that at Aviva, you're kind of now trying to do something a bit different in terms of getting information from the companies that you invest in. What, what, what is going on? How are you, how are you trying to create more accountability with those businesses that you have to, in a sense, work with or choose to work with? Thank you for the question. So um, since 2001, so a long time, we've had a voting policy that has asked the companies uh, at their AGM to publish you know, carbon data, uh, the carbon disclosure project, which many of you will remember, predated the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which I serve on. But CDP had their first ever investor meeting in our offices 20 years ago, before I was even in the business, which was 17 years ago. So the first thing, Nick, is that we're asking for companies to disclose that data. And if they don't, we vote against their, uh, we start with their report and accounts. And if they still don't um, listen, then we can escalate that to the board pay and the re-election of the directors. So we, we, we are making it very clear to them and have done for two decades. The, the climate data, emissions data, is a material factor for us in our investment decision making. That's one. Two, more recently in the last two and a half years, we've been pointing to the 30 biggest emitters in our portfolios uh, and in the benchmarks underlying them and saying we want to know not just what's your TCFD report, not just what is your transition plan, but what are you doing cap capital expenditure, CapEx, in the fossil fuel space? We want to see you phasing that out, and we want to see you phasing up renewables, and we want a coherent transition plan that takes you to net zero by 2050. Uh, and we've said not just voting against and uh, re-election pay and not just the reporting accounts, but we've said that if for those really recalcitrant oil and gas firms, we will walk away at a certain point. Now, mm -hmm. we don't want to do that because that's a failure of our engagement process. It's not a badge of honor. And it also reduces your ability to continue to influence the business. 
But it is a fact that a lot of, particularly as the state-owned oil enterprises, they're not practicing what the other PLCs are preaching and practicing in terms of uh, transition plans and TCFD reporting. So we're using our voice, we're using our vote, we're using our capital, we're saying we'll walk away if we have to, and we're told them we're very serious. And it's got the full backing of Mark Versey, who's the gentleman you refer to, as well as his boss, Amanda Blanc, who co-chairs the transition plan task force with the UK Treasury, who's the group chief executive at Aviva. So it's a coherent, and we think, well thought through approach. It won't deliver what everyone wants all the time. Um, you know, it is absolutely the case that we need to own the companies to influence them. Um, and I know that for some people, they would rather we just walked away now. But mm -hmm. um, we believe as an insurance business that our business is existentially exposed to climate change. And if we don't do everything we can to change these businesses, then we're actually failing to deliver for our clients, shareholders and society beyond. So if we mm -hmm. thought it was the most effective thing to do, that's what we'd be doing. I mean, to both of you, maybe jo Johanna, you can come at this as well, because I thought it was intriguing in a sense what Steve said, but also I've heard this before, which is that, that until the governments absolutely recognise in their plans that they really want to hit the best target of the Paris Agreement and have put in place all the actions they can as governments and all the regulations or guidelines or whatever it is you need for all the sectors of the economy which they have some day over, that it's quite hard sometimes to say to some companies, well, you should be doing this because they, those companies say, well, if that's the case, uh, how come my government's not, you know, like pushing like devils to get this done? Um, is it actually about just governments or is it about, is it about a partnership between governments and companies like yours? In other words, if you move forward, you can demonstrate that certain yeah. things can happen and it might encourage the government to move or just... What, I think it's a you know? partnership between uh, individuals, customers, uh, with companies and between governments and they like, it's a push and pull. Uh, of course, it's easier for governments to make the uncomfortable decisions if the companies are already doing things. If they're already reducing carbon emissions, well, then it will be easier to increase the price of carbon because it was it won't hit the companies as much. So I definitely think that companies uh, could and should move faster. Uh, politics is about pleasing a lot of different stakeholders uh, and trying to get everyone with you. Companies can move faster. They have closer to uh, decision making. Um, and I also think you have, to have a lot to gain from uh, you compared to competitors or uh, in, in, uh, among the customers if you are good at sustainability in a lot of markets. I mean, it's, of course, different in, in different parts of the world, but at least in, in Sweden, uh, being in the for forefront is a competitive advantage. Mm. And then the government can move faster uh, in an easier way, I think. Steve, I mean, um, is that right? If the government's moved a bit tougher on these targets, it might be easier for Aviva and others to move even further and faster. I mean, I suppose the point is if you stick your neck out too far as any company, there's going to be somebody there trying to lop a bit of that neck off, you know? Uh, I mean, can't be so far ahead of the game, can you? Because you may end up marooned on a very attractive mountain top, whereas everybody else still at the bottom of the mountain waving at you, stuck on the top with no, with no food or drink. Um, sorry, this is a terrible analogy, but I, you can see what I'm trying to say. It, can can a, a company move too far ahead and then be left behind and, and just lose out completely? Yes, they can. Uh, without stronger government action, there will be no transition. Without a cost of carbon actually embedded in the cash flows of the company, there will be no transition. The only transition, therefore, that can be generated is government-led, but that doesn't let investors off the hook. We need to be engaging with the governments that we lend money to. Nearly 90 trillion of capital goes into government coffers directly in government bonds. When we lend to them, we should hold them to account as well as the companies. Mm -hmm. We should say to them, you know, you've signed the Paris Agreement. What are you doing to deliver it? We, we are deeply concerned about the systemic risk that's created by climate change. You've clearly not done enough to embed these externalities into the cash flows of the business. You need to not just regulate, not just set standards, 
but you need to ban certain things. You need to have, take fiscal measures that take fossil fuel subsidies off the table. I can't believe the G7 communique at the weekend was talking again about 2025 being the time that they'll phase out fossil fuel subsidies. It's completely implausible when you look at even the G7. Um, if, if the market thought that was true, there would be a market correction uh, in the last few days in terms of the fossil fuel valuation. So let me be clear. Governments absolutely need to lead this. It needs to be, the externality needs to be internalized. They need to steward a just, just transition over many electoral cycles. And investors who lend those governments money have a duty, not just to engage with the companies, but to challenge and hold governments to account as well for delivering their job, which is thinking about long-term sustainable growth and the benefits of future generations too. And we're currently burning fossil fuels at a rate that will destroy future generations' well-being. And we now know that. So while we don't have the time, we have to make the time and then take the time to do this stuff properly with a coherent plan. Uh, I can't believe no one anywhere has a plan for how you mobilize four to six trillion a year, which is what we need. Uh, but it's yeah. it's a fact. So anyway, back okay, to you Okay, Steve. Uh, brief thank you. You've got a big hand of applause there from the audience. Uh, Joanna, a little just, hand uh, of applause, eh? <laughs> It was quite big, actually. Um, they're very modest, the Swedes. Okay. You know, they clap very softly. So, But it was a lot of <laughs> millions here in the audience. Um, so, Johanna, uh, just briefly, if you could end this session no, for but I us. Think, yeah, government needs to lead it, but they are not. And then we can't, we can't sit and wait uh, before all the political decisions are made. We need a global carbon price, but we, we don't get it. Uh, so what can we do? We, we can't yep. wait. We have to do things. And I think the companies has a good opportunity to lead. Uh, and I think we see that in a lot of companies around the world as well. Yeah. Good. Thank you both very, very much indeed. I think that was a fascinating discussion as well. And uh, let's have you on again next year and see what's uh, got better. Okay. Like a good plan. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Johanna. Bye -bye. Thank you for the invitation. Bye now. So, we're just going to continue this uh, theme for another... Ah, what's happened here? Ah, oh, we got a bumper. It's a bumper. It's a cool bumper. <laughs> Great, so we're going to continue this just for a few more minutes. Um, because this issue is very important about the transparency of the financial, financial sector. I want to welcome Ingmar Rensog back on stage, uh, the CEO and founder of We Don't Have Time. And joining us from London is Steve Smith, who's managing director of uh, Bankers Without Boundaries. Steve, are you there through the magic of Zoom? You've lost Zoom at the moment. This is terrible. They've lost Zoom. I don't oh, no. know what they've done with it. Where, where have they put it? Okay. <laughs> I, ladies and gentlemen... Your, your mad dick is not working anymore. <laughs> we get little messages in our ears from the tech crew. The idea that they somehow lost Zoom is very amusing. It's like some sort of pet that's gone for a walk down the street or something. Um, okay. Ingmar, you heard a little bit about what we said, uh, what yes. we said there, about um, the finance market, but also about data as well. Yeah. Um, you want, we don't have time to bring something to the table on this, yes? Um, you think that we might have something and we don't have time that could help yes, with this issue? Yes, absolutely. And uh, to just uh, lay the foundation for that, when, when we started We Don't Have Time over six years ago, it was super important to hear business leaders, uh, activists, uh, anyone talk about that we are in serious climate crisis. That was a victory to hear someone high up in, in, in a corporate to do that. Mm -hmm. But now we're beyond talking. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to deliver what we talked about six years ago and, and before that. Uh, and in order to really see what people are delivering, we can't just have anecdotal, uh, like we are building some uh, electric trucks, uh, trucks or anything, we really need to see the result. And the result is in the data. Mm -hmm. And it's not complicated. It's super simple. Mm -hmm. It's the emission data. Mm -hmm. And this is absurd. Uh, we have a whole industry. It's a billion dollar industry. I'm not talking about the oil industry here. I'm talking about the ESG, Environment, Social, Governments, Data Industry. Uh, and it's, um, I mean, it have existed 10, 20 years. It's super big and it's failing us because it's, it's so much 
data is really confusing. Mm -hmm. It's over complex. And the whole industry is all about selling that data, mm -hmm. gathering it, selling it. And you have so many consulting trying to explain that data. Mm -hmm. And the companies, they are reporting over and over and over and over again. And if you are best at doing the policies, you have a really high ESG score. Mm. But are you really delivering to a climate target? Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah. Uh, so what we need is that we need to make this data free and we need to do it very simple. So that is what we are at We Don't Have Time are going to do. Mm -hmm. We're going to make it as easy to access your emission data as it is to see your company's financial data. Mm -hmm. It should be everywhere where you can read about companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to give out that data for free to everyone. So when you look up a company or a country or a city, you will see how much emi emission they had last year, the year before that, the trend, and how they're actually performing. Yeah. Because today we're just talking and we don't see who are delivering. Mm -hmm. We need to really reward those that are delivering. But if you're not delivering, like many people aren't, mm -hmm. we need to call it out and that's the data and we can't sell that data. Mm -hmm. We need to make it public available. Mm -hmm. We need to have everyone to see it. Hold that thought for a second. Did we have Steve from London with us uh, on, the, on the Zoom? There Hi, he is. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, the, our technical crew, lo crew, crew lost Zoom somewhere, but they seem to have yeah, found it again. Uh, yeah, um, v Ingmar was just talking a bit about, and he's going to give us a bit more uh, of a presentation, I think, aren't you? Aren't yes, you? tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. But um, Steve, tell us... Uh, who are bankers without boundaries? And uh, briefly, and then just why for you data is also absolute, absolutely key to this transition? Yeah. Uh, hi, Nick. Hi, Ingmar. Nice to see you. Sorry for the technical hiatus. Um, so Banks Without Boundaries is a sustainable finance, a not-for-profit sustainable finance consultancy, um, uh, trying to use innovative financial solutions for environmental and social issues. Uh, as the name might imply, Bankers Without Boundaries uh, we come from a banking background, and um, uh, I spent 25 years in the financial markets. Data is everything. Um, but in the environmental world, ESG world, there's almost too much data and too much noise. Um, the challenge we have is uh, MIT show that there is a, there is a um, correlation between data providers of 0.6, as an example, uh, corporate credit ratings, uh, correlations of 0 0.99. 0 0.6 is a correlation which is of almost no use. Um, equally com confusing and complicated, a consultant uh, highlighted there are 600 agencies providing information on ESG. Um, there's just, in a sense, too much noise. There's a huge amount of money in this invested in this area, 20 trillion, 30 trillion, the numbers get bigger every day. Um, but the information is poor and often confusing. To be frank, it's more disinformation than information. Um, investors want to know more about what companies are doing in environmental and social uh, background, but they need to know real information. And mm -hmm. perhaps as important, they need timely information. The trouble with so many of the ESG data points that people read about is they're backward looking. They're retrospective. Um, and uh, we don't have time as uh, producing some very interesting data, which is timely and informative and that's what's going to help investors mm -hmm. to make um, good judgments about environmental and social issues. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that, I mean, there are different levels of investors in the world, right? There, there may be those who work for very large companies. They have lots of analysts, people that can crunch some of these data mountains. But then there's a lot of kind of just ordinary people, maybe people in this room, who, who invest some of their money uh, as, as citizens in, in markets, thinking that their capital is doing something good for the environment, but then maybe by chance reading some article in some magazine or seeing some research paper by somebody else that might point out that this, this fund they've invested in by, say, somebody like BlackRock or USB or somebody else, uh, that this fund actually invests, in the, invests parts of the, the money in the fossil fuel industry. And it's like, well, how come this climate fund I've invested in has got fossil fuels in it when I was just told superficially that this is a, a green fund, right? Uh, and and yeah. unless you're actually really 
connected with the mountains of data. There's no way you can mine that information yourself. You have to wait by chance for an article in a magazine or something. It's not really fair, it seems to me, no, as well. No, you're absolutely right, Nick. That's yeah. the, the, you know, large parts of the population, we know this from survey data and others, uh, retail investors, um, regular people, want to invest in a sustainable future. Um, and it's behoven on the investment community to provide the right information about that. And too often it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And that's right. not necessarily because they're bad. There are bad actors here. But either the information is not good or it's confusing or those ESG ratings. I mean, there are endless um, true stories of people like Chevron getting a good ESG rating. Mm -hmm. It's an oil company. How mm -hmm. can that be so? Mm -hmm. um, so, you, so the investment community, both professional investors that are providing the information for the retail investors mm -hmm. need better, more timely information in order to, to give that uh, appropriate information to the retail investor who mm -hmm. can then make a judgment. Maybe, maybe the head of Chevron or something invests very heavily in donkey sanctuaries and that tips the whole <laughs> rating away from killing the planet with fossil fuel emissions to animal welfare. You know, that's probably <laughs> why they get a good rating. Um, Ingmar, um, tell us a little bit more about why do you think we've got in We Don't Have Time data that could actually help others to actually make better investment decisions? So what we have today is real-time data about people's view on your company, a little bit like TripAdvisor. When you go to a hotel, you check if other hotel guests think it's, they have sort of good food, if they are comfortable beds, etc. And it works, because if you don't have a good hotel, other guests will tell you that, and you can avoid that hotel. Um, so we are doing the same thing, but with companies and leaders about the climate action instead. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really important because you can look up companies today on We Don't Have Time and you can see what they're doing good and bad and you can see the total score that is probably somewhere between. Mm -hmm. But if the company are doing more good than bad, that's probably a better company than doing more bad than good. Mm -hmm. uh, this is important because this is real time data. It's not old data, it's what's happening here and now. We have hundreds of thousands of users creating this data points in our system mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we are going to do uh, going further is that we're going to combine this people opinions data with the emission data. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see what is people opinions about this company and what is the hard fact data, what is the trend. And when you have those two facts mm -hmm. and you put them together, you will see who is doing the right thing and who is just a talker and not doing the right thing. Right. Uh, because we want the discussion to be fact-based. Mm -hmm. And in order to have a discussion fact-based, we need to have the fact and we need to have everyone to see the same fact. And emission data is super simple. Mm -hmm. It's how much em em your company yeah, is yeah. emitting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in order to compare it, we're going to divide that with the revenue. So you can compare a big company with a small company. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to have a metrics where you can see how much a, a sector are emitting on average. Mm -hmm. So you will see if a company are performing better or worse compared to their peers in that sector. Mm -hmm. Because you can't really compare a bank uh, with a truck company, but yeah. you can compare a truck company with a truck company. Mm -hmm. Uh, and who wants to be, I mean, who wants to perform less than average? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are like laggers. We don't want to work for them. We don't want to invest in them. We don't want to buy their products. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of this is that it's just a ripple effect. Because if you're a big company out there, you're buying from smaller companies in your supply chain. Mm -hmm. And if you're a big company like IKEA that we're going to see here later this week, if they stop buying from all of those suppliers that are producing things mm -hmm. with high emission, mm -hmm. they will go out of business. Oh, yeah. so you will have a ripple effect of this. Yeah, this so gets, what, yeah. what we want to see is companies competing of doing things with less emissions. Mm -hmm. uh, the only problem with this is that we should have started this 10 or 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's never too late. Uh, and this really needs to happen. And I think that we are going to play a big role here. No, no, I mean, this was something, Steve, that you, you weren't with us, um, but we had uh, some companies on earlier 
where we were trying to just not only talk about what they were doing, but the fact that the companies are becoming more interconnected in terms of the fact that if one company wants to decarbonize their, uh, or set targets to, to reduce their emissions, they're highly now dependent on their supply chains to actually decarbonize yeah. their emissions or else they won't achieve their goals. And, and so it's a kind of, everyone's trying to like uh, keep up with each, each the other to, to contribute to each other's climate reductions or else they'll miss their targets and then the looks bad uh, under the science-based targets yeah. initiative or under the exponential roadmap. So this kind of there are new accountability mechanisms that one can harvest to try and hold even higher levels of accountability. Yeah. And I kind of like that idea with the data and the companies and the interconnectivity. Um, no, that's just to say, uh, Ingmar, you're going to give a proper demonstration on this tomorrow, what, yes. you're, what you're planning. Um, and we've just run over time. But I want to say, good. Uh, Steve, thank you for coming in. Uh, and uh, your very, contribution. Very and, uh, yeah, no, and, uh, yeah, I recommend everybody to listen to Ingmar tomorrow and he presents. It's a fantastic set of data and uh, it's timely, as he points out. And the supply chain aspect, I think, is critical as well. I'm very interested in what you were saying earlier, Nick. I think that's mm. absolutely spot on. It's a key part of getting companies to net zero is to control their supply chain as well as their own behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Good. Thanks, Ingmar. Thanks, Steve. And uh, let me now hand over to my uh, wonderful co-moderator, uh, Katerina. Thank you very much. The Swedish oat milk company Oatly has truly been blazing trails and challenging the dairy industry. I myself a uh, fan since many years and um, I'm thrilled that nowadays you can get oat milk in my coffee and coffee machines at convenience stores and also on trains. But producing plant-based options to dairy is really not enough for Oatly. They want to transform the whole industry. So please join me on stage now, Cecilia McAlevey, this Director of Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Eating, it's such a wonderful title, and Public Affairs. Please give Cecilia a warm hand. <laughs> wonderful to have you here with us on stage. And you're going to kick us off with a keynote. And then we have a wonderful panel set up, so fire away. Thank you very much. Uh, so as you've heard, we know that we are at a crisis time. Uh, we don't have time. And we've heard several reasons as to why we have ended up in this place. I will focus on food systems. And we know that about a third of the global greenhouse gases come from the food system. And most of them, about half, comes from the animal sector and production. We also have a situation where we need to feed 10 billion people by 2050. And we already exceed the planetary boundaries. That's another big challenge we're facing. Yet another challenge, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be super depressing, but I just want you to, to get into the mood. And we also have created a food system which actually makes us sick. The majority of uh, deaths globally are caused not by viruses, not by bacteria, but actually about how we live. And several of those diseases are diet related. We have cardiovascular diseases, we have certain types of cancer, and we have diabetes type 2. And we see, it's very clear, 
that re the researchers agree we need to shift. We need to shift from a predominantly animal-based food system towards a plant-based uh, and plant-centric food system. So what is very, very good with this negative picture that I'm painting is that there are solutions. And what is also good that there is reactions. There are huge uh, engagement to tackle those challenges. We have the plant-based revolution. They're moving forward. And in this context, I would like to present Oatly and what we are about. So we want to provide solutions. And we think it's essential to be part of the solution, because there are solutions to the crisis we are in today. And our products is, of course, one thing. This, is, uh, this bars here show clearly that, on average, you have a less e uh, climate impact, less land use, and less water use comparing uh, milk, traditional cow's milk, to oat milk. So you can make a huge difference by just sw switching from traditional cow's milk to alternative. In this case, I'm talking about oat drinks, but there are many other plant-based drinks, obviously. And in addition, because I think it's important to address what can we do and what can we do as companies and as businesses, we want to offer solutions in terms of our products, but we do also want to drive change. Uh, because if you look at it uh, today, is I talked, I showed the land use, and we need to be, be much more effective in how we use the land. And if you look at it, that half of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture, and about 77% of this is used for livestock production. And this is despite that meat and dairy takes up less than a fifth of the calories. Uh, and furthermore, we've had the corona pandemic, and we have, have the very awful war in Ukraine, which has also put food security and resilient food systems on top of the agenda. We need to change. And what we do as a company, and as some of you might know, is we are also about challenging norms. And we need to, as we've heard from several presentations here, which I find personally very inspiring listening to, we need to have policies helping to change the system. And what I also find inspiring is that we have a situation today where you have businesses, you have consumers, and you have NGOs walking hand in hand, pushing. But actually, as we heard just before, policies are lagging behind. Regulations are lagging uh, behind, not only, but even preserving status quo, or even worse, re reinforcing and going back ways. Uh, so what do we do? I want to give you a couple of examples of what we do as a company, just challenge the norms outside what we offer with our products. Have you heard about the school milk scheme? I'm sure that many of you have been offered uh, school milk for free in schools. This is a subsidy, and it's now under review. And it's, there's going to be a vote in the European Parliament on the 8th, 8th of May. There's been a petition, there's been lots of reactions in public consultations to the European Commission. Uh, so there are clearly consumer support. We have also tried to turn some attention to this topic. So this is one example of how we've done that. Yeah, you get the picture. So why do we do this? Actually, the uh, preamble to the regulation, why the school milk subsidy is there, is order to ensure long-term production of milk. Just so you know. Uh, so please be active and engage in this. Of course, and that's our, our real pledge. Of course, young people should be allowed 
to choose plant-based drinks on the same conditions as cow's milk, at the very, very least. That's one example. Another one which I'm happy to share about is climate footprint declaration. It's up, been up several times here today. So what we started doing a few years ago was actually to declare the carbon footprint on our packages. And we also ran a campaign where we were urging the entire food industry to show its numbers. And why do we think? Because I think it's so important to show the numbers. Only by having the numbers can you compare them. And also that also makes you aware as a consumer of the climate impact. Because today you have price and price is completely misleading. No way, as we also heard from the financial sector be before, does it internalize the externalities. So this is one way we want to push and actually ask for it. And we're really happy uh, it, that the greenwashing gets out, uh, thrown out. So uh, you can see uh, on our packages, Another example which we did there, uh, have done is also there have been loads of, and there are unfortunate initiatives trying to censor the plant-based sector uh, that be in, under the flag that it should be misleading. I don't know. We did this survey actually. There were not many people who took our products believing they were milk. Uh, so we just don't buy into it. And here we have run uh, also a petition together with ProVeg. So finally, yes, policymakers, we really ask, and here we have our list, please include plant-based options in public catering and in school mix scheme, in dietary guidelines. Please introduce mandatory carbon footprint labeling. It will also be an incentive through the value chain. It will empower consumers to make informed choices and level the playing field. Don't censor new solutions and also remove distorting taxes and VAT levels. Milk is exempt or have lower taxes and VAT in Germany and Netherlands, just to give an example uh, to be concrete. Sus do support sustainable farming and uh, entrepreneurship and also invest in research and in education and awareness programs to inform people about what they can do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Cecilia. So if you would uh, point out the major winnings of, of, of switching to the plant-based uh, non-dairy products, what would they be? Well, you would reduce your climate footprint, that's for sure. Uh, you would also uh, win several, I can only speak for our products, but there are some nutritional benefits like fibers, for instance, and unsaturated fats, which would be good. Uh, I know that there are also many who choose to switch for other reasons. It's environmental health, medical, if you suffer from allergy intolerance, or ethical reasons. There are people who care for animals. So, so there are many reasons, many good reasons. And you pointed out the policy that that's needs to be pushed forward here. Uh, so if you would identify a major barrier, the, ba the biggest barrier for you to, to be able to, to enforce um, more, m m make it possible for people to have more oat products, what, that, what would that be? I think it's both uh, policies like I listed, but I mean, if you have distorting uh, financial instruments like VT and tax mm -hmm. and subsidies, that is really hands on, but also promotion schemes. Uh, because I find it interesting that consumers drive, and, uh, drive this shift, whereas policies are trying to regulate and cons preserve what is, or even worse. Uh, so I think the biggest, biggest, uh, shift would be, it is like I, I wrote here as well, it's the norm. We need to shift the norm. The plant-based should be the norm. That is my firm opinion on the topic. Excellent, Cecilia. You take a seat on the sofa and Thank I'll you. get back to you shortly. We just need to bring on some more fabulous guests here. Uh, we have with us here Maria Smith, who is Secretary General at the Axe Foundation. Please join me here. Maria, please give Maria a warm hand. Take a seat here in the sofa. And we also have with us Gustav Jonsson, who is CEO and founder of the food site site Jävligt Gott, which means, uh, well, I probably shouldn't be cursing in English here, because it might turn out the wrong, but fantastically tasty, or something like that. Exactly. And the vegan restaurant Chuchu. 
Exactly. Great to have you here, Gustav. And also with us on David Bring is on, who is CEO and founder of Carbon Cloud. And Carbon Cloud collaborates with Oatly and calculating Oatly's climate footprints. We saw that on the on the uh, on the package here before. So I'm going to take a seat, and we'll have a little bit of a chat about this important topic. Uh, so Gustav, you have founded this site, Yes. and you have also, uh, and it's a site for vegan food, and you've yes. written a lot about uh, vegetarian and vegan food, started cooks and sort of several restaurants, and you're also a very keen debater on, on food and health and planetary health. So um, from your point of view, how can we accelerate this transition to a more plant-centric or plant-based way of eating? Yeah, um, I think the central point of that is to understand what's actually the problem. Because mm -hmm. um, the point isn't that people like to eat meat because it's bad for the planet or it's bad for the cows. They eat it because it's normal food. And that's why we're consuming the kind of food that we're consuming, because out of habits, out of availability, out of norms, and unless we understand the, the importance of that, we're never going to be able to make the shift fast enough. Because mm -hmm. we, really, we, we need to make a shift in the dietary habits of people and how we consume stuff. And in, in just a matter of years, really, to meet the 1.50 goal. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen. You're not going to make people not want to eat hamburgers and meatballs or like drink milk or whatever in just a couple of years. That's never going to happen. But what could happen is the development and the introduction of amazing alternatives to products that we use to create those experiences. Because you need to understand that a good hamburger is not about meat. It's about the great experience of an amazing hamburger. And we can recreate that in several different other ways. And I think that's the only thing, really, that's going to work. We need to make it easy to do the right thing. And we're going to do that by introducing alternatives, like Oatly, for example, or like um, yeah. different kind of alternative proteins that we can use to create better burgers, better meatballs, better stuff. And that's really because that's absolutely the most common question I get as a food blogger. Why do I want to recreate vegan food? looking like meat. Because the people think, some people think you should just eat beans. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and I'd love for everyone to eat beans, but it's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. It's like, could you imagine all the Italian people stop eating pasta and pizza and uh, prosciutto for the climate and go eating Indian food instead? Mm. Yeah. Too That's much of a shift. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Mm. But we can make better mozzarella, better parmesan, better... And green. it's happening. And it's happening. It's happening. And so I, I'm pretty sure we're going we're gonna to win this. It's just a question of with how much strife and how, how fast. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, I stopped eating meat in 1986, and I said it was mostly beans those days. I wasn't yeah. alive in 86. <laughs> well, I so was. Uh, it was mostly beans. Lots <laughs> of good stuff, for you. Lots of yeah. other stuff that you can eat now, for sure. Yeah. So, so, Maria, turning for you, Axe Foundation is a not-for-profit um, independent organization, and you work with a focus on building a sustainable society. And of course, you're also focusing on food, but you also, and you also believe that businesses are a strong driving force in this transition. So how can you drive businesses into transforming f the food system? I think it's a very central question. And uh, starting off with a, a quote from a smart person who mentioned this, I think it was almost 80, 80 years ago. It was that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used creating them. And I think that's really sort of the core of it all. Because mm. um, at Axe Foundation, we are uh, absolutely convinced that we need to create new innovative solutions, products, services, or, or business models for that uh, sake. And in that arena, of course, businesses is, is crucial. Mm. And it's, of course, about them minimizing risk, but also future-proofing their business. And we work with, I would say, about 175 companies right now, in, uh, of a total of 300 partners in 30 projects both within the plant sector, but also um, in other sectors and with um, uh, animal husbandry, etc. And, and it's really uh, interesting to see that 
so many one, so many companies want to be a part of the solution now, at least in the context where we operate, and that is of course a very important. Um, uh, factor ahead. I can just mention so you get sort of, I, I move myself out of the fluffy dimension into something more practical. Uh, we have uh, one project that we launched quite recently that is called Over and Oat, uh, because we have seen that when it comes to uh, really, really interesting things and challenges right now, it's within the residue stream arena. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, waste or uh, losses within the food sector, for example. And this project, Over and Oat, it's about addressing um, okara, which is the post residue within when you produce oat milk. So uh, oat is part of that project, but other actors uh, within the oat uh, milk beverage industry. And I think that's sort of um, trying to find those arenas where we can actually uh, develop innovative solutions that can transform the system. I think that's really key going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. So, David, um, you are uh, working with Carbon Cloud. As, and as I, when I introduced you, I told you, the audience that you are collaborating with Utli. It's all about transparency. And could you tell us a bit about how you work with numbers at Carbon Cloud and what you what you try to achieve, please? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, to take a step back, sort of on like solving the problem of climate change broadly and food uh, industry specifically, uh, it, uh, it is very much an information problem. It's a solvable problem from the engineering perspective. We can produce food without emissions, but the emissions happen through very long supply chain with a lot of details in them. And there is a lot of information to keep track of to sort of find the little innovations you can do to reduce emissions. And um, what we do in Carbon Cloud fundamentally is to help food industry players such as Oakley to sort of become transparent of the climate performance and communicate to their customers how good they are precisely. Uh, and to be able to communicate, now we made it an, an improvement, 10% we're better, or we're a little bit better than someone else. And then also being able to do that back in the supply chain. So you have suppliers of ingredients to these products where you can do the same thing. And sort of with Carbon Cloud, we very much are focusing on making this measurement easy so that you don't need to be an expert on science. You don't need to be an expert on mathematics. You need to be an expert expert at whatever part of the food production you do and realize that what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? And then being able to communicate that in a very reliable and easy way to whoever your stakeholder is, mm. which in Otis case then would be a customer. So. So thank you. So Gustav, for instance, I know you run a restaurant uh, that serves only vegan food, and I yeah. ate a fantastic steak there, by the way. Steak was a little commercial here, but it was, it was a steak with plant-based. It was amazing. Uh, so uh, would you be able to have uh, carbon cloud numbers on your dishes? Absolutely. We're actually working on uh, calculating all the dishes mm -hmm. uh, with actually a, a competitor to Carbon Cloud right now. Um, well, uh, too bad. <laughs> all uh, sorts of actors. Yeah, but, uh, but absolutely. I, I, I believe very much in the communication mm -hmm. of, of uh, carbon numbers because uh, it's, it's a way to for the consumer to understand the difference between these products. Uh, and my goal as a chef is then to make sure that these two options are not just regulated by like the numbers, but also they're both as attractive. If we can make similarly attractive alternatives, but with hugely different numbers, yep. and I think we're going to be able to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Cecilia, listening to these fantastic people, what, do you, what reflections do you have from your side? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just that we just, like you said, Gustav, you put it so well, we just need to make it happen. And what, what I think it is inspiring is that there are solutions there. There are forces for change and there are so many initiatives. So it's just to, to leave room for all these initiatives and actually let them grow the way they, they should be doing. I mean, I, I, I think that's the most important message to, to give hope and actually to take... Let. And also to give to politicians, because if there's something they should be doing, it's to help these uh, alternatives to prosper and get space, um, both with uh, regulations and subsidies. And so, so it's not weighted against 
the new alternatives. No, you're right. And I think because what is beautiful is that there are so many new initiatives. There are so many uh, entrepreneurs out there, but they do run into problems with existing pro policies which actually promote the other yeah. side or the, the old fashioned way of doing things instead of promoting the shift. Because it needs to be a shift that is inclusive. And you described it well when it have, to, to, in terms of eating habits. But actually, to do it in a way that bring people along, because mm. we need to leave the polarization behind. We need to move along and include the entire supply chain in moving forward. So speaking of policies, we see a lot of uh, policies being cranked out from the EU in terms of climate transition. It sometimes is surprising how, how they actually step up the game. But when it comes to food, what, what do you foresee? What do you need from the EU policy perspective? And, and do you have any, any takeaways here? Because there might be EU politicians watching this. What, what, what regulation changes do you need? Well, uh, there is yeah. quite a few examples I could give. But as a, we call ourselves a do tank, since we're uh, rather than a think tank tank things who are very focused on doing and experimenting. And like you said, I think the policy should be there to facilitate the sustainable solutions, to facilitate the innovation work and the initiatives that is ongoing. And in our projects, we encounter hindrances, policy that hinders the innovation, or maybe sometimes where it's actually lacking policy. Mm. So that also hinders the scale up. I mean, it's about Talking about residue streams, it's about how we classify waste. Oh, hmm. or, or is it a wa waste? I mean, for, I mean, many times it's actually a resource, but that's sort of just one example of, of plenty, quite concrete uh, ones. Mm. Gustav, please. Yeah, yeah, so another example of that is the regulation around novel foods in the European Union, and um, where you have a regulation system that's based very much on protecting consumer from a health perspective. You shouldn't be able to introduce a new substance to the market without checkups. And, and that's reasonable. Mm, but the do. problem is that you have a whole new food tech scene that's based on creating new products. And the framework for introducing these new products are, are, is very lacking, really. So it, it's it takes a long time to get these approvals for new products that could be used to create these new products, but it's really hard to introduce them. And just to create uh, fast tracks through these regulational processes would be hugely uh, positive. And I know that there is actually a protein strategy in, uh, being worked out as, as we speak in the European uh, Parliament to, to work with this. So I'm very keen to see what, what's going to happen with that, for example, in a couple of years. And there's also quite a lot of lobbyism from the meat and dairy industry talking about how yeah. unhealthy and, and the sort of strange the add additive yeah. discussion and, and for instance in the vegan, uh, vegan additives or the vegan food. Well, what is your take on this? Uh, because this is really your, your yeah. field. Absolutely. Well, first and foremost, you have to remember that we quite often get to, we, we start to focus on discuss the new things. Uh, and the devil you know is, is it's not as focused on. So you, you don't see all the additives and all the processes in the food that you're actually eating. Like processing is a very wide word. It can be oh. boiling water. Mm. That's processing. So to say that something is processed is very, very lacking of description. Mm. Uh, but of course, of course, we should ask for and, uh, and demand uh, strict regulations on what kind of ingredients we're allowed to serve to people otherwise like a company like Oatly would be very uh, would have a hard time to make people un trust anything they would serve if there was a question about Oatly's uh, choice of products like we shouldn't be serving products that's bad for people mm. but we can't have this discussion where all additives all processes are being uh, um, put on spot as something bad because then you couldn't eat the parma ham and you couldn't eat any of the cured meats because that's yeah because there's additives to those as well it's, it's, it's and processes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to to differentiate between apples and pears in this mm -hmm. discussion and and just to make sure that we have a strict regulation on what we're supposed to serve to people and uh, and then be open to new things mm -hmm. and for it to be evidence based because yeah, of course. I think that is one of the problems today it's very it's very uninformed and uh, discussion yeah. going on and there's one uh, really at EU level one important legislative uh, proposal coming up it's the legislative framework for sustainable food systems 
And of course, that is important that that takes into consideration this mm. shift that must happen. Anything else is absurd. Uh, and also, like we mentioned earlier, the, the school mix scheme is another example where we really need to. There are so many norm setting policies which, uh, which really need to change. Mm. So, uh, yeah, and mandatory yeah. carbon footprint labeling. Hello, here, David. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I may add to that. Here, Carl, David, because we need, we need to run this up. <laughs> yeah, very quickly. I mean, I mean, I think that all the different parts of the food industry should be treated the same and also preferably the same to other verticals. Like we are now, we have cap and trade systems and carbon taxes for other verticals where then sort of it provides incentives for improvements, incentives for innovation to start like being solution agnostic, saying we don't, from a policy perspective, say which direction the industry needs to take, but just uh, or sort of which technical solution, but rather which direction emissions need to go down. We can do the same for food and say measure everything the same way, treat it the same way and put sort of taxes or missing trading schemes or whatever, just make sure to treat everything the same. And then whoever is best at producing dairy, they will sort of grab market share from that. Whoever is best at producing the tasty burger with the lowest emissions will grab market share. There's huge opportunity in there. And they will like, we can be sure there will be a market for food also in the future. So, so like this can, I mean, this is very, very much, much consistent with the food industry in EU thriving but we just need to sort of be firm with the direction and treat the industry the same. Excellent final words. Thank you, Cecilia, thank you, Maria, and thank you, Gustav, for joining us here. Thank you very much. And stay with us because we're going to continue talking about food and agriculture. There is really just a hop and a skip between oat milk and regenerative agriculture. And in this session, we will talk about how regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions can help solve the climate crisis. This session is held in collaboration with the Global Clinton Initiative. It's a global platform that brings the public, private and philanthropic sectors to the table. And it does this to forge lasting partnerships to address the most urgent challenges of our time. So it's now my great pleasure to welcome on stage Mayuri Ghosh, Director of Climate Resilience and Sustainability, Global Clinton Initiative. Please give Mayuri a great warm welcome. Thank you. Wonderful to have you here, Maria. And um, please stay with me here and tell us, start telling us a bit about the Global Clinton Initiative, please. Yes, thank you so much, Katrina. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, so Mayuri Ghosh, Director for Climate Resilience and Sustainability at the Clinton Global Initiative. And as Katrina mentioned, uh, we are a platform which brings together the private, public, and philanthropic sector to really catalyze and scale great ideas and commitments which are already there, which are addressing some of the world's global challenges. Uh, as we know, uh, climate is one of the biggest challenges of our times. It's something which is happening here and now. Uh, we are seeing a lot of health impacts because of climate. We're seeing lives and livelihoods lost uh, uh, and impacted in a very adverse way because of climate. And this is something which will only exacerbate if we don't act now. So uh, as all of us know, uh, this is really the decade of action. Uh, so a, a lot of talking has already been done. So CGI or the Clinton Global Initiative uh, is known for its bias towards action. Uh, and we do that by convening uh, as well as catalyzing and uh, amplifying the work of our global community of commitment makers. And when we say commitments, those are new, specific, measurable, uh, viable and accountable near-term projects in terms of uh, achieving climate goals, whether it's on the mitigation side or the adaptation side. So regenerative agriculture and nature-based solutions are two of the leading drivers uh, in terms of climate action, along with a variety of other different topics that we focus on. 
and we work with a global community of change makers or our community of doers, as we say, who are again driving the work. So we are here to provide a voice to kind of continue pushing the envelope, uh, continuing amplifying their action and very proud to have three of our commitment makers here today. Excellent, Mayuri. So please have a seat and you'll be joined by some other fabulous uh, climate warriors here. Um, we have with us Katarina Kalman. She's Chief Program Officer at TechnoServe. Thank you for uh, joining us here. Wonderful. Give Katarina a warm hand. And join me here uh, on the table, please. Katarina, would you like to stay with, stay oh, with sorry, me for just me. an opening question here? Um, Please give us a quick overview before you take a seat on, on TechnoServe's commitments to action with the CGI, please. Thank you, Katrina. There's been a lot of talk here in Stockholm today about our planet. And it might seem weird, but I'm actually not particularly worried about our planet. Mm. I'm sure it will persist. I'm deeply worried, though, about our people. Anyone who produces or consumes food, which is all of us, right? Mm. Across the world, there are about two and a half billion people who rely on farming for their livelihood, many of them on small farms. These smallholders are really important to all of us, to you and to me. They produce more than a third of all the food in the world, and they're very vulnerable to climate change and mm, nature loss. Indeed. At TechnoServe, where I work, we help these small farms and small businesses to increase their income in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. And we've already helped millions of people to lift their families out of poverty. That means building resilience and reversing climate change and nature loss. Excellent. Take a seat and we'll, we'll talk more uh, in a minute. And joining us also is Emma Dennis, Senior Manager for Sustainable Agricultural Practice and Global Impact, Better Cotton Initiative. A warm hand to Emma, please. <laughs> so Emma, uh, if you were to give a two-minute elevator pitch here for the Better Cotton Initiative, what would that be? Thank you. Hi, it's great to be here this afternoon. Um, so the Better Cotton Initiative, for those of you that aren't aware, is the world's largest cotton sustainability standard. Last year, we licensed 2.9 million farmers to grow one-fifth of the world's cotton as Better Cotton. Um, and that was across around 26 countries as well. So in terms of what we're doing with the Clinton Global Initiative, um, we've last year uh, presented our commitment to action in terms of pi uh, delivering a pioneering insetting mechanism with smallholder farmers. And that mechanism will allow us to um, deliver funds directly to those farmers so that they can practice more regenerative practices at a field level. We recognise it's quite a big leap for many of the smallholders we're working with to move to truly regenerative agriculture. So any way in which we can support them is, is really necessary and vital to do that. So to deliver this insetting mechanism, we need to uh, launch our traceability programme, which is due to launch in 2023. And that's the first step to us uh, having an insetting programme that will deliver funds to farmers. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Emma. Please take a seat. Thank you. And last but not least, we have with us uh, Anilam Chiber, co-founder and managing trustee at the Industry Foundation. Please join us here and a warm hand, of course. So tell us about your foundation. What do you do? And also um, your commitments with the, the CGI, please. It's lovely to be here. Uh, Industry Foundation is based out of Bangalore in India. We work with smallholder farmer women and creative producers. So we focus on something called creative manufacturing, which is basically traceable supply chains. Some of the women make lovely baskets, which are selling in IKEA. So I, we look at uh, the intersection of equity, climate, and gender. Sweet spot. Sweet spot. Very, very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think women need not, there's a lot of talk about how women are going to be impacted by climate change and they're most vulnerable, which is true. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you've got a little extra heat or extra cold, pregnant women are going to be deeply impacted. But we kind of take the stance that women are also very, can be active makers of global green supply chains, right? Mm -hmm. So that's essentially where we are at and that in a nutshell explains. And uh, we have an initiative seeded by USAID in India. And uh, through that, we are making a commitment uh, to uh, raise 
we've already raised most of it, about $15 million of support to build more bamboo collectives Ooh. in India. And India is the world's largest grower of bamboo, but we are a net importer of value-added product. Bamboo is hugely carbon sequestering. Indeed. It's the world's fastest growing carbon sequestering Basically product. Basically sucks down the carbon. Absolutely. And we have the world's largest number of smallholder farmers. Mm. So we, we are kind of marrying these concepts. So women will get active work. They will earn millions of dollars through the years because bamboo grows for 40 years. Mm. And we are building some of India's first forest stewardship council certified mm. bamboo supply chains. Wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. Feels great because I'm actually wearing bamboo leggings. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I hope they're comfortable. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Please have a seat. You know. So we need to talk about the key levers here, how we accelerate and scale regenerative practices when it comes to agriculture and nature-based solutions. solutions. So Katarina, you, you touched upon this a bit when you when you uh, opened up here, but please, please elaborate. Yes, thank you, Katarina. So I'm going to mention two really important levers. The first one is to be bold in your commitments. And CGI has helped us be bold. Last year, we launched our Regenerate 30 commitment. Uh, by 2030, we will um, help 30 million people to improve their livelihoods. We will mitigate 30 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions and we will um, restore and protect 30 million acres of land and water. So that's, that's pretty bold. We'll do that through green businesses, through regenerative agricultural practices, and working very closely with food processors, thinking about the previous mm -hmm. conversation about processing. The second really important lever is to make sure that there's a strong business case for the farmer. There's been a lot of talk today about business cases, and I, wa I don't want business case to be a, a buzzword. I want us to understand what that really is all about. So if you all think about, um, imagine being a smallholder for a second. Your plot is about the size of a football pitch, and you depend on that land for your income. In a good year, you're totally fine. No problems, you can feed your kids, you might even be able to save some money. But in a bad year, if your harvest fails, you're in trouble. And with climate change, these bad years are becoming more frequent and more severe. So given how delicate your livelihood is, would you want to try new regenerative practices that seem uncertain and require upfront investments? I personally wouldn't. And so we need to understand that for farmers to adopt new regenerative practices, they need to not only uh, benefit climate and nature, that's all great, but they also need to benefit themselves. They need clear economic incentives. And that's something we see all the time in our work. For example, when we support coffee farmers in Ethiopia, we help them to plant shade trees, to use composting. That's excellent for binding carbon, pulling it out of the atmosphere, uh, for improving biodiversity, and it also improves the quality and the productivity of the coffee, putting more money in the farmer's pockets. Thank you, Katarina. Nila, you, you, you mentioned before that you're already working, supporting all sorts of initiatives here. So when you listen to Katarina and also when you, talk, when you think about levers, what, what is your take here? I agree completely with her because uh, take a country like India, it's going to be the, it is, it has the largest population on the planet. The Millennium Development Goals were met by China. The Sustainable Development Goals, if they're ever met, mm. India is going to have to play a huge role in it. Mm. We have the largest number of issues in, on the planet with people on the planet. The right? middle class is becoming bigger, becoming but we bigger. also have the largest number of poor in the world. Right, and we now coming to the fact that I believe that a key lever is going to be intersectionality. That you're not going to have the resources to do it, you know, silo by silo by silo. And it also happens that countries like India are the third largest emitters on the planet. Mm -hmm. We are, and we have these issues, right? That these are problems created by our economy, but our people are going to suffer, and we've got to look at this with a global lens. Mm -hmm. We have to. Because we can't emit carbon. We can't. I mean, if we are the third largest carbon emitters, what is the solution? So I really believe that the nature-based economy, and I love the whole nature-based solution part of the climate action and the GHG 
uh, theories of change? How do you reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I think there needs to be a lot of focus on supply chain. But from the smallholder perspective, because I can imagine you work with a lot of smallholders, how do you sort of keep them safe and comfortable in this transition to different techniques? You mentioned different new um, yeah. uh, plantations. I think key is the women. The key is the women, mm -hmm. yeah, because India, for example, has huge amounts of funding at the government level to promote women's collectives. Our entire Ministry of Rural Development is working on how women's collectives should be scaled. And they are huge national programs. So how do we get all this thought process percolated within systems of the government mm. which work towards alleviating poverty? So linking reduced vulnerabilities with climate action is a very, going to be a very critical path forward. Mm. Thank you, Neelam. So, Emma, how does the Better Cotton Initiative work with re the, the regenerative perspectives of agriculture? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, it's really interesting what's being said this morning as well, because for the Better Cotton Initiative, for starters, it's a multi-stakeholder initiative. So, it's already engaging with all the different um, elements of the supply chain, from farmers to ginners, binners, workers, governments, etc. Um, so, that's a really important part of what we do. And then the bedrock of the standard is our, or our, our principles and criteria. And the principles and criteria that um, underpin the standard have just gone through a revision process, and it's been a uh, huge process that's involved many, many different stakeholders. It's been very complex to do. Um, but the outcomes of that have really made sure that the regenerative concepts are much more deeply embedded within our standard. So although we previously had a huge focus on soil and water and biodiversity, those elements have now been brought together in a natural resource management um, component. But even more interestingly, we've got a new um, principle around livelihoods, mm -hmm. and that's something that didn't feature before. We've also enhanced our decent work um, component. So both of those elements together are really putting the emphasis or bringing in that emphasis of um, the human aspect of regenerative agriculture as well, which, as you've mentioned, is, is really critical. On top of that, the way that we're supporting farmers to make the make the, that first step, you know, I, I mentioned already, it's really challenging sometimes for farmers to move to being regenerative. You know, they've got lack of access to information, resources, um, finance, those kinds of things that have all been discussed already. So we're working with partners such as H&M, who are providing us financing. Um, We've got a project that's starting actually in the next couple of months in Telangana in India with around 7,000 farmers. And that, will, that project is to really support those farmers to make targeted improvements and embed regenerative practices into what they're doing um, and help them to prepare for that new standard as well as it launches. So having that you know, targeted investment is, is really important. And then the third part for us is also around these bold ambitions. And we've also just set our 2030 targets across five different areas, which include soil and um, livelihoods again, as well as women's empowerment. Mm -hmm. And those uh, targets are really encouraging us to drive our ambitions forward and really focus on, on where we want to get to as an organization to support the farmers at the end of the day. Thank you, Emma. So what we keep hearing today is the, the, the accountability, the transparency, the, me, the, the metrics of, of, of calculations of emissions and also how everything works. So it's, 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 I think it's, it's wonderful to hear that this is actually, because what, 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 what you don't measure, it's difficult to improve, right? So my, 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 when you listen to these fantastic ladies here, what are your reflections on, on how they take on these challenges? Well, firstly, I would say, you know, I'm, uh, I think uh, what we tried to do was have this as an all women's panel because we've heard from many, um, you know, here and in the past that gender uh, is one of the main dimensions of climate and there, there is a disproportionate impact on women, you know, irrespective of the community and the region. The second thing we wanted to do, like from a CGI standpoint, was make sure we have representation across the world. You know, it's great to have te uh, TechnoServe and Better Cotton and Industry Foundation who are working globally and locally to show solutions uh, which are very locally community driven, but can be replicated and or scaled across different parts of the world. There are a few key drivers. I think everyone's touched upon it. 
policy levers, whether it's at a you know local community level or um, state, or increasingly at a federal or national level, which is required. It's required faster. Second is financing. So we hear a lot from our community members that you know this uh, seems to be a lot of financing which is out there, but it's not oftentimes at the scale which needs to be deployed or the urgency with which it needs to be deployed. So that's another lever. But what we see here is, again, like that message of hope that there is a lot which is going on through you know, entrepreneurs uh, as well as large and small organizations. And how can you break the silos, whether it's, you know, of, um, talking not just about uh, agriculture, nature-based solutions, but in the context of human health and planetary health, in the context of livelihoods and lives, as all of you are doing. Because when, the, when we talk about the climate narrative, it's a bit also about you know what's in it for me. Mm. And it's not just about me. It's about me and my health and my community and my livelihood. Um, but again, with, with a positive framing, there are things which are out there which can be scaled. Mm. And it's wonderful because we have, I'm not sure how many people are watching now, but it tends to be quite a few millions watching the, the, these broadcasts. So of course, they, they will be inspired what you're, what you're pointing out here and, and they can find more information on your, on your websites, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really great that you're all here. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to give one key sort of call to action, a message. How can we scale from your perspective climate action? Go ahead, Katharina. Thank you. We can't have environmental sustainability without economic sustainability and, and vice versa. Mm. And um, we need to stay laser focused on the farmers who feed this world. Take Manuel Guarcas, for example. He is a farmer growing peas in Guatemala. I met him last year. And seven people depend on that farm for their livelihoods. Peas are sensitive to two things, too much water and too little water. And Guatemala struggles with both because of climate change. The solutions needed for Manuel already exist. It's a matter of making sure that he's got access to them and that he can finance them. Climate change stands between us and a better future. We can achieve that better future for the sake of Manuel and millions of farmers just like him. We do need to do so fast. Thank you, Katharina. Emma? Yeah, I'd absolutely echo that message about making sure that the farmers and the farm workers are supported to make these changes. They're already the most vulnerable um, in the value chains that we're working in and making sure that we can reduce any risk that they're exposed to um, in the most effective way possible is, is really essential. So whether that's through um, financing, providing um, access to information and resources, but also through um, effective policy and lobbying as well, that's something that we, we also need to be part of. Thank you very much, Emma. And Elon. Yeah, I'm talking about financing, <laughs> yeah, and which is why I think there are two very large global instruments out there now, which are billion dollar instruments. I had the good fortune of hearing uh, the head of climate at, of USAID yesterday. Uh, and those are about uh, preventing deforestation. I have a feeling we really need to design, and which is why our launch of the smaller innovative finance instrument at CGI. Mm -hmm. But I do believe there is room for billion dollar instruments. And uh, these are built around, some are uh, around the carbon, but some around also on not just trading carbon, but on creating more carbon, not just through deforestation, uh, not creating carbon, sequestering carbon through uh, regenerative ag practices. So I believe there is room to design very large instruments and raise the kind of financing needed mm -hmm. from governments and private sector working on more blend, uh, blended finance instruments. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are going to put our uh, work on. Go for the big bucks. Huh? Yes, go for the big bucks. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So Mayur, would you like to conclude this panel with your, your thoughts on, on, on what's most important for the aspect of climate action connecting to this topic? Absolutely. Firstly, I, I, you know, I just want to continue amplifying. Like CGI is not what it is without its commitment makers. So, you know, mm -hmm. they really are the heroes who are driving all the action on the ground. So, I mean, through this audience, would want everyone to look at what they're doing. Go look up their websites and uh, you know, commitments from last year and upcoming this year. Uh, I want to drive the message. It's from a book which has been a bit of my Bible called Speed and Scale. Um, and it's about 
the urgency with which we need to do things now, whether it's financing, uh, whether it's policy, whether it's uh, showcasing entrepreneurs and innovators, because if we don't act now, uh, you know, seven years out for those long time uh, commitment horizons, we, we just don't know, you know, what the world will look like then. So the other message is around making sure as all these organizations are doing, we are including the most vulnerable communities who are impacted by climate change. Uh, in this case, definitely farmers whose lives and livelihoods uh, are at stake. But in the world at large, when we talk of agriculture, just think food and that's how it will impact you. Mm. So, you know, uh, migration and how it could impact you. So it's not just going to be about the me and the others. It's going to happen to everyone, irrespective of where you live and your income level. So I don't think climate is going to make a discrimination then. So we need to act now. We don't have time. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Mayuri. Thank you very much, Katarina. Thank you very much, Emma. And thank you very much, Neelan. Thank you, Katarina. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And now we are moving on, and I'm handing it over uh, with a warm hand to Nick Nuttall. We're now going to spotlight a new initiative that is gathering wide support across many political parties in the European Parliament, and it's aimed at framing and implementing a new pathway to sustainable growth across the European Union and perhaps beyond. Let's introduce our speakers who can tell us about the Beyond Growth Initiative and what it might mean for Europe's efforts to address not only the multiple challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss and land degradation, but framing a new sense of human well-being, perhaps even human happiness. So, Let's uh, first see Sandrine uh, dixon Declev. She's a project leader at Earth for All, a co-president of the Club of Rome. Yes, I can see her over there. And also coming in uh, on the magic of Zoom from Belgium, we have, and if you could scroll down, because I don't think we've got Pierre with us, do we? We don't have Pierre. Yeah, so we just need the next guest. If you could go lower, there we go. Anuna de Weaver van des Heiden. I'm sure I've got that completely wrong, but Anuna, you can <laughs> fix that for me. Um, I'm going to come over to the sofa, and uh, when you come in, if I got that wrong, just please tell everybody. Um, great. Um, can you maybe kick off, Sandrine, um, with uh, what is this thing beyond growth um, and why is it proving so popular among many different uh, political parties in the European Union? Absolutely, Nick, and it's such a pleasure to be with you again. I hope you can hear me. Perfectly. Wonderful. So. What I wanted to do is, first of all, thank We Don't Have Time for all of the incredible work that you've been doing to remind us that we don't have time. And I think this is really important that as co-president of the Club of Rome, and if you look at the, the 50th anniversary of the limits to growth, we've been talking about the limits to growth for quite some time. To think now that we actually have one of the largest conferences being organized by different grouping of European parliamentarians is phenomenal. Uh, a group that have come together from all the different parties that have agreed that for three days, they want to unpack what it means to truly understand moving beyond growth. So coming from the Club of Rome, I mean, we believe that it's a bit over time. We should have been talking about this a long time ago, but it's good that we're having this gathering. I think that uh, there are a few reasons, obviously, that it is cross-party and that there is such an interest. Uh, growing discussions around new indicators, uh, looking at the poly crisis and the complexity of the challenges that we have in the 21st century. 
and a growing understanding that our economic and our financial systems don't really actually serve as people, planet, and prosperity. And whether you're from the left or the right, an understanding that citizens are not happy. And so I think this uh, Beyond Growth Conference is really coming at the right time in Europe. And I'm really hopeful that we can make this an international event at some stage and not just an event, but a real gathering of knowledge and also policy understanding so that we can move to the next phase of really introducing a new economy for all mm -hmm. across the globe. Okay. Uh, Anuna, you're a climate activist in, in Belgium. Um, how have you got involved in this Beyond Growth thing? Um, lovely to see you. Please let us hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm yeah. very happy to be here. And I'm, I'm joining Sandrine in yeah, the fact that the title of the event is, is yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that is good that we're being much more blunt about the reality that, that we're living in. For me, I started grassroots activism about five years ago. And um, to just complement what Sandrine said, when I started this activism, not many people were talking about beyond growth or uh, at least questioning, really questioning growth as an ideology and GDP growth as an ideology and what that means and how we can look beyond that. I think that is something that is new in regards of how we are really mm. mainstreaming that conversation. And I think, Sundrin, you mentioned that we should have been talking about this a long time ago. You have been talking about this a long time ago, 50 years ago, the Club of Rome were talking about the limits of growth. And I think that it is really time that we start mainstreaming these conversations in very high level political arenas. And I'm hoping that and I'm seeing that a lot of grassroots activists and a lot of movements are really supporting these ideas and are really trying to talk about these things and, and mainstreaming these conversations. And I think that that's really necessary because I really see that first the ideas on beyond growth and neoliberalism and what that means and how we can look at that in a sense of if we see if we look at the world what do we value when we value a healthy life a good life a happy life is that what gdp growth is giving us i, I don't think so and i think a lot of people are really questioning that and first these discussions were really happening in the academic world and now i see these are really evolving into a movement and I'm really happy to see that. I'm really happy to be a part of that. And I think we're really at the start of something very, very fundamental. Mm. Uh, so maybe from both of your own perspectives, can you put your finger on why GDP, the classic measure of growth we've had since, what, the Second World War, which I, if I recall correctly, was something about measuring how much productivity was going on yeah. as a war machine uh, against uh, certain elements in Europe that uh, wanted a different uh, structure in the world. Um, the country I live in, Germany being an example. Um, why, what, what is wrong with GDP as a measure of whatever? <laughs> a measure of g growth in its own limited terms, right? Whatever. <laughs> I, what, what's wrong I with think GDP? We're going to call it a measure, a measure of whatever. I love it, Nick. <laughs> it's going to be that's going to the new GDP measure. Yeah, okay. Listen, um, I think that clearly, yes, this came out of, of the Bretton Woods discussions. It came out of a post-war trying to address productivity and rebuilding the global economic order. But the fact of the matter is that, and this is where the limits to growth are ready at that time, and even presidential candidates like Bob Kennedy made it very clear. You know, we measure that which is not necessarily the most essential, and we don't place a measure on what matters most. Uh, and, and this is the question that, that we have thrown out for many, many years from the Club of Rome. So what is it that is making also uh, now, at this time, the difference in the conversation? I think partly, as Anuna said, we're realizing that actually we've got the first generation that's going to make less than its parents. We have a growing real issue between the differential between the wealthiest and the poorest. Inequality has grown across the globe, not only between North and South, but also within so-called wealthy countries. 
So what politicians, but also the OECD, is actually looking at new indicators. The UN has been now looking at indicators, and we'll be talking about this at the new UN Gen- at the UN General Assembly next year. Um, we're we're all uh, coming together as economists and thought leaders around the different types of indicators. We have the well-being economies. All of these new models look at the fact that we cannot just have a productivity measure, that it is actually placing us in an extractive economy that continues to have growing emissions, growing impacts in terms of this differential between the rich and the poorest, and of course, growing impacts between the North and the South in a negative way. Mm. So we need to totally rethink our economic model. And this is why it's so exciting. Maybe I'll finish with, you know, here at the at the European um, and in Brussels and, and across the European institutions, you've already got DG Foresight, so the Foresight Directorate General that is looking at new indicators. You've got the Joint Research Center. You've got the European Environment Agency. You've got research and innovation. And I think at the end of the day, what we really need to start to think through is, okay, well, what is it going to be? And this is some of the work that we're started to think. How do we actually get at least a narrowing down of the indicators that could be as acceptable as GDP has been until now, that really measures what people need, access to the care economy, education, and moving away from a pure growth indicator that's really not enabling economic development and wealth mm-hmm. distribution. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anuna? Yeah, and yeah, maybe, I mean, just to add to that, I, as Sandrine is saying, there's many new stakeholders that are talking about this, and that's extremely exciting. And I do think that it's important that when we're having conversations about growth, we don't just look at beyond growth, as in we need growth and what else. We also really need to question almost the fetishism that we have in the Western world with growth and how justice is central in that. Because if we look at the history of growth, it has often depended on things as colonialism and extractivism and exploitation. And so if we're looking at different economic architectures globally, those need to be central in that in that discussion, mm. I, I think. And and one of the one of the important because I, I I've been looking into the Earth for All project, obviously, and I think it's extremely inspiring, especially because it's so globally widespread and carried out. And and one of the analysis that you've made is that political will is literally the biggest mm. hurdle. To, to, to creating a new economic architecture. And the solutions are there, the minds are there, the movements are there, the pressure is there. It is really political will. So seeing that so many new people are talking about this, to me also as an activist, um, it's extremely exciting. So it's not just redistributing wealth, is it? It's not just about a more left, left-wing policy of wealth distribution. It's more than that, isn't it? Absolutely it is, Nick. And, and I think this is where also it's a vision of the future. As Anuna says, and Anuna is our future and our present. I mean, this for me is the greatest intergenerational dialogue that we could be having at this time that actually reflects the needs of people, planet and prosperity together. We have gotten it wrong over the last 50 years. In some ways, we've seen evolution in terms of, yes, some wealth distribution in countries that are more egalitarian, We've seen evolution in poverty alleviation in some countries. And by the way, China is actually the country that has alleviated most of its population out of poverty. Not that we're trying to promote a dictatorship or the type of regime that we see in China. But we have to take a step back and think through looking at 21st century challenges and looking at obviously the poly crisis and the fact that we will be in a permanent crisis stage. What then is the economy that we need in order to service people to be more resilient to future shocks and stresses? And that's what comes out of Earth for All, right? Part of that is we have to understand that as much as the environmental tipping points are absolutely fundamental to address, we have to think about social tipping points. And it is this disconnect between people's needs and the real wealth distribution that then comes in but also the link between consumption and the way in which people engage with the economy. Mm -hmm. And I think there we have a beautiful element of Earth for All that shows that by empowering women, by empowering people, 
by looking at new universal basic dividends or citizen funds, by bringing in citizen assemblies, by enabling people to engage in policymaking, but also in the economy, you then create new jobs, you enable people to actually really be part of the economy. And this is a vision of the future that is truly positive. So would it be, would it be that, okay, so for, for an ordinary person out there, you know, we have a, an audience here in Stockholm, we have uh, millions watching online. Um, they may have heard about the Millennium Development Goals of, you know, 2000. That was very much an agenda of, you know, trying to help the, the global south uh, have a perspective for sustainable development. Then we got the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, which involved both rich and uh, less rich countries. Uh, and then we have agreements like the Paris Agreement on climate change, and we just had a slightly good one on biodiversity and stuff. Is it actually trying to bring all those, all that thinking together into, okay, it's not just one agreement here and one agreement there and one agreement there. There has to be a new kind of economy that underpins all these new waves of sustainable development concepts that have been coming forward in the last uh, 20 plus years. Is, is that what we're talking about? A, a, an economic architecture that can be measured, that reflects what we want from all these things? Sorry, a bit simple, but... Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's actually super fundamental. They're asking this because I do feel that there's been there's there's been so many movements working on all of these different topics that are super much interconnected. And I feel like Beyond Growth just basically gives us a name to put it all together and, and questioning growth and questioning the fundamentals that are underneath that. And I think for me mm -hmm. and, and also my role in this panel is to also question who who is having these discussions and who is having these votes. And I think, again, with the Earth for All project, the citizens' assemblies are key to that. The fact that these discussions are happening democratically, that everybody has access to these discussions is, is extremely important to actually have a conversation that includes everybody and, and to build this new vision. So I do I do believe that this is something more fundamental than than we've seen in a very long time. And it brings together a lot of things. And that's also why I feel that uh, topics like justice and decolonialism should be centered in these conversations. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you then, um, how is it all being, you mentioned various research institutes and you men mentioned cross-party parliamentarians interested in this. Um, how's it being received by the commission itself? And by the way, um, Sandra, you mentioned the Beyond Growth Conference, but we didn't actually anchor that in a date. Um, so mm -hmm. what, who, how is it being received by the Commission, for example? Trades unions, environmental groups, business associations. That's an interesting area to think about. And when is this Beyond Growth Conference that they're all going to come together on? Yeah, so first of all, Nick, um, I probably should apologize on behalf of the members of parliament that had agreed to be on this um, on this show and, and yeah. really wanted to discuss this with you because we had agreed together yeah. that, that, uh, that we would actually introduce the Beyond Growth Conference together. So this is really an initiative of members of the European Parliament, in particular Philippe Lambert, who is the, the lead of the Green Party in the European Parliament and who has wanted to bring together his and his colleagues in mm -hmm. order to do this collectively. Mm -hmm. um, the conference itself will be held from the 15th to the 17th of May. And, and actually, Ursula von der Leyen, and I feel very honored, I will be following her, um, will be doing, actually, the opening of the conference. Uh -huh. And we have to remember that... Um, Already, just before COVID, in her State of the Union address, she mentioned the need to start to address a well-being economy. In fact, in conversations with the president and after having offered her my, my book, my copy of The Limits to Growth, which I know that she read amongst others during the summer before her State of the Union address, just before the COVID outbreak, she very much wanted to see how she could scale up the thinking and the acting around new indicators, around thinking through uh, beyond growth policy across Europe. And then of course we got hit by COVID. So 
there is going to be three days of discussions. And coming to Anuna's point, the three days are focusing on finance. They're focusing on job creation. They're focusing on the relationship between trade and competitiveness, uh, addressing obviously the role of new indicators and getting into the technical discussions, but also looking at the different theories of change. So I, I will be speaking just before Jason Hickel, who does not believe in growth, but actually wants to talk about degrowth. Uh, there will be Kate Rayworth, who is obviously the um, the economist who brought forward the model around the donut. Um, so we will have a series of different economists that will be there to present the different models. We will have conversations that will span new economic thinking all the way through the impact, yes, on unions, and bring forward not only some of that thought leadership during those three days, but also workshops that have been organized leading up to those three days and then afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think the key to be respectful to Anuna and to others that are coming in from a younger generation than yourself and myself is to make sure that this is not a talk shop, mm -hmm. that this is just not a token conversation around beyond growth. And, and for me, the way to do that is to anchor it in the broader discussions that we're having mm -hmm. around the Beyond Bretton Woods conversation, the way in which we will be celebrating the 80th anniversary and the discussions we're having around the need for new international institutions, around debt cancellation, and yes, addressing colonialism. We need to think about the Bridgetown Initiative, which is now very much pushing as well, a new evaluation of debt and trade. And we need to think of also the Macron Summit, which will be happening just afterwards in June, where we'll be talking also about new financial flows, thinking through the way in which we address most of the world and their needs. So this is part of a broader conversation, but it also can't just stay a conversation. It has mm -hmm. to be anchored in change and policy recommendations. Mm. Anuna, what, how is the youth uh, uh, gauging that barometer? How is the youth uh, taking to this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think Sandrine makes a really good point because we are obviously watching. A lot of us will also be present at the conference and we will be present at those conversations. And I think that's that's key because what Sandrine mentioned before, I think this is one of the most important intergenerational conversations that we are having because you've seen thousands of young people on the streets shouting system change. And I think this is exactly what we are referring to. And I think it is so incredibly amazing to see that finally there is this group of people that are not just young people on the streets, but academia, scientists, politicians, stepping up and, and backing us up on this idea of the fact that we actually do need to change the system and we actually do need to center the voices of people that are hit it hardest. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I'll be, I'll, I'll be at the conference myself. There will be a lot of people there and I, I, I'm going to be watching the developments of that conversation because obviously we've been talking about the limits to growth for a very, very long time, 50 years ago and beyond that. And we don't have time. That's the reality. So we need to start actually implementing these things and we need to start mainstreaming them in the highest political arenas. And, and I hope to be a part of that. And I think that young people are going to be in those arenas and, and they are already there. So mm. it's important for us to be there. It's important for us to be included. And it's especially important, I feel, that there is this global mm. lens of, of decolonialism and so many of the grassroots activists that I'm working with, activists in the global south, that also have access to these conversations and that their voices are heard yeah. as well. I, uh, we, we have a few more minutes left. Um, I was going to ask you, maybe it's a really stupid question, but I was going to say, do you, do you have a couple of favorite indicators? But, um, <laughs> but you know, I always, uh, I think maybe for the audience as well, it's worth re recalling that, um, you know, we all know from various studies in the past that, that for example, you could, uh, you could cut down all your trees, couldn't you, in your economy? You cut down all your trees, uh, turn them into logs, and export them, and you would have a positive GDP, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And people go, whoopee, GDP's gone up, we've chopped all our trees down. And yet, the, the economy is totally silent on the fact that you've now lost you know, maybe pollinating insects that were associated with the forest or, you know, uh, water supplies to river systems that came from the forests that you've chopped down, all those other things that were of great value to your economy, the GDP is completely silent on those 
kinds of impacts. Yeah, correct? And so there's, in, there's a, a bad indicator, if I can put it that way, that we still have in all our economies. Um, and, and yet people don't realize that, okay? So are there indicators that you are aware of in the Beyond Growth debate that say to you, speak to you as a person and say, that would be cool if we had that in our economies? So if you look at the well-being economy, sorry, Anuna, um, I'll, I'll just go quickly. I, I, was, I, I really love your question because, again, a lot of thought has been done to this. And I think we do need to simplify Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The indicators. That's why GDP has been used, right? It's, it's quite simple. Although, by the way, there are many different criteria behind GDP and the productivity indicators. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's be clear. If you look at at least most of the work that's been done, whether it be the donut, well-being economy work, new indexes that are looking at economic development, we see that there is a pillar on environmental criteria and environmental indicators, which would then bring in your valuation, Nick, of biodiversity, of forests, of um, oceans, mm -hmm. impacts, pollution, etc. There's the social indicators that a very similar example to yours is why is it that we can fire thousands of people mm -hmm. and shareholder value actually goes up, mm -hmm. the stock value goes up, and the company grows uh -huh. When you fire so many people because we haven't taken into consideration unemployment, we haven't taken into consideration the social impacts, et cetera, nor the impact on the community, which comes into that social pillar. Mm -hmm. And then you have the economic pillar. And the economic pillar takes into consideration productivity, but it also looks at optimization of efficiencies. It actually looks at other ways to evaluate economic development. Let us not forget, and I think this is always very telling, in Europe, 98% of our economy is driven by small and medium-sized enterprises, not by multinationals. And yet we spend all of our time focusing on multinationals and in particular on shareholder value for multinationals. So there needs to be a total reversal in the way in which we address our economy and bring it back in order to really service people's lives and livelihoods. The over-financialization of the economy means that we don't place a value on what is most important. And most people are not even considered within today's economy, but instead it is purely a transactional relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, oh, you're getting applause here. <laughs> Uh, we can't Thank hear you. them. Uh, I, I, I applaud as well, but I've got an iPad in my hands. So it doesn't make much noise. Um, uh, but we can't hear the virtual applause from outside either. Um, Anuna, does that? Do you have a favourite indicator, or are there some indicators that that, that you think about, that, or, or could there be indicators that you would like to see? Well, I think for me, I even take like ten steps back and question who has. Who is currently even benefiting from growth in itself? Because it's not just ecological destruction, right? I've met so many communities and so many people that have never benefited from this growth in the first days. End of last year, for example, I was in South Sudan with UNICEF working with grassroots movements. And due to the climate crisis, nine out of 10 provinces in South Sudan are flooded. So there's a huge refugee crisis going on there with people losing their homes, losing cultures because they're not able to uh, to, to practice the jobs that they were doing before. Mm -hmm. There's a huge crisis going on there. And I've seen similar situations when I went into the Amazon forest working with indigenous people. And so when we're talking about growth, especially in these kinds of formats, um, I think it's extremely important to keep questioning who is benefiting from this growth. And I mm -hmm. do think that redistribution in that is extremely important. I don't think that it is the key. And I don't think that we should be pushing forward an extremely left-wing radical agenda, but we do need to look at the facts. And the facts are that there is a very small group of people that are responsible for the climate crisis, majority-wise, and that are um, benefiting most from growth. And I and I think it's important that we address that when we think when we think people like us in these kinds of formats, when we think about the indicators that that could replace GDP. Okay. Yes. Again, applause. If this was the uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, this would be done, right? 
um, we would have solved the problem immediately. Uh, we've got 28 seconds left. Um, okay, as you rightly pointed out, this has been discussed uh, quite a lot for a long time. There's been a lot of uh, attempts at new indicators of wealth. I remember the World Bank even had uh, a kind of green indicators for the Chinese economy once that they piloted that showed that China's growth would be sort of minus something if, if it had to factor in the environmental pollution at that time. And you could apply that to any economy anywhere. Uh, but that didn't last very long. What, okay, one out of 10, uh, no, scale of 10. How confident are you that this will happen? I don't mean at the conference that you're having, but that based on that conference, based on what's going on, that we could see a new indicator of wealth or a parallel one with GDP that we could test against GDP within the next, say, five to 10 years. How confident are you? <laughs> Sandri's <laughs> smiling. <laughs> I want to hear Anuna's response first. <laughs> <laughs> Sandri, I think you'll be happy to hear my response. I give it a 10 out of 10. All right. I okay. It's so fundamental that either it happens or, or it doesn't. So it is, it is going to happen because uh, I do believe that I can have a safe and, and happy future. Okay. Uh, that makes me happy. She's just made my day. I must say that I was probably slightly more pessimistic, and that's my years showing, um, between 8 and 10. And uh, I do agree. It's absolutely fundamental. I do think it's going to be a big push, but we are ripe for a change. Okay. And the conversations are there at a variety of different levels. It's a question of seizing them, and it's a question of all coming together and not confusing people. We really have to now be very clear as to what makes the most sense as we move forward with policy leaders and then explain to citizens what it is that we're actually okay. proposing. Good. And I will say on your behalf that we want everybody in the room to contact their members of the European Parliament to say that, that you mm. want your member of the European Parliament at this meeting beyond growth and also all the viewers as well. OK, thank you very much indeed thank for you. being with us. OK, bye. Thank you. Ah. So we're back again to the topic of the day, agriculture. 95% of the food we eat comes directly or indirectly from our soils, but the state of our soils is not that great. Around one third of the world's soils are already degraded and the nutrients in our food are rapidly decreasing. But this is also a question that is finally getting the attention it deserves. And as I mentioned when we had this segment just recently, the UN Climate Conference held in Egypt really rose this issue to the top of its agenda. And indeed, we saw nature-based solutions, think pollinators and bees, uh, but also many other things, uh, and sustainable agriculture, to use the broadest possible term. They came out of the shadows and they came into the sunlight as highly promising cost-effective solutions to the climate crisis, the biodiversity emergency, but also good livelihoods for farmers and rural communities, and of course, human health everywhere. So how do we scale these solutions in time? We touched on this topic earlier with a group of four people, and we're gonna hear from some more now, special guests. We're gonna hear about their unique perspectives on what can be done to actually fast track this agenda. We're gonna hear first from Dr. Stari Sprenkel Hippolyte, who's senior director, Restoration Science. She's coming from Arlington, Virginia in the United States of America. I can see her near, uh, now on the magic of Zoom. Uh, Stari, um, you're with us, yes. Uh, could we hear your, uh, your keynote, please? Yes, hello. Good evening, everyone, in beautiful Stockholm. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you virtually to talk about the exponential roadmap for natural climate solutions, kind of flesh out a few more of those climate solutions that you hinted to, and uh, specifically how it plays out in climate smart farming and grazing. So, 
sea ice. Sorry, you, yes, here we go. There's a lag. Conservation International's chief scientist, Johan Rockström, who is also at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, developed a carbon law for nature, which requires that the land sector must reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and become a 10 gigaton sink by 2050 to keep global temperature rises to 1.5 Celsius. And we developed an exponential roadmap to tell us how we can get there. It describes eight action tracks, which can deliver 13 gigatons of mitigation annually by 2030. We categorize these tracks as protecting existing carbon stocks in green, which requires partnership with indigenous people and local communities or IPLC. And then you have the pink category, which refers to managing working lands and productive forests better and restoring carbon stocks to natural landscapes is in purple. So the bottom line here is that the pink managed zone is the biggest, and it really underlines how a transformation of food systems is at the heart of natural climate solutions and is necessary to achieve about 80% of the total mitigation opportunity by 2030. We'll get more into that in a minute. I just wanted to quickly show you the geographic distribution of this natural climate solution potential. So you can see that most of the protection, which is green, opportunities can be found in the Amazon, the Congo Basin, and the Malay Archipelago. And restoration, which is purple, is smaller and it's more evenly distributed uh, across the continents in 2030 and accelerates in later decades because restoration processes take time. And the bulk of the needed change by 2030 is from this climate smart management of working lands represented by the pink areas. You can see a lot of pink up there, right? And so that's what we'll focus on today. Uh, our findings and recommendations for climate smart farming and grazing and specifically, which are the two largest potential action tracks within that pink management category. They add up to more than seven gigatons of potential annual CO2 mitigation, in part due to the fact that they, that they affect 40% of the Earth's non-ice surfaces, that is the working lands, and in part due to the fact that our, quote, modern agricultural systems are destructive and extractive. The exponential roadmap shows that improved management, again, the pink, is accountable for a vast majority, more than 75% of climate mitigation potential across the, quote, developed global north. So what do we need to do up here in the north? Shifting from extracted, extractive to regenerative systems is a theme for the roadmap in general, and it's literally the case for agricultural systems. You might have heard about regenerative farming by now, in contrast to modern industrial farming that relies heavily on chemical fertilizers and pesticides, as this cartoon illustrates. The climate smart management action tracks include many practices that are considered regenerative, from reducing soil disturbance, feeding livestock with crop residues and practicing rotational grazing, to stopping fertilizer overuse and runoff. Many of these practices stem from traditional knowledge, and they must be applied with the best technology to the best crop varieties in redesigned systems to guarantee food security and long-term yields while meeting our climate mitigation objectives. So how do we do this? I'd like to highlight for you my favorite, the highest mitigation potential agricultural land-based solution in the climate smart category trees and agricultural lands, which is at the top of the Griscom 2020 analysis of natural climate solutions potential in the tropics. While it is the vast majority of the potential in the north, the volume of the potential for the solution in the south is also quite high. It's important across the board. Now, trees and agriculture means integrating just enough trees into croplands and pastures to provide carbon and economic benefits while maintaining agricultural productivity. It includes agroforestry and silvopastoralism or trees and grazing lands. This natural climate solution has to work within our existing agricultural systems without requiring a change in what is growing where and without reducing crop yields. And there are a lot of important details to consider when applying this natural climate solution to a specific area. 
We have been asking experts from around the world who have been doing research on this topic for decades about the ideal arrangements, spacing, and optimal densities of trees for different agricultural systems in different climates without reducing yields. We asked them about trees in fields and trees around field boundaries, knowing that field edges may be easier places to add trees, especially if large farm equipment is used. Also, trees are less likely to displace agriculture if they're along the edges and can act as fencing, property boundary markers, and windbreaks at the same time. My team is developing tools to help people access carbon credits for doing this right now because we know that carbon financing can be an important uh, bridge to getting to scale. Here's a sneak peek at our latest results showing the global distribution of the potential for increased tree cover in agriculture, showing up strong in every continent, north and south. We asked our experts also what would be needed to increase the incorporation of trees on farms. And besides research, because, well, they're scientists, they cited policy development and reform and carbon crediting and verification as the next most important actions, ranking them higher than extension services or even free inputs like tree seedlings and tools. The roadmap tells us that realizing the huge climate potential within the managed category relies on actions by farmers, livestock managers, and foresters. But if governments and businesses do not urgently step up to support the people living and working on the land to improve business as usual agriculture, we won't make it. Many poli policymakers in Europe recognize the cultural and touristic value of agroforestry systems, like the Dehesa oak savannas of the Mediterranean, for instance, and have already made tools and policy reforms to support agroforestry. The United States and Canada should really consider this as we have 100-year-old windbreaks throughout Midwestern US and, and Canada that were planted after the catastrophic Dust Bowl that are dying of old age and not getting replaced. There's a similar crisis in coffee and chocolate where traditional shade-grown systems are endangered as farmers remove shade trees. We're now working on new methodologies to help farmers gain access to carbon finance to protect restore and manage carbon while continuing to produce delicious coffee and chocolate in a way that supports biodiversity. We need stakeholders from every sector to join us to meet this challenge. Please think about what role you could play and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you much indeed, Starry. Stay with us, because uh, we've got a couple of uh, uh, other guests on, a couple is uh, English speak for uh, three more guests, actually. Uh, we've got uh, Ethan uh, Soloviv, the Chief Innovation Officer at How Good. Have we got you with us, uh, Ethan? Uh, Ethan, and yes, I'm here. Oh, right. God, you're all on the screen that's right behind me, which is going to be quite fun for my neck, actually. Um, and then we've got uh, Nicola Renson. Uh, she's a, a British uh, farmer from uh, the northwestern part of uh, England. And we've got Professor Jennifer Clapp, uh, Can uh, Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security and Sustainable uh, sustainability at the University of Waterloo, and she's also with the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. Uh, can we bring them all back, uh, maybe over here? The Zoom is coming. Zoom has lost, Zoom has returned. Zoom comes again. It's like a biblical thing, isn't it? Ah, we're waiting for the second coming of Zoom, but will it come? That's, we don't really know. They're working on it. It's 30 seconds for the second coming of Zoom. But really interesting what uh, Starry was saying there. Ah, now, you're all back. Fantastic. OK, great. Fantastic to see you all. Um, I hope you heard what Starry was saying. And uh, again, this paper was uh, released, actually, at the last climate conference in, uh, in, in uh, Shamoshek in Egypt. And I really liked it. And, and I really think that the findings in this and what came out of the uh, UN climate conference there really pointed to the fact that we do have something very, very tangible right now in our hands, which, if only the policy responds properly, really gives us a running chance of at least maybe halving our emissions by 2030 in line with the targets of the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, 
Ethan, from your perspective, I mean, you're dealing a lot with, with food and what's happening in the food systems. You're tracking it quite a lot with, with how good. I mean, are you seeing actually companies at, at large and small and at different sizes starting to pick up the regenerative agriculture narrative, the sustainable agriculture narrative? It's not just picking it up. They are running with it. There are companies, I estimate, over a trillion dollars worth of revenue a year uh, that are running with regenerative agriculture and making it the, the centerpiece of their climate strategies. So this is really moving globally. Uh, and I think there's a lot of benefit to that. I think there's some pitfalls along the way we got to watch out for. But the movement towards regenerative agriculture, especially regenerative agroforestry, has huge potential. And the larger corporate companies in the world, especially in food and agriculture, Culture are definitely moving in that direction. Right. And this is why it's so positive, because often we talk here on these programs on We Don't Have Time about things that we'd like to see happen, <laughs> you know, hoping that we de deal with climate change or whatever. But this is, at the moment, a relatively po positive story, Ethan. So uh, stay with us on this. Uh, Nicola, um, we had the great pleasure of having you on our uh, show last year when we, this little show, we had three part series called Re Agriculture. And you were giving us a bit of a heads up about your journey where you, you moved as a dairy farmer from uh, what you might call an intensive dairy farming system to a regenerative one in the north of England. As a farmer, remind this audience, because it's a new audience, it's a different audience, what benefits are you actually seeing from this? Mm -hmm. And also, what, what do you need now as a dairy farmer to be able to scale this even further? Well, Nick, I'm afraid I'm a beef farmer, not a dairy farmer. I was brought up on a dairy farm. Okay, sorry, we, beef farmer, yeah. <laughs> so so we, we produce, um, as Dari was saying, 100% um, rotationally grazed uh, grass-fed beef. And we also have chickens that follow the, the cows around on rotation. But the benefits, um, we've been in this system now for um, nearly 10 years, and it's just it's like a snowball. Things just quietly get better and better and better. The soil improves, the biodiversity comes back, you hold more water. It, it really is a win-win. And also, most importantly for us, it's it's financially, it's better, hugely better because you just, well, you don't, you have less bills and you, we're not at all reliant on fossil fuels. Right. Because so, yeah. you're not really we're, reliant on the fossil fuel fertilizers. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're not, yeah, we're, we're not organic, but we don't, um, we don't use any fertilizer. The ruminants don't have any uh, feed. So it's just, a, it's, a, it's a completely different way of farming, but it's from a farmer's point of view, it's all in the mind. You've got to change your mindset and then it all goes from there. Yeah, this is what's so interesting because this is the, the potential win-win for the farmer as well. That they're, they're, they're not so dependent on inputs, which cost money and can be subject to the vagaries of, of, of oil prices, etc. Um, Jennifer, uh, coming in from Canada, uh, an economist, a world expert on food security. Are you seeing any reflection in the way food systems are evolving to reflect the sustainability as a security measure? Thank you. Uh, great to be here. And yes, definitely. Um, our discussions around food security are increasingly understanding that sustainability is a dimension of food security. Um, and we, if we if we don't consider it that way in the long run, we won't we won't be able to feed everyone a healthy and adequate diet into the long future. Uh, but it's it's also about uh, agency agency of farmers of individuals to have a say. Uh, in how they relate to food systems uh, to be able to um, basically shape systems in, in ways that serve their own needs. And these are two dimensions of food security that we're seeing increasingly being discussed on top of the traditional ones. I mean, the traditional ones are things like uh, availability, meaning how much food is produced, access, making sure everyone can afford uh, to access, able to access food and, and affordably, uh, as well as stability, making sure markets are stable uh, as well as utilization, that's referring to nutrition. So we have this sort of six dimensional way that we're increasingly talking about food security, but definitely sustainability is one of them and it's a central, it's a central pillar. Yeah. Now, um, Ethan, in, I, I've heard from you before uh, about, there are some numbers uh, uh, going around, aren't there, on how much of land uh, or agricultural land is broadly under this term regenerative or something similar to it 
Can you remember where we are? I mean, because the funny thing is, uh, most of today has been how wonderful the European Union is in terms of new laws on circular economies and end of life uh, motor cars and all kinds of things. But it's North America and Latin America that's far ahead, isn't it, right now on regenerative agriculture? Look, there's a lot moving in regenerative agriculture. All, the numbers are not solid anywhere, but we know that more than 30 million acres have been committed to regenerative agriculture through companies like General Mills, like Danone, like PepsiCo, the big players in the world who have committed funding. Recently, PepsiCo, hundreds of millions committed to funding more regenerative agriculture in their supply system. So 30 million acres there. There are some estimates that say from the Sustainable Markets Initiative uh, that said that up to 15% of the land in the world is currently using some form of practice, no-till or cover cropping, I wouldn't call these necessarily the depth of regenerative agriculture. And there's just a new video out today from Kiss the Ground that is really worth seeing that reminds us the roots of regenerative agriculture in indigenous cultures and communities around the world. And so there's a way to say, actually, there was once and could again be a very large percentage of the Earth's surface that has the benefits that Nick was speaking to, biodiversity, enhanced livelihoods, increased carbon in the soil and enhance food security through engaging with those indigenous roots of regenerative agriculture. Yeah. Nick, I mean, when, when we talked last year about this, I mean, you and your husband, when you made this switch, what, 10 years ago to beef, not dairy, <laughs> um, <laughs> you went through a big dip in your income at the beginning, didn't you? And, and was that I not a bit scary? And couldn't this move a lot faster in... Um, different communities in the UK where you are, but in other parts of the world, if there was some support for farmers for that first three or four years when the soil is starting to recover from years of being hit by chemicals? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit like um, coming off drugs, if, if you are on drugs. <laughs> so it's like a three-year, um, it took us three years. We, we went cold turkey with the fertilizer, which maybe isn't the best thing to do. And it, yeah, it took three years to kind of come out the other side. Um, and yeah, we would never ever go back to using fertilizer now. It's it's just not. Um, but yeah, support to get through that that period would have been really helpful. Um, and and I think, you know, we're obviously talking a lot about regen today. But when, when I look at all our neighbours surrounding us, hardly any of them are farming like we are. So there's a long way to go. Huge yeah. long way to go. Yeah, but some support mechanisms could take it further. Yeah. Um, Jennifer, um, give us a bit more uh, your perspective on this as well. I mean, um, I mean, I know that you're looking at the global thing, but but I mean, how's Canada doing on this? Well, I'm not an expert on Canada, even though. Okay, I'm all right. That's his brother lives will, in Canada. He's always watching the show. <laughs> he wants to know how Canada's doing. But anyway. Well, I mean, I can speak. I can speak to that because Canada's a big agricultural export nation. And um, some of the issues and problems I see in the food system that need to change in order for regenerative and, and agroecological agriculture to really take off um, is to address some of the layers of concentration that we have in the food system. And we have that concentration what, at the field level, meaning you know like what Stari was, was speaking about. There's, but there's a concentration of crops that we just rely on a few staple crops to feed most of the people around the world. Rice, wheat, wheat, maize, and soy account for around two thirds of human diets. So we need a more diverse production within farm fields um, and, it, and it needs to be produced sustainably. But it, that kind of concentrated production at the field level is connected to another layer of concentration at the national or country level where we have just a handful of countries producing most of these four staple crops that are feeding you know, much of the world. And so just five countries account for over 70% of the exports of rice, wheat, maize, and soy. And other countries have become dependent because the concentrated production is often um, done at huge scale and then sometimes it's subsidized and it undercuts small scale producers uh, in developed countries. So it creates this concentration. So we really need to expand the range of countries that are producing crops as well as the crops themselves. We need to have more diversity in terms of markets, in terms of production, et cetera. And then the, a third layer is the concentration at the global market level where we have just a few transnational corporations controlling much of the trade uh, in these, these staple crops and, uh -huh. and they're doing so on highly financialized markets. So again, we need to bring diversity at all of these scales if we really wanna 
create a situation where regenerative agriculture can, can how, take off. How, how, how the devil did that happen? Oh, that's a great I question. I mean, just briefly, <laughs> briefly. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm writing a, a book on it. I, don't ask that question. No, it's, this is a process that has been taking place for nearly 200 years. It's been a really long transition towards this global integrated market, towards uh, industrial production to feed that globally integrated market. And so we don't have another 200 years to transition away from it. We've got to come up with solutions now, but we should also not be fooling ourselves that it's going to happen overnight, but we need to create situations where mm -hmm. there's incentives for producers, for national governments, for corporations to have a more diverse uh, ecosystem of food systems so that we can move forward and be sustainable into the long future. Uh -huh. Nick, Nick can I, can yeah, I sorry, jump in come on in, this? Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I really want to underline what Jennifer's saying, because it's so right on the diversity at that, those three levels. How good is a sustainability data company? And we're actually working on a new index that's around that diversity, especially uh -huh. on the crop and ingredient level. And with the global biodiversity framework that came in, that's coming into force now, that's a huge uh -huh. moment for the world, very connected and even stronger than what happened at COP for climate. I think the focus on biodiversity coming up is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's inside of that, the capability to help with with the dip that Nick was talking about. And so I feel like now there's more and more actors. The Sustainable Markets Initiative is pulling together banks, insurers, CPGs, farmers to figure out how do we, on the business case side, make that first three year dip, that first three to five years, and kind of fill up that gap so it becomes irresistible for farmers to move into regenerative and agroecological approaches. Yeah. Yeah, coming to you, Nick, I mean, as you say, a lot of the neighbours around you um, maybe haven't gone the same way that you've gone. Uh, but you're in a network in the UK, aren't you, of, of other farmers who are moving in that direction or have moved in that direction. Um, does it seem like, as you say, there's a long way to go or, or is it moving exponentially? Could it one day be... Could the UK one day be the regenerative agriculture hub of Europe and then we'll all be proud of something rather than being miserable about <laughs> leaving the EU? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be good, eh? Um, I, well, so, so, so I'm part of a group called Nature Friendly Farming Network, which is a group of farmers from all over the country, all different types of farmers, all kind of wanting to go in the same direction. And, and I think... Um, as Ethan was saying, it's when, when you're on this, you've got a three-year journey, you need to surround yourself during that time with um, people who are going to say, don't give up, keep going. So the whole kind of farmers learning from farmers, um, we have a conference here we do called Carbon Calling, which is similar to Groundswell in the south of England. Um, it's it's creating um, an, your own network and your own support system because it's not easy. It's not, it's not easy going against the grain and and there isn't, um, it involves watching a lot of YouTube and reading a lot of books, and there's nothing that comes in a bottle or a bag, <laughs> which isn't, isn't how farmers have farmed for the last 70 years. Right, right, right. And is there some policy that, that you think could move it quickly? Is it as simple as a support mechanism for switching, or is there more that could be done by a typical European government? I, I think we need to look at the true cost of food. So when you go to the supermarket and you buy a chicken four pound here, what, what is the actual cost of that of, of that to the um, to the environment to people's health? Uh, we've got this stat in this country where in 1950 one percent of the population was obese, and now it's 30 percent, nearly 30 percent of the population. Mm -hmm. So there's all these th these figures which I cannot understand why government can't um, recognise. Um, the, the danger we're, we're, we're kind of walking, sleepwalking into. So I think it's government, but I think on a smaller local level, we'll always have the big ag businesses, but on a, on a, on a local and regional level, if, if I want to, um, say, produce chicken to eat here and have it um, processed locally, it is impossible to do that. You, you, there's, no, there's no rules for micro businesses. Right. So, so little, little things like that would help. Um, local abattoirs, there hardly is any at all. So it's everything is geared to big ag, and and that is an impossible um, hurdle to overcome. Right. Just coming, Jennifer. Um, coming back to you on this. Um, 
I mean, food security means one thing in Canada and North America and, and Europe, but it means something else if you're in, you know, the Sudan or, or somewhere else like that. I mean, there, if you, if you take the risk to switch your method of agriculture production and it goes wrong, then your entire community starves to death, you know, uh, or starves very seriously. And that's a, a different kind of security issue in the sense to, to maybe what we have in Europe. So. Do you get a sense that, that, that there is enough support for those small-scale farmers in, in poorer countries to try something new? Uh, or is this... Well, yeah. Sorry, please. Yeah. Go. No, thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. I mean, first, first to say um, there's an international food trade system. And while it has some problems, I think it will always be needed to fill in gaps when there are local crises that can, that can happen in terms of a climate event or, or conflict or, or, you know, other sorts of disruptions we've seen recently. Um, but at the same time, there are many, many small scale farmers in uh, less industrialized countries, many farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, who are clamoring to switch their agricultural production systems to more regenerative and agroecological uh, practices because it's it's less expensive. They would be less reliant on these large uh, input companies, and you know if they don't have to purchase fertilizer from from foreign companies, then then they're going to be saving money. Um, and there are all sorts of initiatives and efforts working towards spreading uh, farmer to farmer networks to spread um, information about how you make this kind of transition. But definitely, many of these countries are also highly indebted. Uh, they're in a difficult situation right now with rising interest rates. There needs to be more effort to connect the debt problem with food systems to provide debt relief, um, more foreign assistance for transition to agroecology and other sorts of sustainable agriculture, rather than sending, you know, food aid uh, on ships to, to address the problem. We need mm -hmm. to build resilience domestically within within these countries. Let's go back to Stari, uh, who has been listening to everything that uh, Jennifer and Ethan and, and Nick has been saying. Um, and um, g give us give us some of your comments on what you've heard, uh, Stari, and uh, and also where do we go here f with this massive agenda? Yeah, well, I mean, it's just so amazing to have uh, you on the panel, Nick, and to hear from you about your experience, that real lived experience. Are, uh, it's wonderful. And, and um, that's part of it, as we say, and as we are trying to start to, to do as well, is um, working with the people, understanding the people on the land that, that have to do this hard work to make these changes. Um, you know, uh, the regenerative change, getting off of the fertilizers, getting off of that drug is so hard. Um, I think that in a sense, the, the trees and agriculture addition might be simpler in some ways. It should be part of a, a holistic plan for the farm, of course, but, um, you know, we're enthusiastic about being able to hopefully scale the uh, agroforestry quickly, um, as it's a traditional practice. Um, but there still are a lot of, um, hurdles to get over. Um, there's actually, uh, you know, some of it has to do with policy reform. Subsidy reform has been done in Europe um, that I think really leads the way. There are, you know, to recognize uh, farms with trees on them that are still working farms and to not penalize farms for having trees on their landscape. It was a huge step and very important and has to be done in, in other countries as well. And, you know, just reforming the actual subsidies that are already in place um, is uh, could have a huge impact for regenerative farming as well. Um, but yeah, um, you know, I, I wish I could dig into what trees you have on your farm, Nick. Maybe another time, um, and uh, and why and what what they're doing for you. But I uh, really appreciate being a part of the panel and. Um, can echo a lot of what Ethan has said. Um, you know, we also work with corporate partners and are, and are trying to think about um, the the ways to ramp up regenerative agriculture uh, in many value chains right now. So it is an exciting time to be doing this. There is so much interest on on all sides, really. I mean, Jennifer, thank you so much for representing Canadian government here too. So um, we, you know, we're all in this and. Um, 
just want to keep on pushing. We don't have time. So keeping on pushing. Well, I also want to say that how many people on this panel would vote that one cool thing uh, might, because we got Frankie the Dinosaur from the UNDP fossil fuel campaign on, uh, not right now, but uh, I think it's tomorrow. In fact, he even has a party here on Wednesday. What about if we just like phase out at least half of the fossil fuel subsidies right now and give them to farmers? That would be at least 450 billion right now or 400 billion dollars straight away. Ethan's nodding his head, says yes. Jennifer, could, we, could you get behind that? Uh, Nick? Great. And, and yeah, sorry too. So we've solved the problem immediately. And, and I think that's fantastic news. OK, thank you very much to everybody for being on this. It was really interesting. You were all interesting. And this audience here, I think, uh, let's give them a big uh, round of applause. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce a guest who is not only an acclaimed Hollywood actor, but also an ambassador for We Don't Have Time. And I'm sure that a lot of our viewers here will know who this person is when I mention the name uh, to this live audience. It's a message from Peter Stormara. Now, I know if I said that in the Swedish way, it would be better, but he also says it sometimes in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in English English. Uh, but yeah, Peter, uh, where is he with his uh, message to this audience? Just having problems with the sound, they're just fixing it right now. But how many people here know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Yay, yay, yay. What's, what's his best film? <laughs> what? Does everybody agree? Yeah. Okay. Isn't he a bit of a pop star as well? Does he, doesn't he do a bit of music? Ah. And right, I can stop talking now because now we've got sound. Okay, let's go to Peter. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this great meeting tonight, arranged, but we don't have a time organization, which I'm a proud ambassador for. And I also welcome everybody online that is attending this very important event. And I'm very sorry, I, I should have been there tonight and perform for you live, but you know, you plan life and something else happens. I'm an actor and for actors, we are like working for the fire brigade, the phone calls and you dragged somewhere else. But I should have been there tonight and I'm sorry I can't be there because I would have performed two songs for you, two songs by a band that originated in England, in Sheffield, England. And the band was called Ramesses. And in the mid seventies, I heard their first album called Space Hymns. And it spoke right into my heart. I played that record over and over again until I could hear the flip side on the, you know, the right side and the right side on the flip side. And Ramesses consisted of two people, a girl and a guy. And they called themselves Ramesses, but their original name was Barrington and Dorothy. But they took on the name Ramesses for the guy, and the girl was called Selkut. They shaved their heads in the tradition of the Egyptians, pharaohs, and they were very, very much into spiritualism and mysticism, but most of all, they were so aware of the situation of the earth and the pain the earth was going through in the mid seventies. They were a duo that spoke for environmental awareness. 
And you have to understand now it's 2023. I was a young kid in the mid 70s. And we shouldn't forget what the hip has really done. And today, I feel ashamed sometimes when we look back at the 70s and we only see like Woodstock, and we see people smoking pot and we see people just hanging out, doing nothing, picking up, you know, checks from the government and just hang out in the countryside with some goats and cows and dogs and horses. That was not true. In the mid 70s, we were very aware that mother nature was bleeding. The earth was suffering, especially from pollution. Even the small village I came from, the sewage went right out into the rivers, into the lakes. The smoke from factories was horrendous. It was hard to breathe sometimes because the smokestacks let out carbon dioxide beyond imagination. And without that movement that Ramesses originated in England and it spread like wildfire all over Europe, at least Europe, for me, that was the place. We never had tickets or money to fly elsewhere, but Europe was very important and Europe was suffering. It was so dirty wherever you went in, in Europe at that time. So in to commemorate the memory of Ramesses and Selkut and the band that started, for me at least, an awareness for Mother Earth and the pain and suffering she was going through. And it echoes to the audience of today. And you out there, who's attending this meeting, online or in person, remember what we did in the mid 70s, because this is a call for a younger generation. And people, you know, in political positions, they laugh and say, oh, well, the kids are, yeah, they're kids. When they grow older, they, they become, you know, mercantile and very much aware of just money and they don't care about the environment. Might be true, I don't know, but I'm still very concerned about Mother Earth, and it started in the mid-70s, and it's an ongoing process. And for me, that's old now. I really urge every one of you that is young to take this into your heart, because it's very, very important. Because... Among the young generation, you have power, you have the strength and the stamina that the old people kind of lack, like me. And our politicians are usually all the people. They are in position of doing decisions that can be altered by young people. And I have to quote John Lennon, also a mid-70s guy, when he said, if you want to change something, you can't just sit on a couch and throw beer bottles at the TV and say, those fucking politicians, get the fuck out of my TV. If you want to change something, you can do it by become active in your community, among your friends in school or in your working place, and spread the message of awareness of Mother Nature and the suffering and pain she's going through today. I hoped we would have come much further with the movement that started in the 70s, but we haven't. And you might know me as a bad guy because I'm an actor. I've been in a lot of movies. I've done a lot of bad guys, and there are a lot of bad guys. But, well, there's a saying in Hollywood, it takes a really good guy to do a bad guy. That means you need a really good actor to do a baddie, and all of us wants to do baddies. We don't want to be Prince White, it's boring. But also in my, when I was thinking about this, is it, it takes a bad guy to do a good guy. And all of a sudden I ended up with politicians today. They are bad guys pretending to be good guys. They listen, but they don't do anything. But with you, the young generation, you can make your voices heard, protest, be there, 
and send emails, do whatever. But if you don't do anything, nothing will happen. And there are so many of us that are fighting for the good cause, but we need your strength and we need your stamina because you are young and you can do this 24 hours screaming, you know, I can't do it anymore. But I'm there with you and I'm a proud ambassador for this great movement called We Don't Have Time. We Don't Have Time. So I'm linking it back to Ramesses, the duo from Sheffield, England, who started it all for me and a lot of people in Europe, the awareness of Mother Earth together with spirituality. Because if we seek the light in life, we have to fight. It doesn't come, you know, for free. It doesn't come. It needs a fight. And the fight is to raise the torch and say, this has to be done. Something has to be done. We started it in mid-70s and we succeeded. The lakes are clean up in my home county. The rivers are working again. And it takes time and effort. But I'm happy that we don't have time. It's doing this because without these events, nothing would happen. And sometimes today, a young generation has the struggles and the problems that we had in the mid 70s. And I'm a little bit ashamed, as I said before, because when I look at documentaries, you know, and television series, how it was back in the 70s, they have lost all the political awareness. But we did change a lot and we cleaned up Europe. It was impossible to go to London in the mid 70s. You had to have a mask because you would choke from all the horrible cold firing that was going on in London. Germany, the same. Spain, Portugal, all was contaminated. The oceans were dying in the mid 70s too. But we started a revolution and the revolution is still going on thanks to we don't have time. I'm grateful to be here <laughs> over the web. Thank God we didn't have that in the 70s, but we did it anyway. Now, I think it's easier because we have this technology and with the technology, we can achieve so much more. So let's continue the fight. And the song is a song that me and Selkit re-recorded. Unfortunately, the band Ramesses, they disappeared in the mid 70s too, because Ramesses died and Selkit became a farmer and she kept up the good thing. She grew organic food and she raised horses, sheep, cattle in a very, very different way, free range. And she did that in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and she continues still. She's now in her 80s, but we re-recorded some of their big songs from the mid 70s. And here is one song. I'm sorry, I can't be there performing, but enjoy this song. And you can take this song in two ways, according to Selkut. It's also a middle finger, a birdie to our politicians and the people in power that doesn't do what they're supposed to do. But it can also be interpreted as Mother Earth is crying out and saying, screw you to us human beings for not taking care of the miracle she really is. So thank you from Peter Stormare in Los Angeles, West Hollywood, in California. Enjoy this song. Enjoy the rest of the evening. God bless you all and continue the fight. I'm there still, even if I'm hitting 70s soon, but I'm still there. And I've done this since the mid 70s. Now it's your turn, but I'm still there. Thank you.
If there was a bit of anger and uh, a bit of frustration in uh, Peter's message, uh, we'll now invite a guest up on stage who has a very optimistic view on our common future. Let me welcome on stage uh, Matthias Sunden, co-founder and executive chairman of the Warp Institute Foundation. Matthias, come over here. Do you want to do it from this little podium here? I think that might be quite cool. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here um, and um, at home or wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is uh, Matthias Sundin. Um, I'm uh, the founder of the Warp Institute and editor-in-chief of Warp News. And we write fact-based optimistic news on technology, science and uh, human progress. So before that, I used to be in politics. I was a member of uh, the Swedish parliament. And as a member of parliament, you get to meet a lot of people. And I made sure I met the people, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, people with big projects, big ideas for the future. So I got to visit them and got to meet them, the scientists and all those people. And they told me about all their innovations, all their new ideas, all their projects. Uh, and I felt a growing optimism. All the time I met them, I felt more and more and more and more optimistic. And then, you know, when you come back from a meeting or from a visit, you, you Google and you want to learn more about whatever you've been talking about. And I often ended up in, in the news media reading about it. But I couldn't find the possibilities there. I only found the problems there. Well, only negative headlines and pessimism. And, and sure, we should absolutely think about those things, but we shouldn't let the problems and, and, and that overwhelm all the opportunities because we might miss a lot of opportunities. So at the same time as I got more and more optimistic, I first got more and more frustrated and then angry and then really pissed. I turned sort of into an angry optimist and I felt I have to do something about this. So I quit politics and uh, uh, I started this uh, foundation, the Warp Institute, uh, a nonprofit. And what we do, we try to make the future come sooner by creating a community for optimistic, forward-looking people from all over the world. And we're over 50,000 people now from, from all over the world. Because we think that the future is created by optimists. And uh, this is our uh, most read article ever uh, on Warp News uh, by Kevin Kelly, the founder of a Wired magazine. In it, he argues why the future is mostly created by optimists. It's also a great uh, TED talk if you want to watch that. Um, we also have a, um, a project, a uh, climate-related project, Project Energy Society, uh, with Swedish internet uh, pioneer Jonas Bidison. We think if we combine renewable energy with battery storage, and especially if we share that, share that um, with each other, uh, we can build a society where we have an abundance of energy, super clean energy, but also um, super cheap energy, but also super clean um, energy. Uh, we think that is possible to move into that society, uh, which we call the energy society. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, what we call the optimist's edge. The edge you have if you have a fact-based optimistic view of the world. Because when you look at human progress, for example, um, extreme poverty and other things, very important things in the world. Most people thinks, think that they are getting worse when they're actually getting better. And people think that about most things. If something is becoming a lot cheaper, they think it's getting more expensive. So if you look behind the headlines and you look at the facts, uh, you can get the optimist edge. Because there, if you s understand something that most people don't understand, you find a lot of opportunities. And I think there's a lot of opportunities like that uh, with climate change and solving um, climate change. So I'm going to tell you about three of the people I've, I've met uh, recently that are doing things in, uh, to solve climate change, um, but they have something in common that is uh, in, important to understand uh, what's going on uh, right now. But I, I tell you about uh, the three uh, people first. So this is uh, Penilla. She is the founder of Petgood. So she was um, an investment banker uh, for, for a few years, but she felt an increasing sort of urge to do something uh, about climate change, to do something in sustainability. But she was thinking about it, she didn't know what. Uh, but then she got a dog, uh, the dog here, uh, Siri. And when she, of course, then she started buying food for the dog and she started thinking about that dog food. Um, and she, she looked into that and she found out that having a dog if you have a dog, that's sort of the same climate impact as having a fossil-fueled car. 
if the dog eats meat-based dog food. So, of course, she started this company um, and developed uh, a new type of dog food that is based on insects with much lower climate impact, also other uh, nutritious values, values for, um, for the dog. William Berry, um, he also felt that he wanted to do something about climate change, but he didn't know exactly what. He started an education to do something in, in solar technology or maybe wind technology. Then he moved into um, battery storage. But his, he understood, okay, many people are already here solving a lot of these problems. But he found another problem, and that was the recycling of um, batteries from electric cars. There are sellers out there, there are buyers out there, but there's really no place for them to trade. There's no real price, there's no marketplace. So he's creating that marketplace so we can recycle uh, uh, batteries from EVs. Eslan Salam uh, has been, uh, he's from Egypt, um, Egypt and uh, his family has been in the food business there for forever. Um, then he came to Sweden uh, to study and he started to learn about sustainability and, and climate change and also, he also felt, maybe I should do something, what, what could I do? And one, one day when he was making um, some snacks for his friends, he, re he came up with this idea because he was making lupin snacks out of lupin beans. And he realized this could replace soybeans because soybeans in, in part, some parts of the world are uh, responsible for some deforestation. Um, and it also has also great nutritional value. And we can grow it here in Sweden and in, and in Europe, for example. So he started Lupinta and is making food out of lupin uh, beans. So these three people have something in common. They um, started thinking about sustainability, started thinking really about climate change a few years ago, five, ten years ago. They had an increasing urge to do something, but they, it took a while for them to figure out what they should do. And when they figured out what they should do, that meant maybe a new education, a new career, start a company, and all that. All that takes time. But I think in and, and those companies now are very young, so they have little impact right now. But I think as they grow, give them another 10 years or so, as they grow in the early 2030s, something like that, we're suddenly we're going to be experiencing over and over again the feel that, wow, where did all this come from? Here's someone solving this problem, and here's someone taking a stab, a huge stab at this problem as part of the whole sustainability and, and climate change. There's, suddenly you feel, wow, I didn't see this coming. No, because they're tiny now. And it takes time to change like this. And we should absolutely have started this journey much earlier, at least a few decades, a couple of decades earlier, definitely. But it's going on now. These three people represent millions of people with projects, with companies, uh, with ideas like this. So I think we should be inspired by them. We should, of course, not sit back and, and feel like, oh, yeah, now everything is solved. It, of course it's not. So, but there's a, there's a, a climate, uh, there's, a, there's a tsunami of, of, of climate solutions coming. And you know a tsunami wave out at sea in the ocean, you don't see it, it looks like any, any wave. But when it comes into shore, uh, it's huge. And that's what's happening right now. So they, they used really the optimist edge. They looked at a problem and they saw opportunities in there. They saw an opportunity to solve part of the problem to do something meaningful, impactful in, in their lives, but also to start a company. Uh, but you don't have to start a company. It could be an organization like We Don't Have Time or Warp Institute. It could be research. Whatever it is that you're interested in, we have to change all of society. So there are many, many opportunities in there. And if you only look at the problems here and you, you get stuck there, you get depressed and you think, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. No one, no one is doing anything about this. But a lot of people are doing a lot about it. And Big problems means big opportunities. Climate change is a huge problem, but also means there's a huge opportunity, or rather thousands of big opportunities within climate change to help solve the problem, but also do something meaningful uh, in your life. So thank you very much for um, listening, and uh, uh, to the future. Matthias, that was... Yeah, give them a big hand, right? And a big virtual hand from all the viewers. Thank you very much indeed. That was Thank very you. inspiring and very interesting. So now I'm going to hand over to our dear friends, our partners at the United Nations Development Program for the final session of the day with uh, my dear friends, well, Katerina. So come on down.
Welcome to the first of three UNDP sessions here at Stockholm Climate Week. We'll be hearing more about research that's being done in the area of climate economics and the behavioral aspects of climate policy more broadly. Looking at knowledge as a key driver of change, we'll be diving into various ways to achieve sustainable development. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce our panel for this session. I'd like to start with introducing Sonia Tan. Estonia is, of course, a fantastic uh, member of working with UNDP. And um, you are uh, from UNDP's global campaign. Um, and you, you've been working with the Don't Choose Extinction campaign. Sonia, please take a seat in the sofa. And the aim of this uh, campaign is, of course, to change the narrative about fossil subsidies. Wonderful to have you here, Sonia. It's also, I also have the pleasure of introducing two notable scientists that will be joining Sonia here on the sofa. Osa Lovgen is an associate professor at the Department of Economics, University of Gothenburg, a resources for the future and university fellow and visiting professor at the Lulio Institute, the University, sorry, of Technology. So please join us, Osa. And also we have with us, joining us here, Sva Svaka Jos Karlsson Jägers, professor in political science at University of Gothenburg, Senstrom Professor of Climate Change Leadership at Uppsala University, and director of Center for Collective Action Research. So please join us also here, Sverker, and take a seat uh, in the sofa. So, you go ahead and I'll join you in one of the, in one of the armchairs. Um, so, Sacker, actually, I'm going to start with what I think. Um, you've done extensive research on the economic perspectives of uh, climate change and also investor behavior in firms. And you've done it in order to advise states and also companies and individuals in their decision making. So, could you please tell us some more about your work as a researcher? Yeah, so very briefly, uh, I'm an economist. And I have been working with climate-related research for 20 plus years. Uh, so my main focus has been on how you create incentives for firms to invest in clean technology, and also how we incentivize people to change behavior. Um, and that's a lot of focus on policy instruments then. Uh, also, I work interdisciplinary, that's how I met Sverker. Mm -hmm. So we work on collective action research, which we will talk about today. Uh, I also, I'm very engaged and I'm really interested in providing support to, to policy decisions. So I've been part of the Swedish Climate Policy Council and I serve in various boards and try to be sort of there to provide evidence-based research. Exciting job indeed. Mm. Thank you for, for joining us here. So, Sveka, your research focuses on environmental politics, and you try to explain uh, people's acceptance of policy measures, and also people's role in achieving sustainable development, and well, of course, also climate justice. So, how do you see the role of collective action? Because this is what we touched upon many times during this, this broadcast here today, in reaching our goals. Collective act action, yeah, yeah. the importance. Um, well, the, the role is absolutely crucial. Mm. So, uh, challenges like sustainable development in various aspects of that, not to speak of climate change, uh, are huge coordination problems. Mm. There are so many different actors that contribute to the problem and who are affected by the problem. And often there is no symmetry between those who are causing and those who are affected. Uh, so the incentives for those who are causing but not uh, being negatively affected, um, the incentives for them to change behavior is, is minor, unless certain factors are provided. Um, and even if we break down climate change down to national sort of policy challenges, you still have large coordination uh, dilemmas or coordination mm -hmm. problems that need to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that having that understanding of these problems also makes it easier to understand why policies are needed, why politics is so crucial. 
And uh, that also opens up for, for thinking about how different policies can be designed, depending on where in the world they are supposed to, to be uh, exercised. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Svecker. Sonia, you've been working with the, the UNDP campaigns for a while now. And of course, in 2021, you, you launched the fantastic uh, campaign that most of you probably saw already. At least more than 2.2 billion people watched the Don't Choose Extinction campaign. And it's still going strong. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how a global climate campaign like this uh, how we can work on influencing people's behaviors, because that was, of course, the incentive of, of starting this fantastic campaign. Yes, um, absolutely. So it's really vital at this point of climate emergency that we galvanize as many people as possible to take action. So if we end up doing our jobs well in the campaign team, we create awareness. Mm. And that is the first step to connecting with people and influencing behaviors. But for people to take action, they need to understand and relate to what we're saying. So there's a difference between, for example, putting a report out there with data that forecasts, um, I don't know, the end of the world scenario, and with motivating people to actually do something about it. So we need to make this information kind of um, accessible and relatable meaning we need people to enter the conversation, to get involved, to take some responsibility. It doesn't really matter what action they take. They just need to do something. They could discuss it with their peers, or they could, I don't know, switch off the lights when they leave the room, or support initiatives at their schools and communities. It's fine. Um, but we need to galvanize people to a point where everybody is taking action. And with uh, Don't Choose Extinction, basically Frankie the Dino, you know, he escapes the asteroid because uh, he's napping and taking a little siesta in his cave. But the message is really clear. Humanity has a choice in determining their own future. So Sonia, the campaign is quite a novel way of, of reaching an audience. Just the, the video of Frankie uh, speaking at the, uh, the, the UN, for instance. It's, it's really a way of addressing these topics in a different way. Um, so uh, could you add something about, more about why you chose this way? Because it's, it's really fantastic and the, just the reach of 2.2 billion people. Um, well, yes, it's quite different to sort of um, have a campaign that looks at the world through our eyes of the dinosaur. Sometimes I think we need to step back a little bit and mm -hmm. detach to be able to see an overview. That's mm -hmm. one thing. And also, it's a message that people can relate to, and it's simple enough to understand. So there's no point having a super complicated message that sort of goes at, through everybody else, over everybody else's head. I think... A dinosaur, I mean, who doesn't like dinosaurs? Like, mm. I think every little kid has played with dinosaurs. We even have some dinosaurs here on the table. Oh, there you go. You've got <laughs> dinosaurs right there, right in theme with uh, the campaign. Mm. So it's just something that has entered everybody's head. And with a powerful message like that, I think it reaches more people. It doesn't have to, a message doesn't have to be negative um, to get across. So I think it's about sort of reaching people without... Um, let's say, discouraging them, mm. yet creating awareness. Mm. Well, thank you, Sonia. So, also, as Fakka, you've been also been working with the novel of idea of, of a game. We're going to watch it very, very shortly. But before we do this, I'd like to go back to you, Svaka, and ask you a bit, to elaborate a bit more about the collective action here. Because this is really, I mean, the Dino campaign sort of pushes us to act collectively. So what, what are your reflections on, on collective action and how, do, can we, can, how can we get into that mode of collective action? Yeah, that's a, a tricky thing. Mm. It's that's a million really, dollar question. It really is. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. we can find the keys for this, um, that's pretty much uh, many of the solutions of mm. the challenges and coordination problems I mentioned. Um, so collective action problems is basically um, a conflict between individuals short-term interests and uh, the collective's longer-term interests. Mm -hmm. And I always gain more by overusing a resource, whether it's the climate or it's fish in the ocean or if it's tax, my, my tax money. Um, so I always gain more by not cooperating with others. Mm 
to fish as much as possible or pollute as much as possible, as long as no one else is doing this. Uh, the problem is that if I do this, most likely all others will adopt the same behavior, and then we earn less than if we had cooperated in the first place. And this is what we've seen a lot of people yeah, yeah. doing in industries. Constantly, etc. constantly. Yes, yes, yes. We see this everywhere, even in the, the, the joint laundry room, mm -hmm. uh, this behavior. So it's, it's a very natural sort of uh, behavior for humans. Mm. And uh, if there are no guarantees that others will change behavior simultaneously, more or less, with me, I have very few reasons to, to uh, change my behavior myself, because then I risk ending up as a loser or sucker, as it's called in, in the literature, mm. uh, where everyone continues overusing while I sort of earn less by not overusing. So to, have, to get these guarantees and to see what happens when we are uh, incentivized to, to act collectively. Uh, I think that's sort of the, the founding idea of this game and, and also the idea that by experiencing uh, collective action, by experiencing if we don't cooperate, then what happens compared to if we cooperate mm -hmm. and also by being able to add on various policies we can actually see, uh, or those who are part of the gamification can actually see what, what function a policy has. Mm. And, yeah. mm. So let's, well, you said gamification, and also you're gonna, we're going to get let the go game roll uh, behind us any, any second here. But before we do this, please tell us more about the game that you have been working on. Can we have it in the background? Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so just to give you a flavor of the game, so we are very happy to be able to talk a bit about this project, which is about learning. Um, so we developed a game which is primarily for students, youth between 12 and 18 years old. And the game setting is an island. Students play in groups of five, and they are randomly assigned a house and a fishing boat. And what's unique with the game is that it has these collective action features. So each student has the possibility of pursuing their own interests and games by going out to fish and then go back, sell the fish and go to a market and, and buy things. So basically they can, yeah, so here is a it shows shows on the screen. Uh, they can improve the house or buy a bigger boat to fish more. Uh, at the same time, they have a common resource. So that's the fish stock. So if they overfish, the fish stock will be de depleted and there will be no individual gains anymore from, from fishing. And this also means in practice in the game that the, it's game over, basically. Oh. We will see an example of that. Uh, so one important feature of the game is the feedback. So it runs over several fishing days and students get information about the status of the fish stock, if it's starting to go down, uh, and also gets a lot of feedback on how the other students in the group react. And that connects to what Sverke said. Mm -hmm. So they can see, you know, at the fish market, if their fellow students have been fishing more or less than they have. So another important feature is that the game run in segments, which means that at the end of such a segment, the instructor or the uh, teacher can pause the game and interact with the student. So this is a very important part. And then we provide simple graphs and students can discuss the results and compare between, within the group and also between the groups. And what's really special, we think, is that each segment you can actually implement a policy. So you can play the game and then look what happens. Maybe the fish, the fish is depleted. And they get to discuss policies and, for example, implement a fishing quota. And after each segment, the students discuss what happened with this policy, etc. So we hope that the game is designed uh, to make learning fun at the same time as they actively engaged and explore and 
experience collective action uh, through this engagement, much of what you were into also. Mm. But if I may, um, just uh, to increase learning and uh, support the teacher also, we believe that to provide this knowledge, we needed to have more material. So we have sort of learning material that comes with the game. Uh, we hope that we made the game as user-friendly as possible to actually be able to play it in various contexts. So plug and play, but you can really dig deeper by using the material, discuss various cases of other collective action problems, and you can also discuss the specific policies that are in the, the specific context of where this is being done. So, of course, this game is particularly suitable to understand ocean as, and fish as a collective action problem, but it can be applied the same logic for, for example, climate change or corruption or even pandemics. Uh, and our vision is to continue and work and develop games for these various cha challenges. And uh, even if it is a game, the students experience the collective action mechanism. And that's what we think are really important. And also to try and, and they test and see that cooperation in the end benefits all, and also the importance of policies. Mm. Fascinating also. And, and, and what age bracket again? 12 to 18. 12 to 18, okay. But you could play it as a grown-up. Mm -hmm. I mean... I want to play you... it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. So, Svecker, being a specialist in, in collaborative action and research here, what, 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 what effects do you think you can have on students and also adults playing this game and, and nudging or pushing for, for more sustainable and climate-friendly behavior? Well, for, first of all, what, what uh, Osa mentioned, uh, by experiencing... Uh, dilemma situation mm -hmm. as, as this uh, is in itself uh, an important sort of contribution, but also to actually experience what happens when we change behavior mm -hmm. and not reading about this, or, uh, but actually seeing that if we adopt a more cooperative behavior, then the fish lasts longer mm -hmm. and, uh, and to be able to, together with teachers or, or within the group, also testing out what happens with our behavior in, if we introduce a, a quota or a, a fuel tax. Uh, and, and I think that can really, really help uh, people to, to understand both the limitations of voluntary collective action mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the importance of policies. And also you mentioned experiencing it, because I can imagine if you do this, if you play this game and you can, I mean, we do have all have neurotransmitters, f f juices floating around our systems. And we, if we feel the collective action and the f f positive responses of this, mm. I, I assume you feel it in your body in a different way than if you would read about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really sort of a and also, physical experience also, not just, not just a, an intellectual experience. Yeah. And also, as I mentioned uh, early on, the fact that many of those who are causing the problems are not affected by the problems. Uh, here, everyone is affected. And, and uh, that helps generating thoughts on what is actually needed to be done. And then together with the teaching material, you can sort of scale up from this little island situation to global challenges. So, um, Fantastic. I, so, so how do you access the game? Whew. I'm not the right person to, to, to answer that. Uh, but uh, currently, it sort of the game exists, mm -hmm. but the, the platform is not rigged properly. So, so at the moment, someone can not just come in and okay. start playing. Uh, that's for the future. How to how to co take this from a science-based idea to to an actual uh, sort of viable product, sort of. I'm sure you'll get there, and we'll we'll post it on on the we don't have plat plat platform, of course, because not not many people want it, want will be wanting to do to experience this mm. what you just portrayed here. So, Sonia, what how do you look upon uh, UNDP's role in in this climate communication and sort of pushing for this collective action? Um, well, the role of UNDP for UNDP promoting climate action and sustainable development that's our basically our core business. So. 
the United Nations trying to create systems and mechanisms to build a more equitable and a safer world, basically, for our, for our children in the future. To do this, we need a voice. We need to make it clear that climate change is real, that we're facing some difficult choices ahead. Um, and Professor Stryker was talking about the difficulties of coordination um, and the importance of politics. And this is basically where the UN comes in. Our role is basically to be a convener, to a, a galvanizer, someone who can talk uh, about a science in a way that um, is accessible to people, someone who can stand behind the science. We are also a natural partner for governments. Um, we work with governments in 170 countries. Um, we also have a program called the Climate Promise, which is specifically geared towards helping countries reach their national pledges made during the Paris Agreement. So at the moment, the climate promise, the climate promise is working with more than 120 countries and territories to help them reduce their carbon emissions and transition towards green energy. We also inform policymakers on the possibilities that they have to help them make the right decisions. In parallel, we work with communities and civil society all over the world. So you see, with all these different parties around, our job basically is to convene the different groups. Um, and the opportunity that we have is to connect these groups to promote climate action. And in that sense, to try to incentivize uh, collective action as well. And that's where you're saying the importance of politics does come in. We kind of do need a, a mover and a driver there. Well, thank you, Sonia. So, so from, from your researcher perspective here, all this, I mean, there's lots of research and we have UNDP supporting and, and collaborating with, with, with scientists all over the world. So how do we, how do we the, the game is one suggestion, of course, one way of working with this, but how do we incorporate all of these fantastic uh, resources of knowledge and just push even further to reach our goals? Sreka, would you like to start? Yeah, I, I guess it depends on who are we. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, for example, the, the role for, I think UNDP can play an enormously important role. Uh, both uh, now you're, you're working on this campaign on fossil fuel subsidies and to demonstrate the enormous badness of having such a system in place mm -hmm. and to show what could be the benefits of removing it. Uh, but also, uh, we as researchers, we have few platforms and difficulties to reach out to decision makers. And uh, uh, I mean, Osa and I, we have sort of decided that we want to, to be as applied as possible as scientists. Uh, but still, even if that's the case, to actually reach out to decision makers, that's super, super difficult. And uh, I think UNDP can play an enormously important role as a mediator between us and, and politics. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, 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 I really encourage future collaborations between you and research. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you, Sverka. Would you like to add also? I agree with Sverka, uh, but also from the research side, I think we can be better in sort of taking the reality into our modeling. and. Uh, we are in, a, in an important transition period and there will be people that are affected by in this transition that we need to acknowledge there are conflicts in terms of goals and looking into these issues also makes the research more important for politics in a, in a sense. So I think that's an important aspect. It goes both ways. Mm. Indeed it does. Svaka? Yeah, it's really this both way that I sort of missed out a bit. Because uh, for us to do meaningful research, we need to know what politics and decision makers need to know mm. uh, so that we can do research on that. And, and so, so it's really a both way lack of dialogue <laughs> at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Because we do see, we do see uh, the, the sort of the fake news uh, uh, incentives still, still sort of you know f flushing all over the, the fantastic facts that researchers put mm -hmm. up to politicians. So I can imagine uh, collaborating with a, with a player like UNDP also helps. Indeed. Uh, in terms of validation of, of this uh, this work, mm -hmm. fantastic work. So, so Sonia, what, what would you like to add? 
Um, well, I have to really agree what you know what's been uh, said so far. We do need researchers and the data, um, like they are doing at the moment, to help us, to help them, and help us basically move forward um, for this transition. But this transition, it's true, we can't leave people behind. Yeah. So we need to make sure that as we transform, that um, it has to be a just and equitable transition. And how do we do that? There are still millions of people who lack basic things like energy, for instance. And these people, we need to make sure that they have the same opportunities as we transform and we transition into green energy. Mm. It doesn't mean that we have to do everything now and today. You know, it can be done in steps, um, but it needs to start somewhere. It has to, has to start. We have to take the first step. So we're talking about fossil fuel subsidies. Presently today, more than $700 billion is being put into fossil fuel subsidies. That is like a huge amount of money. Just as an example, we know that this is exactly the sum of money that is required to achieve the biodiversity framework that was signed recently in Montreal. So look, instead of giving this money to fossil fuel companies, it can be used to bridge this gap, restore biodiversity. It could be used to help poorer countries transform um, you know, into more sustainable energy. It could create more green jobs. It could, I don't know, it could sort of provide support for education for girls. There are just so many things we could do with this money. The point is, these subsidies, they skew the way we look at renewable energy in the economy. So this money should be used for positive impact, not negative impact. So let's try and alleviate poverty, not enlarge the gap that we already have. Well, thank you very much, Son. You're getting spontaneous applause here from the audience. I think those were fantastic final words for this session. And thanks. Wonderful to hear about your collaboration and the game. We'll read more about it sooner or later on. We don't have time to f figure out how we can play it. And just uh, thank you for doing this important work. Um, thank and thank keep you us posted. Us. Thank, thank you for, thank you. for inviting thank us. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And this marks the end of this first day of Stockholm Climate Week. We'll be back tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and this time with a special focus on energy and security. Thank you very much, and uh, take care. it go wrong? Please tell me, who do I blame? Just name them, what do we do in this moment? Take to the streets, they're empty, storm the parliaments, they're shut down, no one in charge but the rodents. But we're not going to let this thing get out of hand. the plan you know cuz we're not going to lose the best things we ever knew just because some bad wind blows talk to the trees they'll listen talk to the bees they know talk to the rivers they've been around open your mouth and speak out open your eyes and see open your
your heart It's a key Cause we're not going to let This thing get out of hand You know We've got a plan You know Cause we're not going to lose The best things we ever knew Just because some bad wind Just fly from our greed Only take what we need No one's going to be left behind, left behind. This is our moment to shine. to shine If we break down the walls in our minds We will find we hold on to Chose to